They heard a sharp exchange of voices atop the barrel, but it wasn't very clear. Garin thought he heard Erdinger say something that ended with, It's none of your affair. The other voice responded, too far downwind to make out clearly. Garin glanced down at Hamel. Something's going on up there, he said. Are they arguing? Before he finished his question, a brilliant flash of light seared the darkness outside their bolt hole, followed by the low rumbling whoosh of fire. Mercenaries suddenly shouted in panic, and Erdinger shouted, Archers, bring him down now! The night blazed again with a brilliant yellow flash, a sharp crack, and a deafening peal of thunder that jarred a pinch of dirt loose from the passage ceiling. An acrid smell drifted down to where Garin and Hamel crouched, and the Varuna mercenaries cried out in dismay. An instant later, more fire belched across the night sky. "'What in the nine hells is this?' Garin said. "'They're trying to lure us out?' the halfling guessed. "'Somehow I doubt it.' Garin stared up at the mouth of the stairwell. He could hear men shouting and running, the distant ring of steel, the panicked whinnying of horses. They could wait it out and see what happened next, or they could move while the Varunas were distracted. In an instant, Garin made up his mind. He clambered back out of the hole in the wall, crouching low in the stairway, and carefully climbed the steps, expecting another arrow at any moment. "'You've lost your mind,' Hamel said, but he climbed out as well. Another thunderbolt peeled across the hilltop, and in the single brief flash of light, Garin saw something completely unexpected. The Varuna mercenaries ran this way and that, hugging boulders and tufts of high grass for cover as they confronted a single man, the horned sorcerer that Kara, Hamel, and he had met up with at the barrow where Jared had fallen. He stood in mid-air, fifteen feet above the ground, surrounded by a storm of fire, his coat of scarlet and gold billowing in the wind. One of the Varunas shot at him with a crossbow, but the sorcerer batted away the bolt with a gesture, and turned a fearsome glare at the fellow who had shot. The crossbowman staggered back, his clothes smoking, and then he burst into flame. Screaming horribly, he flailed away into the night fog. Two of the Varuna armsmen still crouched nearby, distracted by the battle raging a short distance away. Then one glanced down and caught a glimpse of Garin by the light of a blast of fire. "'The others!' he shouted. "'They're making a break!' Then a short arrow took him in the face and sent him staggering backward. "'Shh!' Hamel said. "'That's a good fellow!' Garin quickly bounded up the steps as the armsman waiting there scrambled to his feet and launched himself down. They met on the top stair. The man parried Garin's thrust at his midsection and replied with a vicious cut at Garin's head that the sword mage simply ducked under before surging up and scoring with a long passing cut to the neck as he shouldered the man out of the way. The Varuna man spun half around and fell where he stood. From the foot of the barrow, a man Garin hadn't noticed before raised a wand and pointed at the sorcerer in scarlet and gold. A trio of shrieking blue missiles screamed out of the wand, weaved their way through the sorcerer's fiery aura, and hammered home against his side. The horned man cried out and staggered in midair, clamping a hand to his injury. The Varuna mageling shouted in triumph and aimed another burst at him. Garin had no idea whether the horned man, the tiefling, that's what his kind was called, was an enemy or not. But for the moment the mercenaries of House Varuna were a common foe, so he raced down the side of the mound and hurled himself at the unsuspecting Varuna mage. The fellow sensed danger and started to turn just in time to see the sword stroke that decapitated him. Hamel followed a step behind him, now with knives in his hands, since he'd shot all his arrows. "'Are you sure this is our fight, Garin?' he called. "'I'm making it ours,' Garin answered. He found himself engaged with another Varuna swordsman, and fought a furious duel for several long moments, Mulman broadsword against elf-wrought backsword, blades flashing in the darkness and firelight. 
Hamill skirmished against another swordsman who moved in to attack Garin's back while Garin was battling the first and managed to slash the man across the knee badly enough to put him on the ground, at which point the halfling swarmed over him and finished him with a dagger through the visor of his helm. For his own part, Garin almost stepped onto his opponent's sword point, but saw through the feint at the last moment. He beat his adversary's point up into the air and ran him through beneath the arm. The sword mage quickly spun clear, searching for another foe, but no more Varuna men remained on their feet nearby. He caught a glimpse of Erdinger and half a dozen men galloping away into the darkness, pursued by flaming bolts the tiefling hurled after them. Then the battlefield fell silent except for the low, smoldering crackle of grass fires kindled by the sorcerer's fire. The tiefling snarled something after the fleeing mercenaries and allowed himself to drift back to earth. Then he caught sight of Garin and Hamel. Hold, Garin called. We've got no quarrel with you. That remains to be seen, the tiefling answered. He held his curved metal rod at the ready, but he did not move to attack. The book, he demanded. Where is it? Garin studied the tiefling for a long moment before answering. The man was obviously a very capable sorcerer, but Garin knew that his spell shields would stand up better to blasts of flame and bolts of lightning than the mundane mail the Varuna man wore. He took his time answering in order to make sure that the sorcerer would understand that he did not answer out of fear. If you're speaking of the Infernadex, then the Lich Iceborus has it, he said. The Varuna men followed us to this barrel, and I think Iceborus followed them. He took the book from me and departed not more than half an hour ago. You should take up the matter of the book with him, Hamel offered. The tiefling's face darkened, and he turned away, snarling something in a language that Garin didn't know. He kicked at the ground and slashed his weapon through the air in frustration. You led them right to this place. Iceborus never could have removed the book from the Lathandarian's barrel by himself. You have delivered his prize to him, you fools. The Varunas were searching barrows all over the high fells. Hamel retorted angrily. Sooner or later they would have found the right one. Don't blame us because you didn't find it before we did. For that matter, I'd like to know how you found us here, too. I followed the Varunas. I was going to let them remove the book, then take it from them. He glared at Hamel. Your meddling has cost me six months of labor. You half-wits have no idea what you've done. Garin decided to let the sorcerer's sharp words pass for the moment. This is the second time I've met you on the doorstep of a barrow, he said. I am Garen Hullmaster of the Harmax family, and we have laws against disturbing burial mounds in these lands. Who are you, and what do you want with Isperus's book? The tiefling calmed himself with a visible effort, and looked back to Garen and Hamel. I am Sarth Cool Reizar, he answered. My interest in the Infernadex is my own affair. But if Iceborus has found it at last, I doubt that I will ever be able to lay my hands on it. He is a foe beyond my strength. We're in your debt, Sarth Kul Reizar, said Garin. Your arrival distracted the Varuna men from the task of figuring out how they were going to kill us. Such was not my intent, the sorcerer said bitterly. Still, I suppose you made yourself useful in the fight, and you have my thanks for that. He frowned at the two companions again, then shook his head and muttered a spell under his breath. With a single bound, he leaped into the sky and shot off eastward over the fells. In a moment, he was completely out of their sight. "'Did you hear that? We made ourselves useful,' Hamel said. He sighed and looked around. A cold drizzle began to fall. "'Ah, wouldn't you know it? Our horses ran off with theirs.' "'Rosestone is three or four hours off by foot,' Garin said. He sheathed his sword and took a deep breath. "'If we start now, I think we can be there before sunup.' Fifteen. Twenty-six chess, the year of the Ageless One. Council Hall was one of the largest and most striking buildings in Hullberg. 
Its lower walls were made of thick, strong stone, every bit as sturdy as a watchtower's, and its upper stories were well-fitted hardwood, with beam ends carved into leaping dolphins and vigilant hounds, images of commerce and good fortune. Sergan Hallmaster glanced up as his coach rolled under the expensive carvings overhead. There was a gold dragon's head over the front door that he liked best of all. In the fading afternoon light, it took on a striking orange gleam. "'We're here, Lord Hallmaster,' his driver said. The coachman reined in the team, and Sergan's footman hopped down to hold open the door for him. Two council watchguards, who rode on the coach's running boards, climbed down and arranged themselves on either side, ready to fall in and escort him. The watchman looked competent and crisp in black tabards over breastplates of browned iron. They might not have been a match for the professional sellswords Varuna and the other companies employed, or even the Harmax shield-sworn, but Sergan intended to remedy that soon enough. Besides, an armed escort was one of the trappings of privilege, and he insisted on it. "'Very well,' Sergan said. "'Wait for me here.' I don't intend to remain inside for long. He smiled to himself as he stepped down to the cobblestones in front of the fine stone stairs leading up to the hall's doors. He did every time he caught sight of the grand edifice, since it was really his building, a symbol of his personal power and importance in Hullberg. Oh, the merchant council was ostensibly an association of equals, with each merchant of consequence in the city commanding one seat on the council, and he merely presided over it without a vote in his deliberations. But Sergan was keeper of duties, which gave him all the power he needed to buy or sell votes as he liked, while the support of House Varuna and its immense wealth made him master of the council in fact as well as name. For years now he had dictated to lesser members the positions they should adopt and the measures they should support or ruin them by giving Varuna opportunities to plunder their interests. It hadn't taken the smaller companies long to learn the cost of not doing what he wanted. Sergan climbed up the steps and strode into the building, paying the guards posted by the door no mind as they grounded the butts of their halberds for him. The council chamber itself was to his right, but he walked past it and up a grand wooden staircase in the foyer. His chambers were on the second floor, a large suite that included working rooms for his staff, a library, a sitting room, servants' spaces, and even a modest bedchamber if he decided that he didn't care to return to his grand house in the hills after an evening in Holberg. Few of the council clerks or attendants were in the building since the working day had ended an hour ago, but those who crossed his path were careful to stop and bow with murmured greetings of, "'Good evening, Lord Hallmaster,' or, "'By your leave, Lord Keeper.' Sergan's guards preceded him into the keeper's chambers. He swept in on their heels, doffed his expensive fur mantle, and handed it to his valet. "'Is Iron Thane here?' he asked. "'Aye, Lord Hullmaster,' one of the guards answered. "'He waits in the captain's room.' "'Show him upstairs immediately, then,' Sergan answered. "'I am attending the theatre tonight, and I don't want to be late.' The guard withdrew and hurried off. Sergan sat behind his desk and quickly studied the documents and orders his minions had left for him to review before signing. He found nothing of any real importance at a quick glance, but before he could begin a more serious examination, he heard footsteps in the hall, followed by a knock at the door. "'Enter,' he replied. "'Captain Kenderkel Ironthane, my lord,' the guard said. He moved aside to make room for a wide-shouldered, black-bearded dwarf, in heavy mail and plate, who wore a vast bearskin mantle over his armored shoulders and a wide gold chain to secure the fur. The dwarf had a long-stemmed clay pipe cupped in one hand, and rested his other hand on the mantle of a vicious-looking throwing axe that hung at his left hip. He was tall for his kind, just an inch or two under five feet, 
and was extraordinarily burly with shoulders that seemed a yard wide. He looked Sergan up and down and puffed once on his pipe. "'Welcome, Captain,' Sergan said. He looked at the other guards and attendants in the room and dismissed them with a gesture. Then he stood up and bowed slightly. "'I am Sergan Hallmaster, Keeper of Duties in Hallberg.' "'I've no been long in Hallberg, but I've been here long enough to learn who you be,' the dwarf said. "'You're master of the town, as near as I can tell. So what do you want with me, ice hammers?' "'Have a seat, Captain.' Sergan waited for the dwarf to make himself comfortable, then went on. "'I believe I have need of your mercenaries. I wish to engage your company as a special auxiliary to the Council Watch. You'll report to me and me alone. Are you interested?' The dwarf shrugged. "'It depends where you mean to send me, lads, and who you expect us to fight, Lord Hullmaster.' You'd remain in or near Hullmaster for now, within an hour's march, I would imagine. As for fighting, well, I doubt you'll see any pitched battles. The bloody skull orcs are demanding tribute from the Harmac, but I intend for that to be little concern of yours. I want to use your company to help establish and keep order in town, and perhaps assist me in suppressing enemies of the Merchant Council. And who be those enemies? "'Whomever I tell you to consider an enemy, Captain,' Sergan leaned forward on his desk and steepled his fingers in front of him. "'Lawless gangs in the tailings, outlaw bands on the high fells, merchant companies that refuse to abide by the fair rules this council enacts. Perhaps others.' Iron Thane smoked for a moment, his dark eyes unreadable. "'How long will you be wanting the ice hammers at your beck and call, Laird Hallmaster? "'Until I feel that good order has been established in Hullberg, Captain.' "'So you want me to take an open-ended contract with no specific enemy in mind, "'other than whatever poor bastards you tell me to handle for you?' "'The dwarf tapped his pipe against the arm of his chair to settle the embers to his satisfaction. "'In that case,' I expect to be retained, month to month, meet our price, and I'll keep me lads ready for you as long as you're to keep paying me. Sergan leaned back and frowned. He sensed that it might be better to be direct with Iron Thane. Dwarves had a reputation for bluntness, after all. I was hoping you would find something like that a reasonable arrangement. I foresee trouble in the next few months— Abrupt and decisive action may be called for. My council watch is a constabulary, not an army, but that's exactly what I may need soon. You want your own army, then? Iron Thane smiled humorlessly. Well, Laird Hullmaster, it will no be cheap. Me ice hammers will cost you two thousand gold crowns up front and another thousand crowns per month plus decent quartering and provisions. If you can't provide quarters or rations, it'll be another six hundred per month. I expect to be paid the first of the month each month. If you pay me, no. You're in breach of our contract, and we'll walk out on you. That coin buys you our services as guards, roustabouts, on a standing force in case you need two hundred well-armed veterans at short notice— if you want us to undertake a major action, say, anything where me lads face more than twenty enemies under arms at the same time, well, we'll have to negotiate a special bonus. Can Durkle Iron Thane grin to himself? We're no patriots, we're no fanatics, and we won't give you a moment's loyalty that you don't pay for, Laird Hallmaster. But we observe our contracts and fight damned hard when we've struck terms. You won't find a tougher company than the Ice Hammers anywhere north of the Moon Sea, and no all that many south of it neither. Sergan winced at the cost. You'll be looking after your own accommodations and provisions. I'm willing to go as high as twelve hundred per month, and we'll need to come to a better understanding of what you mean by a special bonus and just what triggers it. I'm willing to split the difference, the dwarf said. Fourteen hundred per month? 
Sergan considered for a moment, then nodded. Done. He stood up and offered his hand. Iron Thane took it, and they clasped palms. Pick out a good site for a barracks within half a mile of town, and tell your men to keep this quiet until I tell you otherwise. Two hundred men close to hand. No particular duties yet. And keep it quiet, the dwarf repeated. He puffed on his pipe, eyeing the human lord with interest. If I didn't know better, I'd think you intended a coup, my laird. Let's just say that I believe in the value of being prepared. Sergan stood and inclined his head to Iron Thane. The less said about his actual intentions, the better. He really did not know how much he could trust the mercenary captain yet. You'll receive two thousand gold crowns first thing tomorrow. We'll speak more then. Now, if you'll excuse me, Captain, I'm meeting someone at the theater. My men will show you out. Enjoy the play, Laird Hullmaster. Sergan smiled sourly. It's supposed to be wretched beyond description, he replied. He left Iron Thane in the company of the council guards and made his way back downstairs to his waiting coach. The driver clucked to the team, and the coach clattered off over the rough cobblestones. Sergan patiently endured the jolting and jostling from side to side that was the price of a carriage ride in Holberg's rough streets. He was a man of means, after all, and it wasn't seemly to walk the four or five blocks to the playhouse. In a few minutes his coachman drove up to the Crown and Shield, one of only two dedicated theatres in Holberg. Sirkin allowed his valet to open the door for him, and then swept through the small foyer with its bowing theatre attendants. He allowed them to show him to House Faruna's private box, and took his seat. The show had already started, a bawdy farce called The Bride of Secomber. "'You're late,' Darcy Varuna said as he sat down. "'A small matter of business I needed to attend to. Forgive me.' "'Has your uncle decided what he'll do with the blood-skull tribute demand?' "'The arguments continue,' Sergan replied. "'The private box was a good place to speak freely. "'With the musicians below, the actors giving their lines, "'and the laughter, or groans, from the rest of the audience, "'there was not much chance of being overheard. "'My uncle doesn't want a war, "'but he can't stomach the idea of giving in to the orcs' demands.' "'Especially the demand for slaves. "'His position is difficult. "'What will he do, then?' Sergan frowned. "'Kara advises him to stall. "'She believes that the longer things can be drawn out, "'the more likely it is that this King Murren "'will have his attention drawn away from Hullberg "'by some other event, "'an unexpected feud within his tribe, "'or perhaps an attack by some other enemy.' Lady Darcy looked away from the performance and met his eyes. Stall? How? Morag was quite insistent on a yes or no answer. How could the Harmac stall? Send the emissaries back with an impressive array of gifts and the message that Hullberg might pay if the tribute demand were just a little more reasonable and sufficient time allowed for the Harmac to levy the necessary goods and coin from Hullberg's people and the merchant companies in the city. He intends to make us help him pay off this orc brigand? Darcy demanded. Well, my dear lady, you and your house are theoretically at just as much risk as the Harmac and his people. My uncle believes that you're obligated to contribute something to the effort. That? is unacceptable, Darcy snorted. She returned her attention to the play, and Sergan leaned back to watch as well while he continued to think on matters. He had an idea about what might be done next, but he wished to mull it over for a time, and so he paid some small attention to the action on the stage as his mind worked. Early in the second act, the final pieces worked their way into place, and he smiled in satisfaction, despite the truly execrable quality of the shoddy little production playing out before him. The sorry affair rambled on for another hour and a half, before it mercifully staggered to an end. A poor script, a bumbling score, and actors who seemed to think that the height of their craft was to shout their lines at the audience made 
for a memorable night at the theater, Sergan decided. The best humor of the evening had come from watching for the next unexpected gaff or badly delivered line. And, to be honest, he felt a distinct sense of relief when the curtain finally dropped at the end of the show. In that much, at least, watching The Bride of Sucomber was not unlike repeatedly striking one's head against the wall. It felt good when it ended. I believe I might go down to the proprietor and beat him until he returns my eight silver talents, he said aloud. The coin's a pittance, of course, but as a matter of principle I won't stand for robbery. What did you expect in Halberg? Darcy Veruna asked. She ignored the half-hearted applause rippling through the audience as the cast members came forward to take their bows. In Mullmaster, the audience might wait around for the opportunity to stab one or two of those actors when they leave the theater. An enlightened and cultured city, Sergan remarked. He looked over to Darcy, who made a small face at him. I've been thinking. I believe the Bloody Skull threat offers just the opportunity we've been looking for. In fact, the worse it appears, the better for us. To that effect, I have a small request for you, my lady. Darcy motioned with her hand. Go on, my lord. Would you place your pet umbrel at my disposal later this evening? Possibly. What do you want her to do? Take a direct hand, or claw, I suppose, in negotiations with the Bloody Skull emissaries. I've determined that the Harmac is about to send their heads back to Murren with some suitably insulting reply to the Orc King's demands. Of course, my uncle doesn't know that's what he intends to do. I must see to it for him. Sergan leaned closer, since the lights were brightening and the audience was beginning to file out. As far as my uncle and the rest of the idiots on his privy council will know, the orcs will simply disappear. They'll guess that Morag and the others ran out of patience and left early. But you'll have the orcs killed? I will have the orcs killed and make sure that it's clear to everyone here that they broke camp and left. I need Umbral to carry their heads in a bag back to Blood Skull Keep and drop it at Murren's feet. That should bring the Bloody Skull Horde to Hullberg's doorstep in a matter of days. Sergan smiled. Correct me if I'm wrong, Darcy said. But... If the bloody skulls are as strong as they claim to be, won't that result in the sack of the city and the loss of a tremendous amount of House Veruna property, as well as no small risk to our own lives? It might, except that we now have a powerful ally who can repel the Orc Horde whenever he likes. Isperus. The king in copper owes us a great boon, and fearsome though he may be... He's a man, so to speak, of his word. Darcy stood and motioned for her ladies and attendants. One hurried forward to drape an expensive stole around her lovely shoulders, while the men-at-arms, resplendent in light shirts of gleaming mail, with surcoats of green and white, began to clear the rest of the departing crowd from her path. She lowered her voice and leaned close to murmur in his ear. Speaking of Isperus, my men report that he took the trinket he wanted right out of your cousin's hands. Garin will soon report to the Harmac that the Lich has the book and that armsmen of House Veruna gave it to him. The ambitious lord scowled. It would have been better if your men had killed him in the High Fells, so that he wouldn't carry tales back to my uncle. Darcy ran her nails softly across Sergan's chin. I think I am glad that I'm no kin of yours, my dear. Do you really hate them all so much? Sergan's expression darkened even more. The Hull Masters wronged my father grievously, Darcy. Whatever befalls any of them is nothing compared to the humiliation they heaped upon him. They will make amends for their perfidy. I've sworn to it. He paused for a moment, collecting himself, and then found the sardonic smile he habitually affected. 
In any event, yes, you're right. Kara will no doubt demand an explanation from you within an hour of Garen's return. An attempt on the life of a hallmaster, even a rootless vagabond like Garen, will no doubt fill her with righteous wrath. You'll have to make a show of surrendering those responsible. They made their way out of the private box and strolled slowly down the carpeted stairs to the foyer. Varuna men kept the rest of the crowd at a comfortable distance, earning a few resentful glances that Darcy ignored. "'My men are loyal and well paid, but I doubt that they'll confess to an attack against the Harmac's own nephew, simply because it's convenient for me if they do.' "'Oh, don't worry about that,' Sergan answered. "'Your men are protected by the laws of concession.' I can argue that it's an affair for the council watch, not the shield sworn, and I'll make sure that my dear stepsister remembers that. Of course, I'll have to thoroughly investigate the entire matter, very thoroughly. By the time I'm forced to move, it should all be moot. He accompanied Darcy outside to where the Varuna men had already drawn up her coach and joined her inside when she graciously invited him to. He dismissed his own driver and coach, and they drove away from the crown and shield through the cold fog blanketing the streets. After a long silence, Darcy spoke again. "'I think you may be too confident of your cleverness, Sergan,' she said. "'Your wayward cousin has exposed House Faruna's efforts to scour the high fells for Isperus's book.' and he must certainly suspect our involvement in Jared Erstenwold's death. The Harmac may not be a decisive man, but this isn't something he will let lie. Garen is dangerous to us. We need to find a way to neutralize him. Leave him alone. He'll soon grow bored, Sergan replied. Darcy shot him a dubious look, and after a moment he sighed and met her eyes. Or he might not. "'Very well. What do you propose?' "'We can't move directly against him,' Darcy said, idly examining the exquisite rings that graced her hands. "'It would lend far too much credence to any accusation he makes against my house.' She thought for a moment, looking out the coach window at the glowing halos the streetlights carved from the drifting mist. "'Ideally,' We would find a way to encourage Garen to neutralize himself, something that might encourage him to abandon Hallberg again or discredit him in the eyes of the Harmac. Perhaps he can be lured into drawing steel against us. If we're seen to be simply defending ourselves from an unwarranted attack, well, that would be acceptable. Sergan nodded in agreement. Darcy Varuna was so beautiful, so sophisticated in her decadence, that he sometimes overlooked the sharpness of her mind. She was right, of course, but how to encourage Garen to foil himself? He closed his eyes, summoning to mind everything he knew of his step-cousin, and something occurred to him. "'Ah, I think I've got it,' he said. "'The key to Garen is Mirja Erstenwold.' If I know him at all, you'll find that he will go to great lengths to protect her. Great lengths indeed. He smiled coldly. Why, with the proper motivation? He might even do something rash. 16. 27 Chess, The Year of the Ageless One as it turned out, Garen and Hamill did not reach Rosestone until almost noon, hungry and exhausted. The monks were happy to provide them with a good meal and allowed the two travellers to rest in their hostel. By the time Garen and Hamill rested and told the story of the tomb of Terlanus and the appearance of Isperus to the initiate mother, the afternoon was waning, so Garen reluctantly decided to spend the night at Rosestone. It was noon of the second day after their fight at the barrow, when the two companions trudged wearily up the causeway of Griffin Watch and climbed to the Harmax Tower, footsore and fairly well soaked from a long morning's walk in the warm spring showers that had settled over Hullberg during the previous night. 
Look, look, Hamel and Garen are back. Kerr and Natalie brought their lessons in the family's great room, but cast aside their primers and crowded close to the weary travelers, shouting a dozen questions at once. Where have you been? You've been gone for days. Did you fight any monsters? Did you find any gold? Garin looked down in surprise at the top of Natalie's head as she threw her arms around his waist and hugged him. He shrugged his rucksack off his shoulder and patted her back with his other arm. Strange how quickly children decide your family, he mused. They've known us only for a ten-day, but I can't remember the last time someone was so happy just to see me walk in a door. Maybe it was still the novelty of someone new under the same roof. One question at a time, you two, he said. We've been out on the high fells, riding all over the moors. And yes, we met some fearsome monsters. And no, we didn't find any gold. And then our horses ran off, so we had to walk all the way home. Did you see the orc army? Kerr asked. Do you think there's going to be a battle? Orc army? What orc army? Garin asked. Bloody skull orcs came to Griffin Watch while you were gone, Natalie explained breathlessly. We weren't supposed to watch, but we did. We crept into the great hall and listened to them talk to Grandfather and all the other important people like Kara and Sergan and the rest. They seemed very angry, and they threatened Grandfather. They said that if he didn't give them five wagons full of gold, they'd burn Hallberg. She looked up at Garin, a trace of uncertainty in her eyes. Do you think the orcs will really come here? I doubt it, Natali, Garin said. The orcs of Thar haven't mounted a serious attack against Hullberg since before I was born. We'll have to watch out for raiding parties, though. The bloody skulls, he wondered. They'd never troubled Hullberg before. It seems that a lot has happened in five days, Hamel said silently to Garin. I wonder what all this is about. For Kerr, he smiled and set his hands on his hips. We didn't see any orcs, General Kerr, but we did see a big black ghost panther that hunted us for days, and we barely escaped from bloodthirsty ghosts who chased us through fog and shadow. We defeated a sphinx made out of bronze, and finally we met the king in copper himself and lived to tell the tale. So what do you think of that? Kerr's mouth dropped open in astonishment. He stared up at Hamel and simply said, Oh, better not say too much more, Hamel, Garin said. Erna will give us an earful if we fill them with stories that keep them up all night. Tell us, tell us, Natalie said. We won't tell, Ma. Garin shook his head. Maybe later, but only if your mother says I can. Now I need to put on some dry clothes. He left the young hallmasters downstairs and went up to his room to change, taking his battered rucksack with him. He took a few moments to wash his face and towel off, found a clean change of clothes in the trunk at the foot of his bed, and trotted back down the stairs to the great room, settling his baldric and scabbard over a much drier tunic. But at the foot of the steps he found Kara waiting for him, her face taut with worry. The shield-sworn told me you'd returned, she said. I'm glad you're here, Garin. A lot's happened in the last day or two. The Harmac wants to speak with you right away. I need to speak with him, too, Garin said. I have quite a story to tell you, and I'm not sure what it all means. Where have you been for the last few days? Up on the high fells, but that's part of the story. You'll hear it soon enough if you have half an hour to spare. He heard a light step on the stairs and glanced up. Hamel was coming down as well, having availed himself of the chance to change into dry clothes, too. Hamel, will you join us? My uncle wants to speak with me, and it might be helpful to have two accounts of the last few days. Of course, the halfling replied. He nodded to Kara. A pleasure to see you again, my lady. And you, Hamel, Kara replied. She offered him a fleeting smile and inclined her head. This way, the Harmax hearing counsel in the trophy room. Garin and Hamel followed her as she led them down a flight of stairs into what would have been the foundations of the Harmax Tower. 
However, since the tower sat atop Griffin Watch's steep crag, its basement formed another floor just beneath the buildings of the upper courtyard. A long row of windows facing south looked over rain-slick balconies and ramparts toward the moon sea, a dark gray line beyond the rooftops of the town. The castle had several of such hidden floors, some carved out of the living rock in the heart of the hill. Garin fondly remembered exploring all of them with Kara and her cousin Isselmar when all three were children not much bigger than Natali or Kerr. At the end of a long hall stood tall double doors of dark, gleaming wood. There were no shield-sworn guards in sight. They were well within the Hullmaster family quarters, and the Harmax men usually watched the doors and halls that led into this part of the castle, instead of standing guard within the family residence. Kara paused by the doors, knocked twice, and let herself in. The room beyond was a large chamber with heavy wooden beams overhead, a long table of fine cherry wood, and a handful of dusty bookshelves and mounted trophies along the walls. A red tiger pelt, a suit of plate armor, a dusty wyvern's head, and the two-handed great axe of a frost giant, a weapon fully ten feet long. The chamber was really a smaller, more secure banquet room than the great hall that divided the lower castle from its upper parts, one that just happened to be decorated with a handful of trophies taken by Grigor's father in his youth. "'Uncle, I've brought Garin,' she said. "'Have you? Good!' Harmac Grigor sat in a large, high-backed chair at the head of the table. To his left sat the old Keeper of Keys, Walreth Keltor, and beside him High Magistrate Theron Nimstar. Across the table, Sergen Hallmaster paced absently. The Harmac looked up from his advisers and motioned to Kara. "'Come in, come in,' the old lord said. "'I am afraid we have much to discuss and little time. First things first. Sergen turned to face his stepsister, his hands clasped behind his back. He wore an elegant black tabard embroidered with a golden dragon design, and his habitual smirk was nowhere to be seen. "'Did you find any sign of the orc delegation?' "'No, none yet,' Kara answered. "'I haven't had the chance to examine the site personally, but my scouts tell me that their camp is empty, and there's no sign of Morag and the others.' I can only guess that, for whatever reason, they decided to leave. But that makes no sense, Theron Nimstar protested. They gave us until sunset tomorrow to give our answer. Why leave before they have heard it? Perhaps they expected the Harmac to refuse outright, and were merely playing at offering a chance to buy peace, Sergen said. They might have already settled on war— in which case the whole point of the delegation was simply to take our measure. That seems unlikely, Kara answered. Orcs are direct, far blunter than we would be. For good or ill, they rarely say anything they don't mean. They wouldn't feign a demand for tribute. I've heard that this Murren has human blood, Sergen answered. Perhaps he's got some human guile in him, too. Kara frowned but held her tongue. Garin took the opportunity to step forward. "'Forgive me, but Hamel and I have been riding all over the High Fells for days, and we returned only an hour ago. When did the Blood Skulls show up? What do they want?' "'They came to the Raven Hill Watchtower under a flag of truce three days ago, and demanded to be taken to the Harmac. Kara answered him. The shield sworn escorted them to Hullberg, and the Harmac's council heard them out the day before yesterday. They issued a demand for tribute, and gave us three days to choose whether to pay or fight. Kara glanced to the Harmac and then back to Garin. The orcs were camped in the ruins of the old Windy Ridge post, waiting for our answer, but they seemed to have left. Perhaps their nerve failed them, and they feared they would be killed for throwing such an insult in our teeth, Walworth Keltor said aloud. Kara shook her head. That's not likely either. 
I can't offer a good explanation for why they left, but I'm certain of this. If the bloody skulls didn't wait for our answer, then they've chosen war, and we must prepare ourselves. No one spoke for a long moment. Then Harmac Grigor sighed and looked over to the two officials. Theron, Walrath, I suppose there is no more point in debating whether we should pay or negotiate. If the orcs have chosen war, then that is that. Walrath, find some coin to finish the repairs to Dagger Guard's gate. I want that work finished as soon as possible. Raid other works if you must. For that matter, we may need to hire mercenaries to fill out our ranks. I'll take every copper you can find me. The keeper of keys made a sour face, but he nodded. I will do everything I can, Lord Harmac. He stood and bowed to the Harmac. Theron did likewise. Then the two officials left the room, hurrying off to attend to their appointed tasks. Garin waited for them to leave, then cleared his throat. Uncle Grigor, I think the bloody skulls aren't the only problem at hand. I need to tell you what I've learned in the last ten day about Jared's murder, House Varuna, and the King in Copper. Isperus? Kara shot a surprised look at Garin. What in the world does he have to do with us? Sergan snorted. He's a useful bogeyman for scaring ill-behaved children, nothing more. The sword mage ignored his step-cousin's derision. I'm not sure, Kara, but Isperus has something to do with House Varuna, and they in turn had much to do with Jared's murder. Both Grigor and Kara glanced at Sergan, who simply rolled his eyes, folded his arms, and leaned against the bookshelf. The Harmac looked back to Garin. "'You'd better tell us the whole story,' he said. "'All right.' Garin paused a moment to collect his thoughts, then began. "'As you know, I wanted to look into Jared's death. About ten days ago, Kara took Hamel and me up to the barrow where Jared was killed. We noticed that the barrow had been resealed recently, so we broke in to see what might have drawn the tomb robbers, and presumably Jared, to that place.' "'You broke the Harmac's law against entering a barrow?' Sergan asked sharply. "'Someone else already had,' Hamel answered for Garin. "'I judged it worth investigating,' Garin continued. "'Inside, we discovered two fresh bodies hidden beneath the burial stone, "'a young woman and a man that Kara identified as an armsman of House Varuna.' "'He was buried in his Varuna colors,' Sergan said. "'No, but I recognized him,' Kara replied. "'She glanced at Garin. "'I asked some questions around town after we returned. "'The dead armsman was Zorman Kelfarrel, "'a Malmasterite sellsword in the service of House Varuna. "'And yes, Sergan, I realized that his employers "'might have had no idea what he was up to, "'so don't bother to say it. "'Your discretion is admirable, dear Kara. "'I also found out more about the tiefling we met outside the barrow, by the way,' Kara continued. "'His name is Sarth, and he came to Hullberg about four months ago. "'Several of the merchant costers tried to hire him on, including House Varuna. "'All of the merchants look for competent spellcasters to strengthen their private armies. "'We ran into him again.' "'But I'll get to that in a moment,' Garin said. "'He paced absently around the table, organizing his thoughts. "'Since we had good reason to be suspicious of House Varuna, "'I decided to take a closer look at their activities. "'Hamel and I disguised ourselves and went to work in the Varuna trade yard for a few days, "'watching Varuna's cell swords closely. "'Did you know they have well over a hundred men under arms in and around Hullberg?' In any event, I got to know many of the Varuna men by sight, including their captain, a man named Erdinger. Hamel and I found that the Varuna sellswords were keeping themselves quite busy, constantly coming and going from their timber camps and mines all around the area. Which is hardly suspicious, Sergut pointed out. All of the merchant companies patrol the wildlands around their camps, 
to protect their investments. And I'll also point out that what you were doing was in breach of the concession laws. The Harmac and his agents aren't allowed to interfere in legitimate business of the merchant costers. Hamel grimaced. Interfere? We gave them an honest day's work. They've never had a better team or wagon. This will go faster if you don't interrupt me, Sergen, Garin said. He was rapidly remembering why he'd never liked his step-cousin very much. After watching the Varuna mercenaries for a few days, I decided to try a different tactic. I set out to looking into the tomb-breakings Jared was investigating. Uncle Grigor gave me the reports Jared had compiled, and Hamel and I set out to visit each scene. We rode up to the high fells and examined the barrows. First of all, we noticed that the barrows were not looted indiscriminately. Whoever was breaking into the barrows was looking for something specific and leaving other valuables behind. And we noticed something else. Each barrow was about the same age. Each was the burial mound of a servant of Lathander, and each dated from the time of old Thentur. Once we figured that out, I decided to seek some expert assistance. We went to Rosestone Abbey, a harrowing ride since the dead walked on the high fells that night, and spoke with the initiate mother. I asked her what tomb robbers might be looking for in the barrow of a Lathandarian from the days of Thentur, and she had an answer for me. A book called the Infernodex that once belonged to Isperus himself. The tiefling was looking for a book, Kara said. The same one, Garin confirmed. Anyway, Mother Mara told me that it was hidden in the barrow of a high priestess named Turlanus, and she told me where to find it. I decided to remove the book to keep it out of the hands of the men who were looking for it. Two days ago, we broke into the barrow of Turlanus. We discovered a secret vault hidden under the burial chamber and found the Infernodex. But when we emerged from the barrow, we discovered that we'd been tracked. A company of Varuna armsmen was waiting for us. And I suppose these men were wearing their house colors? Sergen demanded. In fact, they were. Hamel snapped, and Captain Anfell Erdinger himself ordered Garin to surrender the book at sword point. Sergen began to reply, but Harmac Grigor held up his hand. A moment, Sergen. Finish your tale, Garin. What happened then? I threatened to destroy the Infernodex, because I couldn't see why they would let us go to carry tales back to Hullberg if I surrendered the tome. But Isperus appeared. "'the king and copper himself. "'He seized the tome before I could even think of protecting it from him. "'Then, once he had it, he told Erdinger "'that he held Varuna's part of the bargain accomplished "'and that he would soon make good on his part.' "'Hamel interrupted. "'He also said that Erdinger and his men "'were to despoil no more barrows. "'I certainly took that to mean that the Varuna men "'had broken into a number of barrows "'looking for Isperus's book.' Isperus teleported away after that, Garin continued. Hamel and I ran back into the barrow we'd just left, hoping to fight off the Varunas. We'd likely be there still, except that the tiefling Sarth arrived and attacked the Varunas. He distracted Erdinger and his men enough for Hamel and me to fight our way back out. The Varunas retreated, and the tiefling, Sarth Cool Riazar is his full name, Kara, flew off into the night, and after some sharp words to Hamel and me for allowing Isperus to reclaim his old book. After that, Hamel and I retraced our steps to Rosestone, rested there a night, and set out at first light this morning for Hallberg. Garin paused, thinking over what he'd just said, and leaned on the dark cherrywood table to meet his uncle's eyes. What it all means, I can't say. But now I know that House Varuna men were the ones breaking into the tombs on the high fells. I know that Varuna men killed Jared Erstenwold. I know they struck some sort of bargain with the king in copper. And I know Varuna men were ready to kill Hamel and me to keep us from telling you what we saw. The Harmac frowned and rubbed his hand over his eyes. That is a black tale you bring to us, Garin. 
I know that Darcy Varuna is no friend to me, but treachery and murder such as this. Sergan began to chuckle, then laughed deeply and richly. Surely you don't believe all this, uncle. It's a wild exaggeration at best, and more likely an outright fabrication. He pushed himself upright from the bookshelf he had been leaning against and looked at Garin. Isperus himself took the book from your hands, and you were rescued by a mysterious devil-spawned sorcerer, who then flew off into the night? Ah, oh, goodness! I had no idea you were capable of such ridiculous invention, Garin. Why, the Bride of Secomber couldn't best that tale. Are you sure you're not a playwright? Garin stood up straight and glared at Sergan. Every word I've spoken here today is true. Don't call me a liar again. Why should we believe you? Sergan asked. His easy smile fell from his face, and his dark eyes glittered like serpent scales. You haven't seen a reason to spend ten days in this house in the last ten years. The house of your father and your father's father. You're a feckless wanderer, Garin, chasing after childish dreams of glory and fame. I don't doubt that a man such as you might invent any sort of fantastic tale to justify a few more hours of adoration from those too foolish to look past your wild claims and ask for some small shred of proof. Enough, both of you, Harmac Grigor said. We have— Now that's odd, Garin retorted to Sergan. You haven't seen fit to spend a single day in your father's house in all that time. Where is he now, I wonder? Selling children into slavery? Robbing and murdering his way through the world as a common highwayman? Or perhaps groveling in front of some demon's bloody altar? As I see things, Sergan, you've claimed my family's name and sold off my family's property for your own riches— Maybe we should have run you off all those years ago when that traitorous, black-hearted father of yours fled for his miserable life. That is enough, the Harmac snapped. You'll regret those words, Sergan hissed. He took a step toward Garin, his hand dropping to the hilt of his rapier. For his own part, Garin rounded the table and took three strides toward his step-cousin. He'd be damned if he would let Sergan call him a liar. "'What are you hiding?' he growled. "'Why are you trying to protect House Varuna? Did they buy your loyalty, such as it is? Perhaps you hope to succeed where your father failed?' "'Garon, I will have no more of this,' Grigor roared. He stood and struck his cane against the floor. "'Sergan may not be of Hullmaster blood, but my sister raised him as her own son.' "'and I will not hear another word about his father's deeds.' "'Garin hesitated. "'In all of his life he had never heard the Harmac raise his voice so. "'Sergan fell silent, too, but still glared at Garin. "'Kara stepped between the two and then looked to the Harmac. "'Uncle Grigor, we all know that Sergan is close to Darcy Varuna.' Garin's charges against the Varunas are serious and must be answered, but Sergan's not likely to demand explanations from House Varuna. Sergan turned a black look on his stepsister, but mastered himself with a visible effort. I don't deny that I am courting Lady Darcy, nor do I deny that we've had a profitable association. All of us. House Varuna accounts for almost half of the concession fees collected on Hullmaster land. But that doesn't make Garin's wild accusations true, uncle. I have, in fact, already heard a different account of what transpired on the High Fells. I didn't want to mention it for fear of shaming a kinsman I haven't seen in a long time. But it seems clear that I must speak of it now. Sergan frowned and shook his head. I don't know how to say this, but... Captain Erdinger reported to Lady Darcy that he and his men were performing a routine patrol when they stumbled across a pair of bandits looting a tomb in search of nothing more exotic than barrow gold. When they challenged the looters, they discovered Garin and his small accomplice there who attacked them rather than allowing themselves to be taken into custody. 
They murdered several Varuna armsmen and fled into the mists. He looked at Garin and added, So where have you hidden the gold you've looted? How many more barrows do you intend to pillage before you flee Hullberg and go off to plunder some other land? You lying serpent, Garin snarled in fury. Easy, Garin, Hamel told him. The halfling set his hands on his hips and looked up at Sergen. So, Lord Sergen, are Garin and I responsible for the barrows that were plundered before we even arrived in town? If we didn't do it, then who did? Kara narrowed her azure eyes and folded her arms over her breastplate. For that matter, Sergen, why didn't you report this dire tale as soon as you heard it? "'Frankly, I thought Garin had already fled Hallberg again,' Sergen answered. "'He hasn't been seen here in days, after all, "'and I hope to spare the family any story of his misdeeds. "'You all seem to think well of him, after all.' "'He glanced down at Hamel and shrugged. "'As far as who opened barrows before you arrived, "'well, we have only your word that you returned to Hallberg when you claim you did.' How do we know you haven't been here for months, searching out barrows to loot? For that matter, how do we know that you weren't the very tomb robbers Jared Erstenwold died trying to arrest? Now that's ridiculous, Kara snapped. Perhaps you'd like to suggest that Garin is responsible for the spell plague, and the time of troubles, too, while you're at it. The Harmag sighed. Sergen. I don't find your accusations against Garin very credible. Your anger is speaking for you. They are not my accusations, uncle. I'm only reporting what's been told to me, regardless of what you find credible. There are a dozen Varuna blades who can swear to their account of what happened on the High Fells two nights ago. Sergen drew himself up and measured Garin sternly. Garin may have inveigled you with his self-aggrandizing tales, but I think the Merchant Council will be less easily swayed by old affection. I will lay Garin's charges against House Varuna before the Merchant Council, Sergen, the Harmac warned, and I expect them to be investigated thoroughly and impartially. If you are not capable of doing that— I'll appoint a new keeper of duties to oversee the council watch and see to it. So you take Garin at his word? Sergen pointed at Garin and snarled. While he's been off playing at adventure in foreign lands, I've stayed here and built Hallberg from a forgettable little backwater into a prosperous town. What's he ever done for this city or this family? This drafty old castle would be crumbling around your ears if not for the coin I brought in. I refuse to let his wild stories antagonize a trading partner as valuable as Mole Master. He glared defiantly around the room and then abruptly shouldered his way past Garin and stormed out the door, slamming it shut behind him. Garin drew a deep breath and ran his fingers through his hair. The Harmac sat down slowly and leaned his cane against his chair. No one else said anything for a long moment, and then Hamel cleared his throat and said, "'Forgive me if I'm speaking out of place, but why charge Erdinger and the Varuna men through the Merchant Council? Why not send the Shieldsworn to arrest them? "'My hands are bound by the laws of concession, Master Hamel,' the Harmac answered. "'Matters of justice pertaining to the merchant costers are dealt with by the merchant council. My shield sworn aren't permitted to set foot in the conceded territory, nor are they allowed to arrest foreigners employed by a merchant company holding a concession. We must lay our charges before the merchant council.' and allow the council to arrest, try, and sentence their own. And do you trust Sergen to charge and try House Varuna's armsmen? Garin asked. Grigor glanced out the leaded window at the warm rain pattering down over the town. Sergen has shown that his loyalty lies with our family on many occasions, Garin, he said quietly. 
I've always believed that trusting someone can make that person worthy of trust, and Sergan long ago made up for the harm his father intended against us. But it might be true that he's become too entangled with the merchants he deals with. He's protecting Jared's murderer, Uncle Grigor, which he may not have known he was doing until you reported what you'd found in the High Fells, the Harmac pointed out. He shifted his gaze back to Garin and met his eyes. I'll give him a few days to show me that he can set aside his dislike for you and act on the information you brought to light, and if he doesn't, then, yes, I will replace him. Now, tell me everything about Isperus and this book. I want to know what the king in copper has to do with this whole affair. 17. 27 Chess, The Year of the Ageless One Later in the afternoon, Garin decided it was time to visit Mirja Erstenwold again. She'd insisted that there was nothing that he had to do about Jared's murder on her account, but that didn't mean she didn't deserve some answers. After all, when they'd met at Jared's graveside, she'd seemed to understand that he needed to settle Jared's business for the peace of his own heart, if not hers. By sharing her suspicions about House Varuna, she'd given him her blessing to follow his own path through grief. Garin was slowly resigning himself to the idea that he might not ever find out which of the Varuna armsmen had actually waylaid his friend in that wild and lonely place, but he could certainly tell Mirya what the Varuna men had been seeking and how Jared had come to get in their way. Besides, Mirya needed to know what he'd learned about Varuna's involvement. The men who'd murdered her brother might be the same men who now threatened her family's livelihood with their extortion and intimidation. Wrapped deeply in his thoughts, Garin slipped out of the castle an hour before sunset, leaving Hamel to entertain Natali and Kerr. He set out from Griffin Watch on foot, dressed in a nondescript grey cloak, only one more man among the hundreds in the streets who hurried about on their own business. The rain had diminished to a cool, steady mist that beaded his cloak without really soaking the dense wool, and faint tatters of cloud rack drifted over the town only a few hundred feet overhead. He took Cinder Street through the tailings. By daylight the neighborhood was simply run down and poor— not dangerous, crossed the winter spear at the middle bridge and climbed the steps up to the square by the assaying house and high street. As he threaded his way through the sodden streets, Garin brooded over the question of how to hold House Varuna to account, even if the Harmac couldn't. When he considered events coldly and carefully, he decided that it didn't matter all that much which of the armsmen had been involved. The Varuna men were mercenaries, paid to do what they did without asking questions, and the ultimate responsibility for Jared Erstenwold's murder rested with the man or woman who had ordered the mercenaries to kill him. It seemed likely that Anfell Erdinger might be that man. After all, Mirya had seen him wearing Jared's elf-made dagger and the encounter at the Barrow of Turlanus suggested that Erdinger was the sort of captain who was inclined to personally see to important missions. The only real question in Garin's mind was whether Erdinger had conceived the plans to loot the Barrows, deal with Isperus, and assassinate Jared Erstenwold himself, or simply followed the orders of Lady Darcy or some other high-ranking member of House Varuna. Garin reached the intersection with Plank Street and turned the corner to Erstenwold's. The first sign of trouble was the two mercenaries in tabards of green and white standing outside the door of Miria's store with insolent smirks. Passers-by gave them a wide berth, staying well clear of the doorway. The next sign was the sound of breaking glass and coarse laughter from inside. Garin's step faltered. "'Ah, oh, damn it all,' he muttered. "'Garin, you fool! 
The Maruna men were back, vandalizing the place to teach Miria a lesson for letting him stand up for her. But whether it was a message for him or a message for her, he wasn't going to stand by and let Darcy Varuna's mercenaries hurt Miria or drive her out of business. I think I've had about enough of Darcy Varuna's hired blades, he decided. He paused in the shadow of a doorway and quickly spoke a couple of his sword mage spells. Then he crossed the street, heading for the steps where the mercenaries waited. Find another store, friend. "'one of the men said coldly. "'This one's closed.' "'That's not for you to say,' Garin replied, "'and he whipped his cloak free of his shoulders, "'dropping it into the muddy street without breaking stride. "'His right hand rode on his sword-hilt. "'Now get out of my sight, "'because Torm knows I've had all I can stand "'of your stink in my town.' "'Damn it, Turth! That's him!' the second man said to the first. "'That's Garen Hullmaster!' "'I don't care if he's the King of Cormir. the first armsman said. He set his hand on the hilt of his own sword and grinned in challenge at Garen. "'I don't mean to step aside for him!' "'San Heir Astali!' Garen snarled. He lunged forward and caught the first Varuna man with his bare hands by the belt buckle and the collar. With the burst of magical strength the spell gave him, he simply plucked the man right off the top step, holding him above his head. He wheeled and took three strides with the Varuna bladesman waving and kicking helplessly in midair before he rammed the man head first into a big barrel full of rainwater that stood by the corner of the store. The man's feet kicked and scissored in the air, but it was a big barrel, and it was full. It rocked, but didn't tip. "'Stay there as long as you like,' Garin snapped. He heard the rasp of steel against wood and leather behind him, and turned to face the second Varuna man hurrying down the porch. Garin swept his elven backsword from its sheath, flinging water from his wet sleeves, and bounded forward to meet the man. The mercenary aimed a high cut at Garin's head, but Garin batted the blade over his head and then laid the man's sword arm open from elbow to wrist. The mercenary's sword clattered across the cobblestones, and the man hissed a curse as he jerked his arm back. With the last glimmer of his strength spell, Garin seized him by his good arm with one hand, spun in a half-circle and propelled the wounded man headlong into the side of the building. The Varuna man hit hard and went down in a jingle of mail, splattering blood from his wounded arm all over the whitewashed timber. Without even pausing to think about it, Garin leaped up the steps into the Erstenwold storefront. Two more Varuna men were inside. One, the mercenary sergeant Ban, whom Garin had seen in the store the last time he visited, had dragged Miria out from behind her counter and stood holding her with his hand knotted in her dark hair. The other man was systematically breaking every jar of goods on the shelves behind the counter. "'Let go of her,' Garin said coldly. Ban looked up in surprise as Garin stormed in, but the big mercenary recovered quickly. "'You know, I've been waiting for this,' he remarked. He dragged Miria out of his way and shoved her violently to the floor, then slowly drew his own blade. "'I wonder if you're man enough to meet me steel to steel, or do you need to lean on your damned elven witchery?' "'Miria, get out of the way,' Garin said. He waited a moment for her to pick herself up from the floor. Her chin was already beginning to bruise, but her eyes blazed with an icy fury, and she threw her shoulders back and walked proudly to the doorway, leading back toward the rest of her storehouse. "'He's strong, but he's slow, Garin,' she said. "'Try not to kill him in my shop if you can help it.' "'Done,' Garin said." He glided forward, point low and guard high, and stamped his lead foot down as he started with a series of short slashes at the mercenary's legs. Ban parried the first and the second, then just missed the third and earned a quick cut above the knee. He swore and beat Garin's point up into the air, then put his size and power into a whistling backhand cut that Garin caught with a sliding block and stepped away from. Steel rang shrilly on steel as the two men traded cuts and parries. 
You ain't that good without your magic, are you? Ban grunted, but a trickle of sweat beaded at the man's brow, and his breath grew heavier. I'm not in any particular hurry, Garin replied. He let his momentum circle him around, and attacked the lead leg again as Ban turned to follow him. This time he buried three inches of his point in the meat of Ban's thigh just under his mail, and the Varuna bladesman grunted and hobbled back, beating Garin's point away again. I've got hours to slowly cut you to pieces. Sirik, take me if you do, Ban swore, and he suddenly lunged forward, bullying straight for Garin to catch the blades breast to breast. The bigger man grinned and pressed down, shoving the sword mage back three paces across the old, smooth floorboards. Garin's boots slid without giving him purchase, and he started to stumble but he caught his back foot against one of the posts in the center of the room, bent both knees a bit, and shoved back and up with all his strength. He might not have been as big as the Varuna man, but he was quick and strong, and he knocked Ban's sword up over his head. Before the mercenary could recover, Garin simply slugged him hard in the mouth with the heavy hilt of his sword. He felt teeth shattered, and the Varuna man spun away from the blow, blood splattering from his mashed lips. Garin cut his back leg out from under him, and Ban went to the floor heavily, at which point Garin kicked his sword away and struck him senseless with another kick. I was a pretty good swordsman. Before I went to Mithdranor, you ox-brained fool, he said to the unconscious Varuna man. Then he glanced around for the other, the one behind the counter. The last mercenary glared at him and started to edge his way around the corner, moving to get clear. His hand settled on his sword hilt as he moved to put the open door at his back. You get out of here now, or I'll feather you right in the eye, eh? Miria spoke in a voice that was deadly and certain. Garin glanced around. Miria had quietly slipped back behind the counter to retrieve a small but efficient-looking crossbow, which she'd leveled at the other Varuna man. Evidently, the fellow had been so caught up in watching his sergeant fight that he'd forgotten to keep an eye on her. The man spat once on the floor and backed up a step. "'You'll be sorry for this,' he said." "'Drag that thick-headed fool with you when you go,' Garin said, nodding at Ban. The last Varuna man scowled, but he grasped the big sergeant under his arms and dragged him to the door. Miria kept her crossbow trained on him until he backed out of the door, then slowly lowered it. She shuddered and set the weapon down on the countertop. May demons carry off those brigands and all their kin, straight to the bottom of the blasted abyss. What have I got that's worth their trouble? Garin motioned for her to wait. Just a moment, he told her. He turned his back on Miria and stepped out onto the porch, sword still in hand. A small crowd of townsfolk stood and stared at him. The last Varuna man had Ban upright, aided by the mercenary with a wounded arm. The two of them shot murderous glances back at the sword mage as they retreated back down the street. Garin glanced over to the corner. The water barrel lay on its side, and there was no sign of the man he'd dropped into it. The sword mage looked at the nearest person, an old dwarf in a crumpled hat. "'The other one ran off?' he asked. "'Aye, my lord,' the dwarf grunted. He smiled crookedly at Garin. "'Ha! Drowned he was!' but he tipped himself over and crawled out. My thanks, Garin replied. He wouldn't have wanted to drown the Varuna man, which is why he came out to make sure the cell sword had actually escaped from the barrel, but coming within an inch of drowning the fellow did not bother him at all. He drew an oilcloth from a small pouch by his scabbard and wiped down the fine steel blade as he stepped back inside. With a graceful flourish, he sheathed the sword and faced Miria in the wreckage of her business. She stood with her arms hugged close to her body, watching him with an absent frown creasing her brow. "'Are you hurt, Miria? he asked quietly. She reached up to touch her jaw and shook her head. "'I've taken no hurt. But if you hadn't come along when you did, I've a feeling it was going to get a lot worse.' 
I wish I could promise you that they won't trouble you any more, but I can't. Garin stooped down to right a small keg of nails that had been kicked over on its side. I think you need to hire a couple of good men to guard your place, or close up shop for a ten day or two, keep to yourself, and stay safe until things settle down. I know it. Miria went to the door, closed it, and threw the bolt. Then she turned to study the damage to the shelves and wares, and took a deep breath. What a mess they've made of the place. It'll take me all the night to clean this up. Miria, I'm sorry that I brought this on you. I thought that I could solve your problems for you with a few hard words and a show of steel. That's what I know how to do. I suppose I felt that I owed it to Jared and you, but I shouldn't have stepped into the middle of your troubles without asking. Miria didn't reply for a time. She reached up to brush her disarranged hair out of her eyes. Her braid had come loose during the struggle. Thank Ilmeter that Selsha's back at the house with my mother, she finally said. If she'd been here, I haven't the heart to th even think about it. She sighed and found a seat on a heap of grain-filled sacks. Whether you were here or no, the merchant council would still trouble me, Garen Hullmaster. They aim to drive all the smaller merchants out of town to make more room for Varuna and Marstall and the other important companies. They've already arranged the Harmax laws to suit them, and that's not enough, so they mean to ruin the rest of us. Maybe you've got the right of it, and it's your stubbornness has brought those brigands back to my shop today, but I'm beginning to think that your way of things might be exactly the change that's needed in this town. I'm only one man, Garin answered. He shook his head. He never would have imagined that things could turn so ugly in Hullberg in just a few years, but if Miria said it was so, he believed her. He found an overturned barrel, rolled it up on its end, and seated himself on it. "'Listen, Miria, I came to see you for a different reason. There's something I need to tell you. I've found out a few things about Jared's death, and you should know that House Varuna is at the bottom of it.' She glanced sharply at him and nodded once. Clearly, Miria was not surprised to hear that. "'Were the barrow robbers Varuna men?' "'Yes, they were. And you haven't heard a quarter of the story yet.' He began the tale of how he'd spent the last ten day with his visit to the barrow where Jared Erstenwold had been killed. The days he and Hamel had spent spying out House Faruna's enterprises, and the decision to retrace Jared's steps and visit the other barrows. He recounted the visit to Rosestone, and his decision to find the barrow of Turlanus before the Varunas could pillage it, and told her about what he and Hamel had found there, and the ambush waiting outside when they emerged. Miria listened intently, her keen eyes never leaving Garin's face. When Garin described how Isperus had made an appearance, her eyes widened, and she leaned forward. "'The king in copper himself,' she breathed. "'Everybody's told tales of that one for years, and all this time I've believed they were naught but stories. "'He knew me for a hullmaster, but other than that I was almost beneath his notice,' Garin said. "'He was only interested in the book.' He left after he took it from me, but not before he told Erdinger that Varuna had met their end of the bargain. Bargain? What bargain? I didn't find out. Hamel and I made a break for it after Isperus left. Our chances didn't look good, but the sorcerer we met at the first barrow showed up again and started slinging spells. We were able to fight off the Varunas and the confusion. Anfal and his men rode off, but we lost our horses and had to walk back. We didn't get back to Hullberg until early this afternoon, Garin finished. I came to see you as soon as I could leave Griffin Watch. So the Varuna mercenaries opened the barrows to find this book for Isperus, Miriam murmured, more to herself than to Garin. Jared stood in their way, and for that they killed him. "'Stealing barrel gold, I might have guessed. "'But searching for Isperus's spell-book? "'That's a dark and strange tale, and there's no doubt of it.' 
She remained silent for a long moment, looking down at her lap. Then she shook herself and raised her face to Garin again. So what does the Harmac mean to do about it? I'm not sure. As you know, the Varunas can hide behind the laws of concession. My uncle can't lightly set those aside, no matter how much he might want to, Garin scowled. I think that he feels that he's got to give Sergan and his council watch a chance to show where their loyalties lie. Of course, when I told my tale in front of Sergan and the Harmac, Sergan was quick to speak in Varuna's defense. He went so far as to suggest that my friend Hamill and I were the barrow robbers and were casting accusations at House Varuna to cover our own crimes. Miria's mouth twisted in a small, bitter smile. He did not. He did. Even my uncle, who's tried hard to believe the best about Sergan for fifteen years, had a hard time with that. Did Sergan have aught to do with the whole scheme? I couldn't say. He might have been protecting Varuna as a matter of simple self-interest. It seems that he's prospered greatly with the rise in House Varuna's fortunes, and that might be reason enough for Sergan to side against me. Garin smiled humorlessly. Then again, Sergan's hated me since we were children. I'm sure that had something to do with it, too. We had hard words for each other in front of my uncle. Sergan won't forget them. Nor will I. Miria started to say something else, but a sharp rap at the window beside the bolted door interrupted her. Garin glanced around behind him. The old dwarf from across the street was peering inside. The dwarf met his eyes through the wavy glass and gave a sharp jerk of his head before ducking away. "'Now what was that about?' Miria said. "'Trouble. I think the Varunas are coming back.' Garin stood. He could leave and try to avoid further trouble, but they might take it out on Miria. The best thing might be to meet them in the street, distance himself from Erstenwolds, and try to keep the mercenaries' attention on him. He closed his eyes and concentrated, unlocking a spell in his mind, and breathed the words for his silver-steel veil. I'll meet them outside. Miria didn't protest. She simply met his eyes and nodded slowly. I'll ask the neighbors to send for help, she said, and hurried out the back of the store. Garin moved to the door, unshot the bolt, and stepped out onto the porch. He glanced down the street. Three men in green and white tabards pushed through the passers-by. He descended from the store's covered porch to the cobblestones and strode out into the middle of Plank Street to await them. Two of them were men he hadn't seen before, but the third was Anfel Erdinger, wearing his armor of black plate under his Varuna tabard. The captain's face was set in an angry scowl. The three Varuna mercenaries came to a halt seven paces away from him, and the people moving about on the street nearby fell silent to listen and watch. "'You've made a serious mistake,' Erdinger grated. "'Trying to beat me to my prize up on the high fells was one thing. The book was there for the taking, after all. But now you're interfering in our business. My house paid well for our place in this wretched little town.' If you think a few brave words and some elf magic are going to make me surrender it, you're dead wrong, Hallmaster. It seems to me that your house's place in this town consists of robbing Hullberg blind, threatening unarmed women, and dealing with the Harmac's enemies, Garin retorted. I'd suggest that you ought to change your ways, but somehow I doubt that would make much of an impression— so I suppose I'll have to frame my point in terms you can understand. Every time a Varuna man hurts a Hullbergen or damages his property, I'll make certain that he soon regrets it. Fool, the mercenary captain spat. When you draw steel against a man in our colors, you draw steel against all of us. When we're done with you, you'll never hold a sword again. The other two mercenaries started to circle slowly around Garin. The sword mage shifted his stance a step, but kept his eyes on Erdinger. The mercenary captain shrugged his cape over his shoulder, clearing his sword hilt, and then Garin saw something familiar. 
on the mercenary captain's right hip rode an elven dagger with a pommel shaped like a sprig of holly. Garin stopped and stood his ground, narrowing his eyes. "'Where did you get that dagger, Erdinger?' he asked in a cold voice. The mercenary glanced down at his hip with a frown. Then he looked back up with a short rasp of cruel laughter. "'What, this? I suppose I found it out on the high fells. Why do you care?' I gave that dagger to Jared Erstenwold three years ago. Garin drew his sword in one easy motion, leveling the point at the Varuna captain. I name you murderer, thief, and tomb robber, Anfell Erdinger, and I name you a craven coward as well, since you seem to be unable to challenge a son of Hullberg without a three-to-one advantage in numbers— the Malmasterite's coarse amusement died in his throat, and an angry flush reddened his face. Garin had chosen his barb well. In Mulmaster, words such as Garin's were words to kill over. With two of his own armsmen and a handful of Hulbergen bystanders close at hand, Erdinger could not let it pass. "'No man calls me a coward and lives,' the mercenary hissed. One of the Varuna armsmen spoke. "'Captain Erdinger, he's baiting you.' "'Shut your mouth,' Erdinger snarled. "'And stand aside, both of you. "'This lies between me and him.' He drew his own blade, a well-made longsword engraved with the image of a serpentine dragon. The captain quickly moved the blade through several quick passes, slicing the air as he settled the sword in his grip, and then he advanced on Garin. "'I'll have satisfaction for your insults, my lord. "'You'd have been wiser to keep your accusations to yourself.' "'With a sudden martial shout, the Malmasterite sprang at Garin and attacked. "'He slashed high, recovered from Garin's parry with a jab at the sword mage's face, "'and then lunged quickly at Garin's belt buckle while Garin was still leaning back. "'Garin barely knocked Erdinger's point aside.' The mercenary was a fine swordsman, noticeably quicker and more skilled than Ban, and for a few moments Garin was hard-pressed to keep up a defense, let alone riposte. Another vicious thrust at his midsection he only deflected, and the Mulmasterite's point stopped only when the silver-steel veil turned it away from piercing Garin under his right-side ribs. "'Elf witchery!' the Varuna man snarled. "'And you accuse me of cowardice!' "'You wear steel plate,' Garin answered. "'My spells are my armor.' Erdinger attacked again, trying out Garin's measure more deliberately, seeking an opening. Garin fell back, choosing to use his footwork more as he studied Erdinger in return. The Varuna man was a master of the Mulman style. Hard strikes, hard parries, an emphasis on attack over defense— it was fairly common in the Moonsea lands. The cobblestones scuffed under his boots as he circled Erdinger, and the shrill ring of steel against steel filled the narrow street. Garin's own style was much less formal. He'd spent his early years largely teaching himself, learning to fit his blade work to his own strengths instead of the other way around. He'd come by his formal schooling much later, in Myth Dranner, learning from elf-blade masters who had studied their art for centuries. A small scowl of frustration began to work its way across Erdinger's face. He'd thrown himself into a sudden, fierce assault, but Garin had survived it, and in the space of three heartbeats the initiative in the duel passed from the mercenary to the sword-mage. Garin shifted from parries and riposts to more deliberate and dangerous attacks, throwing Erdinger on the defensive. Steel flickered and darted in the fading daylight, and the two duelists exchanged places several times in a row as Garin's passing attacks carried him to Erdinger's right flank, and the Mulmasterite quickly reciprocated. "'Stand still, damn you!' the Mulmasterite growled. 
Garin saw his chance. He fainted with his feet, bluffing at another passing attack, and Erdinger anticipated the move and gave way too soon. With the quickness of a striking serpent, Garin circled his point under the Malmasterite's parry, and then up and around in a looping cut that found the juncture of helm and shoulder. The last four inches of Garin's point slashed through Erdinger's neck, flicking scarlet drops across the street, and then Garin gave back a couple of steps. Erdinger grunted and recovered his guard, ignoring the blood coursing from his collar and bubbling between his bared teeth. He fixed his eyes on Garin and returned to the attack for two, then three swings, each growing wilder, and then he stumbled to all fours. His sword clattered to the cobblestones, and his eyes widened in shock. "'Not like this!' he rasped. Garin lowered his point and gazed coldly at the Varuna captain. "'I met you steel to steel, Erdinger,' he said. "'You might be a murderer and a thief.' But I must say it, you're not a coward. The Varuna captain pitched forward to the street and fell still, blood pooling beneath him. Garin knelt and pulled the elf dagger in its sheath from Erdinger's sword belt. This was Jared's, he said to no one in particular, and then he straightened and looked around. The townsfolk stood watching him, not saying a word. The remaining two Varuna men stared at their fallen captain with astonishment. Garin ignored them. He shook the blood from his sword and sheathed it. "'Words on its way to Griffin Watch, Garin,' Miria said. She stood on the steps of Erstenwolds, her face set in a worried frown. She wouldn't miss Anfel Erdinger, of course, but Miria had sense enough to see that this wasn't the end of the affair. The shield-sworn— "'Ought to be here soon enough. Are you wounded?' He realized that his side hurt and glanced down. A small, round spot of blood stained his tunic on the right side of his torso, where Erdinger's blade had pinked him. He was lucky. If his spells hadn't held, that could have been a mortal thrust. Not all of Varuna's blades are as slow or clumsy as Ban, he told himself. Erdinger might have beaten him on a different day.' and there were like the other Varunas who could as well. "'No, I'm fine,' he rasped. "'What do you aim to do now?' she asked. Garin remembered, standing on frosted grass beneath the last leaves of autumn, under the towers of Myth Dranor, watching the blood drip from his elven steel. He could still taste the rich, wet scent of the fallen leaves— he remembered looking up from his maimed enemy and meeting Allier's stricken gaze, the cold, sick shock that marked her perfect face, and the look of her turning away from him. He raised his eyes to Miria's face. She didn't flinch away from him. She was made of sterner stuff. But there'd be trouble from his duel with Varuna's captain, and they both knew it. It was inevitable. Garin shrugged. I'll wait for the shield sworn he said. 18. 28 Chess, the Year of the Ageless One Five severed heads stared sightlessly at Murren, arranged in a gore-spattered line across the steps of Bloodskull Keep. The half-orc chieftain sat next to the head of Morag, fuming with a black fury as wild and deadly as anything that had ever come over him on the field of battle. Two blood-skull warriors lay dead by his own hand, not ten feet behind him, killed because they had somehow failed to notice the appearance of the gruesome tokens on Murren's very doorstep. When he thought about it rationally, he had to admit that it was a feat of no little stealth and daring to deliver such a message to the bloody skulls. But at the moment, Murren was strongly disinclined to think about anything rationally. He wanted to kill, and kill again, to find someone to serve as the object of his wrath and beat the life out of him with his bare hands, to bludgeon and hammer until bone broke and flesh pulped under his naked fists. 
and until he knew that he could master his rage sufficiently to keep himself from falling on his own warriors or tribesfolk, he simply sat motionless on the steps and stared out at the cold, cloud-racked dusk dying out over the barren hills of Thar. It was the sheer insult of the thing that truly enraged him. Not only did the Hulbergans refuse to accord him the least measure of respect, they dared him to come try their strength. To kill the messengers was not entirely unexpected. It was always a possibility. One reason why Morag had asked to go and speak for the bloody skulls. It was a fine way to demonstrate a fitting indifference to death. Granted, it was a little unusual for humans— normally so fearful and cautious, to provide such a clear and unmistakable answer to Murren's demands instead of hours of empty, wandering words, but to send the severed heads back and so scornfully display them on the steps of his own keep showed such contempt for Murren that at first he'd wondered if perhaps the Red Claws or the Skull Smashers had captured Morag and his band and killed them to declare their rebellion against his rule. The message Murren's warriors had found with the heads answered any such suspicions. It was written on a piece of parchment, rolled in a small leather tube, and jammed into Morag's mouth. The Red Claws would have carved their words into the dead faces of his warriors. The Skull Smashers couldn't have managed any words at all. Murren looked down at the scrap of parchment in his hand and scowled. He could read well enough, having learned the skill from a human thrall who'd survived a few seasons in bondage. The Harmac's response was simple and to the point. I will not pay a single copper piece to a beast-man brigand. Any orc I catch within thirty miles of Hullberg will be treated exactly as these were. Harmac Grigor Hullmaster. Murren crumpled the parchment and slowly stood. He took a deep breath and decided that he was the master of his anger. Then he turned around to face the skull guards who watched him silently, the warriors who stood at their posts by the gate, two newly summoned to the task, of course, and Sutha and Yvelda, who also waited for him to speak. "'Send for the keepers of the skulls,' Murren said. "'Morag was a mighty warrior and a wise sub-chief. His skull should rest in honor. Let the skulls of the others be treated honorably. They were good warriors all, and it was no fault of theirs that the humans acted with such treachery. I will see to it, Sutha said. She was intelligent enough not to ask about the two guards Murren had killed. Whether they had really earned their deaths through a lack of vigilance, Murren could not say. But he had said it, and killed them for it, so now he must act as if it were the judgment of Graumpsch himself. Sutha understood that without being told. The two gate guards would be discarded with the keep's rubbish, to be gnawed upon by whatever scavenger came along. Murren's eye fell on one of the orcs who had been summoned to replace the previous guards. "'Berthar, come here,' he commanded. "'You are a skillful tracker.' Tell me, how could someone bring five heads to our doorstep without being caught at it? The warrior nodded and came down the steps. He squatted by the first of the heads, frowning as he studied the nearby ground, and slowly moved along the whole line. Then he dabbed his fingertips in one of the blood spatters and held them to his nose, inhaling deeply before opening his mouth to rub a small smear over his thick tongue. Having fixed the scent in his nostrils, he circled the area, following the unseen trail. Not all orcs had noses as keen as Berthar's, and Murren could never have managed it, a weakness of his human blood. After a short time, the tracker returned to the castle steps, still frowning. "'I have read the ground, war chief, but the tale—' it tells makes no sense to me. Then tell me what you can, Berthar. I will not be angry with you. 
I hear you, war chief. Berthar moved around to a confused series of splatters near the last head in line, the one on the lowest step, and pointed with the tip of his spear. Here all five heads were dumped together on the ground, emptied out of a sack, I think. The creature who set the heads where you see them carried them one at a time from this spot. It was a big cat, like a red tiger. Look, here you see where it stepped in blood and left a paw print. But it was not a red tiger. I know their sign and scent well. An animal carried the heads in a bag and dumped them here. Berthar shook his head and motioned for Murrin to follow him. This is the part that makes no sense to me, he said. He led the chief and the others about fifty yards from the keep, into the barren, rock-strewn ground, a little way off the cart track leading to the gatehouse, and pointed again to the ground. The blood scent, the cat scent, the paw prints, they all stop here, right at this spot. If the creature had carried these heads any farther, I would smell it. It is as if the creature simply appeared right here. It is not natural. Nor is it natural for a tiger, or something like it, to carry heads in a bag and line them up neatly when it finds the right spot, Murrin muttered. You can go, Berthar. I cannot ask you to track ghosts. The warrior struck his spear to his hide shield and trotted back to his post. The Harmac had some sorcerer with a spell of shape-changing deliver Morag's head to us, Sutha said quietly. Or he had one of his infidel priests summon some sort of invisible cat-demon to perform this task. It is not hard to explain. Explaining is not the problem, Ivelda corrected her. There were two messages sent here, my chief. The first is the one you saw on the steps of the keep. The second is that the Harmac commands magic or magical allies to deliver it. If he could arrange for some monster to appear fifty yards outside your walls, he could arrange for that monster to appear inside your walls, or perhaps in your bedchamber, to murder you in your sleep. I understand it, Yvelda, Murren said. He turned on his heel and stalked back toward the keep, his mind filled with thought. Before Glister he already would have had his warriors mustering for the march to Hullberg. But if he began his march, and Cardell Terov told him to cease, then Murren would appear fatally weakened in the eyes of the bloody skulls. He would have to make sure that the Vassan lord would make no effort to restrain him before he told his sub-chiefs and war-leaders to send their spears south. The notion of asking for permission to make war against Hulberg and avenge the mortal insult given to the bloody skulls made him seethe with anger, but that was the price he had paid for Vassa's aid. If he hadn't agreed to do as the warlock knight bade— Murren had no doubt that Terov would have elevated some other chief of Thar to dominance, and the Bloody Skulls would now be another tribe's weaker allies. If he could not run free, well, then he would make sure that no other wolf sat closer to the master's table than he did. Murren passed through the gate and turned aside into the stairs that led up to the keep's eastern tower. These chambers had been given over to the Vassan warlocks who remained with him to provide his army with its newly found battle magic. Human guards in fine black mail bowed to Murren when he approached. "'I am not to be disturbed,' he told them. "'Yes, warlord,' the guards answered. They grounded their halberds to the floor. At the topmost floor of the tower— Murren came to a door, struck it twice in deference to the human custom, and entered. Avron, he said in Vassen, I need your speaking magic. A fair-haired Vassen sat behind a small desk, pouring through a thick tome. He looked up at Murren, slowly stood, and offered a shallow bow behind a cool smile. Of course, warlord, 
I presume this is in reference to the return of your envoys from Hulberg? I want to tell Terov that the Hulbergans killed my messengers. I march against Hulberg tomorrow at sunset with all my strength. I mean to raise Hulberg, kill all its men, and take his women and children for thralls. The Harmac will rue this day before long, I promise you. The Vasan wizard nodded. Give me ten minutes to prepare the magic, warlord. Murren waved his hand in assent, and the human quickly and efficiently began to make ready his ritual. From shelves along the wall he took a variety of arcane implements, tall candlesticks of wrought iron topped with fat yellow candles, jars filled with strange liquids, a skull made of some reddish crystal. He arranged the candlesticks in a five-pointed star, lit the tapers with a magic word, and sprinkled drops from the jars around the candlesticks. He sat down cross-legged on the floor in the center of the candles, and used another minor spell to suspend the crystal skull in the air over his shoulder. Finally, Avrin opened his heavy tome and read a long passage of some sinister gibberish, while Murrin paced anxiously outside the circle. The wizard finished with his chants, and made a small gesture to the floating skull. The rosy crystal began to glow with a ruddy light. "'Cardel Terov, he intoned. "'This is Avran, speaking for Murren. "'Hulberg slew his envoys and sent back their heads. "'Murren marches tomorrow night to attack and raise Hulberg.' "'Murren shuddered at the crawling sense of sorcery, filling the small room. "'For a long moment nothing more happened, "'and the orc chief wondered if the spell had somehow failed. "'But then Avran grunted and straightened, and the crystal skull began to speak. "'I am Terov,' it said. "'March on Hulberg, crush their defences, but spare the town until I arrive. I need it. You will be well satisfied with the ransom they pay.' "'Ransom is fine, but Harmac Grigor must die for the insult he gave me,' Morin snapped. "'I warn you, Terov. It will have to be a rich prize indeed if I find Hulberg helpless before my horde. The candles around the Vasen mage abruptly guttered out, and the small crystal skull sank down in the air. Avron reached up and deftly caught it in his hand, and shook himself slightly before climbing to his feet. I am sorry, warlord, but the magic of the sending ritual only allows me to send a single message and receive a single answer. Felthane Terov did not hear the last thing you said. It would take me some time to make ready another one. Murren growled and waved his hand. No matter. I heard all that I needed to hear. The rest can wait for now. Shall I have my warlock knights make ready to march? Avrin asked. If you have been told to remain close to me, then you will, Murren answered him. I go to Hulberg to put my steel at the Harmac's throat, and then we will see what ransom he can pay that will satisfy me. 19. 28 Chess, The Year of the Ageless One Early on the morning after the duel with Erdinger, Harmac Grigor surprised Garin with a sharp rap at his chamber door. Garin had just finished his morning exercises, and was preparing to refresh his arcane wards and spells, but he set aside his tome and stood when the old lord limped into the room, leaning on his cane. Grigor glanced at the spell-book. "'You're more of a student now than you once were,' he observed. "'You had little interest in arcane matters when you were a younger man.' "'but I see that you've learned much in the years you've been away from home.' "'I didn't know it myself until I went to Mithdranor,' Garin answered. "'I learned Elvish there and studied under an elf bladesinger named Dariad Selsharin. "'My sword play caught his eye, but he saw that I also had a talent for magic that I'd never suspected.' "'He closed his spellbook. "'What can I do for you, Uncle Grigor?' I hope you will forgive the interruption, 
but Sergen came to see me shortly after sunrise this morning. He presented a demand from House Varuna and the Merchant Council for your immediate arrest on charges of murder. Garin snorted in disgust. The forms might not have been strictly observed, but it was a duel, not a murder, he said. He told Grigor, Kara, and Hamel about his encounter with the Varuna captain the previous evening, expecting that his uncle and his cousin would be appalled by his rashness. To his surprise, Grigor simply heard out his account of events, and then asked him to remain at Griffin Watch until the consequences of the duel sorted themselves out. The fact that the Harmek was standing in his room seemed to suggest that those were already upon him. I fought Erdinger fairly. He struck first, by the way, and the other Varuna men stayed out of it. There were many witnesses. Oh, I believe you, Garin. I told Sergen as much. He argued that until the circumstances of the duel had been verified by the Council's inquest, you should be remanded to the Council watch and held. I said that I'd arrange for a fair and independent inquiry, but that you'd remain at liberty until it was concluded. Not that I expected any fair inquest to incriminate you, if the accounts I'd heard were accurate. The Harmac paced over to the window seat in Garin's room, and leaned against the padded bench. At that point— Sergen insisted that you'd proven yourself a murderous scofflaw several times over, and that you were single-handedly ruining our family fortunes by ignoring Varuna's rights and protections under the laws of concession. Ruining our fortunes or his? Garin muttered darkly. He looked over to his uncle. What did you say? I told him that his generous interpretation of the laws of concession— did not take precedence over the Harmac's interpretation of the rest of the Harmac's laws, and that as far as I knew, I was still Harmac of Hullberg. I'm afraid Sergen left after that. I'm not surprised. The Varunas missed their chance at me on the high fells, and then again yesterday, so they sent Sergen to persuade you to arrest me for them. Garin remembered Varuna's mercenaries wrecking Miria's store, and his mouth tightened. It was bad enough that foreigners had such contempt for the Harmac that they believed they could simply lay the town under tribute and plunder it in the guise of trade laws. But his step-cousin was clearly doing everything in his power to ensure their success. The question was, why? Sergen must have been bought completely or smitten, perhaps, by Darcy Varuna, since he was so faithfully working in her interests. But something about that struck Garin as not quite right. Sergen had always been keenly aware of his own self-interest, even as a boy. It wasn't like him to faithfully work at anything he didn't want for himself, which meant that Sergen wasn't seeing to Varuna's interests by keeping his merchant council out of the way of the foreign costers. He was likely seeing to his own. Perhaps the Varunas were working for Sergen instead of the other way around. That must be it, Garin murmured aloud. Some new thought has struck you, I see. Grigor set his hands atop the head of his cane. What is it, Garin? I think Sergen means to supplant you, uncle. He doesn't work for House Varuna. They work for him. Everything he's done to increase the power of the Merchant Council, he's done to add to his own base of power. You must move against him before he moves against you. Garon, even if you're right, I cannot easily remove him, Grigor said wearily. What happens if I attempt to oust Sergen, and he still retains control of the Merchant Council? I must tell you frankly that I don't know if my shield-sworn could overcome the Council's combined forces. Even if my shield-sworn succeeded in disarming the foreign companies, 
we'd face the complete ruin of Hullberg's commerce, because you can be sure that the merchants will put a stop to all trade, in or out, until they are once again content with the state of affairs. Unless, of course, the bloody skulls prove as dangerous as Kara fears, in which case we all might be swept into the sea because we were too busy fighting each other to defend our borders against warlord Murren's horde. Garin stood in silence for a long moment. He hadn't really appreciated the difficult course his uncle was trying to chart. Do nothing, and allow the foreign interests to devour Hullberg a small bite at a time, or resist and risk catastrophe. In that light, it was not unreasonable to seek some accommodation with the foreigners, an understanding about just what belonged to them and what remained the Harmax. "'Would it be better if I left Hullberg?' he finally said. "'It seems that I brought troubles to your doorstep that you hardly need. If I went back to Tantras, Sergen would no longer have the pretext of my so-called scofflaw deeds to challenge your authority.' "'You didn't cause our troubles, Garin. "'They were here before you returned, waiting for you to find them.' "'The Harmac glanced out the window. "'The day promised more warm spring rain, "'somewhat out of season even for the end of the month of chess. "'I think you've opened my eyes to the dangers "'that I've been trying to grope my way through for some time now.' I am not happy to see these things as they are, but only a fool would hope to remain in ignorance instead of facing an ugly truth. The old lord laughed softly and without humor. On the other hand, I am pleased that at least one of the men who murdered Jared Erstenwold has met with justice, and I am pleased that you took a stand against extortion in any guise. Darcy Varuna was long overdue for just the sort of check you've given her, thugs. They've bullied honest Hulbergans for too long, but now I fear for your life. The Varunas will certainly seek a way to retaliate against you, so that they will not appear weak to their rivals and competitors. I won't hide in Griffinwatch, Garin answered him. House Varuna struck their bargain with the king in copper for a reason, and I still mean to find out why, and I don't believe for a moment that Sergen will leave Miria Erstenwold alone, not as long as I'm here, he shrugged. What's happened so far is only the first pass of steel in a long fight. I can't have you pursue a vendetta against House Varuna, Garin, the Harmac said sternly. Like it or not, the laws of concession apply to you as much as any Hulbergen. You can defend life or property, as you did against the Varunas wrecking the Erstenwold store, but they must offer you a cause to intervene. After all, any free man is obligated to protect others who are threatened with harm. But whatever you do, Stay out of Varuna's compounds or trade yards. If you fall into their power in one of the concessions, I won't be able to protect you. Garin grimaced, but he nodded. Trade concessions were much the same all over the lands of the inner sea. In effect, the property owned by House Varuna was a little piece of Mullmaster in the middle of Hullberg's dock district just as the Red Sails storehouses in Impilter were protected by the laws of Tantras. But something else in the Harmac's words had given him the glimmers of an idea. "'I understand, Uncle Grigor,' he replied. "'I'll watch where I step.' "'Good lad,' said Grigor. He stood up, slowly, gripped Garin's shoulder, and limped out of the room. Garin sat down at the small writing desk and gazed out the window for a time, organizing his thoughts. Then he returned to his magical studies and finished weaving his wards and protections. He threw his good wool cloak over his shoulders, buckled on his sword belt, and went in search of Hamel. It took longer than he expected. 
Hamel was nowhere in the Harmax Tower or the Upper Bailey. Garin finally resorted to asking the servants and guards, and found the halfling in the castle's salot, a large wooden-floored practice room near the lower gatehouse. Hamel was engaged in a furious, hard-fought bout against Kara, so Garin waited and watched. He'd known for years that Hamel was one of the fastest blades he'd ever seen, and an expert acrobat as well, but he remembered Kara as exceptionally quick-footed and agile. Both fought with buckler and rapier, equally unfamiliar to each, really, since Hamel preferred knives, and Kara usually carried a longsword. She was twenty inches taller, and had a considerable advantage in reach and strength. When Hamel managed to get inside her guard, his smaller stature turned to his advantage. While Garin watched, Kara raced across the floor and spun past Hamel, her practice sword flicking out in a lightning-quick passing cut, but Hamel batted the stroke high with his buckler and lunged at her hip. Kara was not there. She was already moving away, opening the range to restore the advantage of her reach. Hamel pressed closer and quickly somersaulted up under Kara's blade, but the ranger stood her ground, twisting away from his point, and brought her own rapier straight down from overhead in an inverted thrust that touched Hamel at the back of the neck. Garin smiled to himself. She'd met Hamel's unorthodox attack with a similarly unorthodox riposte. The halfling's roll would have worked better with a shorter blade. It simply took Hamel too long to ready his attack with the rapier, though Garin did not doubt that he would have spitted most ordinary swordsmen. Kara was almost as quick as he was. Not bad, Hamel admitted. He straightened up and gave her a small bow of respect. Likewise, Master Hamel, Kara said with a smile. She stepped back and saluted with her rapier. I'm afraid I must attend to my duties. If I don't leave soon, I won't be able to get back by tomorrow. Riding up to the watchtowers again? Garin asked. I want to have another look around Raven Hill. If the bloody skulls mount a raid against us, I think it'll come from that quarter. Kara looked at Garin's cloak and tunic and frowned. You're not leaving the castle, are you? I won't find many more answers here, Kara. The Varunas will be looking for a chance to challenge you, Garin. You'd be wiser not to play their game. Garin shrugged and picked up another practice sword from a rack close at hand. He executed several quick blocks. The Malmasterites begin to open barrows. Jared fails to stop them. We learn that Erdinger is seeking something in an ancient priest's barrow— Hamel and I failed to keep the Infernadex out of their hands. Sergan's merchant council threatens Hullberg's small traders. So I try to drive off Runa thugs who are trying to intimidate and bully Mirja Erstenwold. The practice sword whistled through the air as he spoke. Then Garin shifted from parries to a sudden fierce thrust at his unseen foe. Everyone who finds himself in opposition to House Varuna does nothing but parry. I think it's time for a riposte. Kara frowned unhappily. Garin, what do you intend? He turned and looked over to Kara. Is Dernan Osting still a captain of the Spearmeet? Dernan? Yes, I suppose so. Hamel looked up at Garin. What's the Spearmeet? My apologies, Hamel. It's the militia of Hullberg. In the years after the spell plague, Harmac Angar decreed that all landowning households must arm a spearman and drill together regularly. Most of the old families of the town passed down a male burney, a steel cap, a good hide shield, and some weapons. Some of the townsfolk, especially those who live up in the winter spear, used to take it quite seriously. Only a few of the musters still gather now. Kara said. She looked at Garin and folded her arms over her male shirt. There hasn't been much need for the spear meat in recent years. What do you want with them? The spear meat is made up of old, native families like the Erstenwolds, said Garin. They're the people who have the most loyalty to the Harmac, and they've got little reason to be happy with foreign merchants taking over the town. 
I think it might be a useful lesson for the merchant council if a thousand Hulbergans decided to put on their family mail and shake the rust off their old spears. Besides, if the orcs of Thar are coming, it might be a good idea anyway. They're not professional soldiers, Garin. I doubt that the Varunas or Sokols or any of the others would be much impressed. But still, you may be right about the bloody skulls. Kara brushed some of the perspiration from her face and then nodded. I'll speak to the Harmac about calling out the spear meat simply to count heads and see who turns out. It couldn't hurt. Thank you, Kara, Garin said. He looked over to Hamel and asked, How do you feel about a visit to a tap house? I regard the prospect with pleasure, as always, Hamel answered. But isn't it a little early? Not if you want to speak to the master of the house before his establishment is full of customers demanding service. Garin waited while Hamel stripped off his practice jerkin, pulled his fine ruffled shirt over his torso, and threw on his cloak. Then they took their leave of Kara and left the salad. The tap house Garin had in mind was close by Griffin Watch, so he and Hamel strolled down the castle's causeway on foot through the light rain. In the square of the Harmag's foot, Garin turned right and followed the Vale Road to the north, away from the town proper. Wagons and carts creaked by alongside them, a steady parade of provisions heading out to the mining camps, and farmers headed in the other direction, bringing food into town for sale. A couple of hundred yards brought the two companions to the Troll and Tankard, on the northern edge of the town. It was a big, sprawling building, its lower floor made of heavy fieldstone, its upper story timber. The tap-house stood astride the ancient walls of Hullberg. Even though they had been destroyed centuries ago, a low mound of broken masonry ran from the building's foundation to the river bank. "'Here we are,' Garin said. He led Hamel to the sturdy front door and let himself inside. The interior of the tap-house was as drafty and drab as the inside of a barn. The air was thick with the smell of brewing beer, and dozens of small kegs were stacked up along the walls. Little daylight filtered in through the small, dirty windows high overhead. Charming, Hamel muttered. I can see why you favor the place, Garin. A beefy, brown-bearded man with a swaying belly under his apron appeared from the back room, carrying a heavy keg over his shoulder. "'Good morning, sirs,' he said in a booming voice. "'The tap-room doesn't open until noon, but I can sell you a keg or two now, if that's what you're needing. "'I'm not here for your beer, Dernan Austin. I'm here for you.' Garin threw back his hood and shook the water from his hair. "'Lord Garin,' the brewmaster said. "'Well, I'll be. I heard you were back in town.' "'And I heard all sorts of tales, too. "'Stories of fighting chainsmen in the tailings, "'battling ghosts up on the high fells, "'learning some manners to them Varuna swords, "'and a duel against Anfell Erdinger yesterday eve. "'The tap-house was full of the talk. "'Is it true?' "'Some of it, at least. "'I don't recall fighting any ghosts, but I've crossed blades with a few of the Varuna men in the last ten day, including Erdinger. "'I heard you killed him,' Garin nodded. "'I did.' The brewmaster grinned fiercely. "'Good! Never did like that red-haired bastard anyway. Wish I could have seen it myself.' He set down his keg and brushed his big hands against his apron. "'You said you wanted me for something. What can I do for you, my lord?' "'I've seen how House Faruna's men intimidate Hullberg's merchants. Are they troubling you, too?' The brewmaster frowned. "'It ain't just the Varunas. All of the big foreign merchants collect so-called dues for the gods be cursed council. The Varunas, the Sokols, the Double Moon Men, the Janarsks of Flan, they've got the crimson chains on their payroll, believe it or not, and even the Marsteels, who are supposed to be Hulbergans. They're leaning on me and me boys, too. I ain't knuckled under yet, 
but now they're threatening folks who do business with me. If the provisioners and smaller alehouses ain't buying me brew, well, things'll have to change for the troll and tankard. Dernan looked at the kegs, stacked up against the wall, and scowled. It wasn't so bad last year or the year before, but nowadays they're ruining everyone, Lord Garen. The Harmac needs to do something about it. Is that why you're here? Not exactly, Garen admitted. My uncle's got to be careful to respect the concessions, Dernan. He's convinced that they're a necessary evil, and I suppose I see that Hullberg can't get along without them. But I think there's a lot that can be done that won't set the Harmac directly against the Merchant Council. It just needs to be a little informal. The brewmaster raised an eyebrow. Go on, he said. The problem with the Merchant Council is that it doesn't respect the interests of Hullbergans. It exists to protect and enrich foreigners. What we need is a different sort of Merchant Council, an alliance between the small merchants and craftsmen who are under coercion from the foreign houses. If there were a hundred armed Hullbergans on the street corners, watching to make sure that Council thugs couldn't rough up people or wreck their stores to intimidate them, I think things might be different in town. Garin leaned against the bar and tapped his hand to the hilt of his sword. I've been trying to keep an eye on Miria Erstenwold's shop, but there is only one of me. Two, Hamel interjected. I'm not about to let you fight this out alone, Garin. Two, then, but I need more help, Garin continued. I can't be everywhere at once. We need more blades on our side. Dernan scratched at his beard and squinted, thinking it over. Garin remembered that the burly brewmaster was more deliberate than he usually let on with his boisterous manner and loud voice. "'It'd take more than a hundred men,' he finally said. "'You'd need more like three or four hundred, since we all got to be able to keep at our trades and provide for our families. I could stand a watch one day in four, and me boys, too.' and some of the stouter fellows who work for us, but we couldn't all be off on guard every day. I agree. That's why I was thinking of starting with the spear meat. Dernan stared at Garin and then let out a sharp bark of laughter. By Tempus, you don't do things by half measures, my lord. How many men are in your muster, Dernan? You're still a captain of the spear meat, aren't you? Aye, I am. I've got two hundred in name, maybe seven score, in fact. Of those, about a hundred would be worth anything in a fight. What of the other captains? How are their musters? The spear meet was made up of six mustering companies, each about two hundred strong, or at least it had been when Garin was a lad. He didn't know if that was still true. Trestrofin's boys are pretty good, but the others don't really measure up to mine or his, the brewmaster said proudly. We drill every couple of months. Some of the other musters ain't tried that in years, but you could find a couple of dozen good men in each, I'd wager. Hamel cleared his throat. Garin, a hundred men on the street might not be enough. Varuna alone has at least that many, and they're trained mercenaries. We don't need to be able to beat them, Hamel, Garin answered. We just need to raise the cost of intimidating Hullberg. The Harmac's willing to tolerate the foreign costers, but he certainly won't tolerate Hullbergans cut down in the streets simply for standing up for themselves. Sergen and his foreign friends know that. It'll come to a fight before it's done, the halfling said. Mark my words— the council houses will try to punish men who are standing those watches, burning a few houses or businesses while the men are away protecting their neighborhoods, or perhaps baiting one of your patrols into an open fight. Be that as it may, we might surprise those foreign bastards and make some of them bleed, too, Dernan said. That's the way of it with a bully. Sooner or later you've got to stand up to him, punch him in the nose, and damn what follows. You might get thrashed, but he'll think twice for he pushes you again. 
Besides, we'll have a lot more eyes than spears on our side if we tell the folk of each neighborhood to make sure they send word quick when they see councilmen up to no good. We'll be able to shadow them anywhere they go. The brewmaster shrugged and picked up his keg again. Count me in. I'll send word round to my muster. Some of them won't show their faces since they work for the council houses, but most of my men'll help. Good, Garin said. Who else should I talk to? Burkle Tresterfin, for certain. Wester and Ilker are fair captains, too, and their musters might surprise me. After that, try Lodheron the smith. He ain't in the spear meet, but there are a few dwarves what would be happy to stand with us. I will. Can I tell the others to bring the men they need to the troll and tankard tomorrow evening to organize a watch scheme? Durnan grinned in his big beard. I've always wanted to foment rebellion. For the Harmac, of course. Tomorrow, then, Garin said. He gripped the brewmaster's hand and then left the old tap house. The light rain had faded to a mist that hung in the air, drifting in tatters just about the rooftops of the town. Let me guess, Hamel said. Tresterfin next? Good guess, Garin said. He nodded at the Vale Road. The Tresterfin homestead is about two miles outside town. Garin and Hamel spent the rest of the day crisscrossing Hullberg and the farms nearby, speaking to dozens of Hullbergans about the council watch and what had to be done. Many were people Garin knew well from his boyhood, and he retold the story of his travels in the last ten years so often that he soon shortened the account to a few vague sentences about traveling the inner sea lands, visiting Myth Draner, and buying into the red sail coster of Tantras. A few of the men and women he spoke with declined to help. Some feared the retribution of the council watch, but others were simply cautious about taking up arms, and thought it likely to worsen the situation instead of improve it. They simply hadn't yet suffered any great harm from the foreigners, or reached the point where they were willing to hazard life or property to stand up against them. Two times Garin found that the shield-meat captains he was looking for had more or less given up on their musters, but each time the old leaders gave him suggestions for other Hullbergans who might be willing to help out. Late in the afternoon, Garin headed to Erstenwold's. He found the building boarded up, with a couple of Mira's cousins keeping an eye on the place. They told him that Mira and Salsha were staying at the old Erstenwold homestead in the Winterspear Vale. Reassured that Mira's store was well looked after, Garin and Hamel returned to Griffin Watch for the night. The next morning the rain returned in force, and the wind picked up as well. A moon-sea gale was gathering over the cold waters of the small sea, drenching Hullberg with hard-driven rain. Hamel gave Garin a doleful look when Garin told him that they had more people to speak with, but he followed Garin back down into town. Their cloaks were sodden before they reached the bottom of the causeway. The weather was foul enough that the Harmac's foot seemed almost deserted, with little of the wagon traffic that normally crowded it in the morning. "'Well, where to now?' Hamel asked. "'Please tell me that it's a short walk to some place warm and cheerful.' Garin glanced right and left, trying to decide whom he wished to speak to next." Nearby, a party of dwarves worked to fix a broken wagon axle in the rain. Across the small square, several men, cloaked against the weather, stood beneath the overhang of a smoking house, arguing prices with the proprietor before large racks where dozens of smoked moon-sea silver fins cured in the open air. Easy Street, he decided. Vanershall the Fletcher has her workshop there. She used to be quite an archer. I wouldn't be surprised if she's taught her sons to shoot as well as she did. Then we might visit Therick's livery, which is nearby. They started across the small square, splashing through the puddles and mud gathering beneath the cobblestones. Then Hamel frowned, and his step slowed. Something isn't right here, Garin, he said silently. This is an ambush. Not twenty yards from the castle causeway? 
Garin thought in surprise. He glanced around behind him and saw the dwarves by the wagon pulling aside the canvas covering. Crossbows waited underneath. The men by the smoking house suddenly broke off their arguing and turned back to the court, striding toward the two companions. The sword mage had expected some attempt by House Varuna, but not one so brazenly sprung beneath Griffinwatch's battlements. Besides, none of the men or dwarves around them wore Varuna's green and white. "'Break past the men. Leave the dwarves behind,' he hissed to Hamel. Then, as quick as thought, he framed the words for a spell and snapped, "'Quillen Mahariel!' His silver-steel veil appeared around him, glowing softly in the dim daylight, and Garin sprinted toward the men coming from the smoking-house. Hamel followed a half-step behind. "'Now!' someone shouted. The men in front of him swept out their blades and moved to cut him off. One of them hung back, drawing a wand from his sleeve and aiming it at Garin. From behind he heard the sharp snap of crossbows firing and bolts hissed through the air behind him. Two clattered past, skipping along the cobblestones, but a third sank into the back of his calf with a searing jolt of pain. Garin stumbled and rolled heavily to the wet cobblestones, but he let his momentum roll him to his feet again and loped as best as he could toward the swordsmen rushing him. The dwarves might not be so fast to shoot at him if he was in the middle of their allies. Hamel divined his intent and altered his own course to follow. The halfling threw himself at the feet of the first man he reached, knives flashing, and the fellow cursed and went down as Hamel rolled through his shins. Then Garin met two of the swordsmen at the same time, sweeping out his blade to bat aside one man's cut. He followed that with a sudden slash at the other swordsman and managed to gash that one's forehead in a shallow, bloody cut before the man could block his blow. That enemy staggered back, momentarily blinded, so Garin returned to the man on his right. Then the wizard snarled something in an arcane tongue, and a dazzling violet ray sprang from his wand and struck Garin over his heart. It felt as if he'd been hit with a hammer. All of the sudden his knees grew weak. He staggered unsteadily, and brilliant purple echoes jarred and danced in his eyes as his mind reeled in magical vertigo. A stunning spell of some kind, he realized, and he tried to frame a countering enchantment to clear his mind, but the words simply eluded his grasp. Before he could find them, the other swordsmen were upon him. He opened his eyes just in time to see the pommel of a long sword descending toward his forehead. The blow struck him blind again, and he staggered back over a barrel and tripped, falling to the street. His sword rang shrilly on the cobblestones beside him. Garin! Hamel shouted from some great distance. Then mailed fists and booted feet descended on him in a sudden violent deluge, and darkness took him. Twenty. One Tarsac, the Year of the Ageless One. The creaking of a wagon's wheels and the clip-clop of a horse's hooves on cobblestones brought Garin back to a painful consciousness. He was lying in damp straw in a dark, swaying wagon, bound hand and foot. His calf burned where the bolt had struck him. His forehead felt hot and sticky and throbbed in agony, and the whole right side of his jaw ached abominably. Gingerly he ran his tongue over his teeth and found one of his molars was deeply split. Loose bits of tooth were adrift in his mouth. He spat blood and debris out on the straw of the wagon, and groaned despite himself. "'Good, you ain't dead,' a deep, gravelly voice said from somewhere behind him. "'I wouldn't thrash round too much if I were you. Don't do you no good. It'll hurt like blazes, and I'll beat you senseless again if you're making me to.' "'Where am I?' Garin rasped. It hurt to talk. "'On your way to that tawdry ten-silver-fest hall they call Council Hall. We'll be there soon enough. I understand your accommodations are waiting for you.' The speaker laughed dryly. Garin rolled slowly to one side and glanced up at his captor. 
The fellow was a black-bearded dwarf in heavy armor. He sat on a bench in the back of the wagon, watching Garin. He had a clay pipe clenched in his mouth, and held a short-handled cudgel capped with an ugly lead shot in his lap. "'Who are you?' the sword-mage asked. "'Ken Durkle Iron Thane, master of the Ice Hammer Company. Please to make your acquaintance, my lord, especially since you've earned me a very fine bonus this morning.' The dwarf's pipe bobbed as he grinned under his thick beard, but his eyes remained neutral and wary. "'I heard you know a thing or two about magic, so don't be giving me reason to think you might be trying to cast a spell, or I'll have to put you to sleep with me little persuader here. Besides, you're in mage shackles, so there ain't no point in even trying.' Garin didn't know if he would have been inclined to try a spell with Kandurkel sitting over him with the ugly little mace in his hand, but the maid's shackles settled it. He decided he'd test them later to be sure. But if the dwarf wasn't lying, then he wouldn't get far. Mage shackles were enchanted with negation spells that simply absorbed any magic a captive tried to summon before it could be shaped into even the simplest spell. What? happened to my friend? he asked. The halfling? Well, nobody offered me a bounty on him, so I left him in the street. He fought like a wild cat till me wizard struck him senseless with that purple ray he used to knock the sand out of you. The dwarf shrugged. I suppose I should have brought him along just on speculation, if you will. But frankly, I don't like the smell of this whole business, and I figured I'd be wiser to stick to the contract I was certain of. The wagon hit a sharp bump, and Garin winced as his head pounded in protest. He felt nauseated, and his limbs felt as weak as thin straws. Likely the after-effects of the blow to the head that had knocked him down. I don't suppose I can offer you a better deal than your bounty to let me go, can I? No, that'd be unprofessional. I've got me reputation to think of. What if I told you that the council mercenaries intend to hold me for murder because I killed a man in a fair duel, or that they're angry with me because I'm interfering with their plans to intimidate and extort half the folk in town? Would that make a difference? The dwarf chewed on the stem of his pipe and thought for a moment. "'No, can't say that it would,' he said. "'I've found it don't pay to worry too much about what folks say when they're in your sort of predicament. Most of the time they're lying. But if they did be telling the truth, well, then, I'd feel just awful about collecting the gold what's on their heads. Better to assume they're all lying. I sleep better that way.' "'Well, look, here we are.' Garin caught a glimpse of heavy wooden beams carved in fantastic shapes high overhead through the small barred window in the wagon's door. Then Ken Durkle knelt down beside him and pulled a heavy leather hood over his head and face. "'Mind your manners a little bit longer, and I'll make sure I take off the hood when we get to your cell,' the dwarf said." The inside of the hood was lightless, dank, and hard to breathe through. Garin heard the wagon door swing open, and then several hands seized him by the arms and hauled him out. He tried to get his feet under him as best he could, but his knees were still quite weak, and his legs didn't work as well as they should have. He was half carried along by the unseen men around him. They took him down a flight of steps, through several doors, down another flight of steps, and finally through another door. Garin tried to think of some way to escape, but even if he hadn't been sick and dizzy from the beating, he doubted that he could have managed much with magic-impeding shackles on his hands and a heavy leather hood to blind him. Several men seized him closely then, and his shackles were removed briefly, readjusted, and then snapped back into place. Only after that did the hood come off his face. The dwarf stepped back, rolling the hood in his hands. "'He's all yours,' he rasped. "'The ice hammers be done with this.' "'A fine piece of work, Captain Kendurkon,' 
Sergeant Hallmaster stood outside Garin's cell, dressed in a resplendent, pleated coat of deep blue embroidered with gold thread. He wore a large gold medallion around his neck, a symbol of office, or so Garin guessed. Several of the council watch stood nearby in their browned cuirasses. "'Thanks to your diligence, this murderer will soon face justice for his crimes.' The dwarf glanced at Garin. "'That's your business,' he said. "'You know where to find me if you're needing the ice hammers for anything else, Lord Sergon. I go.' He withdrew, his heavy tread scuffing the stone floor. The sword-mage looked down at his shackles. They'd been moved around in front of his body and tethered to an iron ring set in the floor of the cell, so he could move around a little bit. There was a plain pallet of straw in one corner of the cell, a chamber pot in the other, and a flickering lantern in the hallway outside. "'Your merchant council has a dungeon, Sergon? he asked. "'The council watch, actually,' his step-cousin replied. "'It's less than three years old and seems to me to be a much better place than you deserve. "'If I had my way.' "'You'd be thrown into the darkest, foulest oubliette I could find. "'Your generosity overwhelms me. "'Sarcasm ill becomes you, Garin. "'If it helps you at all, "'you can take comfort in the fact that you'll be given a speedy trial "'before a special commission of the Merchant Council. "'I expect they'll quickly condemn you to hang, "'so the quality of your accommodations won't trouble you for long.' Garin took a deep breath and silently promised himself that he would not give Sergon the satisfaction of angering him, or frightening him, for that matter. In truth, he felt too miserable to muster much of a retort. "'You've given yourself the power to try people who displease you and to order executions. Uncle Grigor's a patient man, but I think he might object, Sergon. "'The laws of concession, Garin. "'Members of foreign legations are protected from crimes of person or property. "'You killed Anfel Erdinger in the sight of dozens of people. "'So House Faruna's entitled to demand your arrest and trial under Mulman law. "'I doubt the Harmac will see it that way,' Sergon snorted. "'Well, as you are currently in council custody, "'it doesn't really matter how he sees things, does it?' He sketched a mocking half-bow, and straightened with an evil smile on his face. Now, I'm a very busy man, and I have much to do. I'm sure that your case will be disposed of in good order. Until later, dear cousin. Garin tried to think of a stinging reply, but failed. He watched Sergon strut off, and then he allowed his knees to fail him and slumped to the dismal little pallet. After a time, he drifted off into darkness again, even though he knew he shouldn't let himself fall asleep after a sharp blow to the skull. He felt as though he were plummeting down and down every time he closed his eyes, and yet he was so weary that he could not keep them open any longer. When he finally woke again, his eyes felt as if they were full of grit, and his tooth was a bright rock of white agony in the side of his mouth. But his head didn't hurt quite so much, and he was actually hungry instead of nauseated. His jailers had provided him with a bowl of porridge, a jug of water, and a half-loaf of tough black bread. Garin ate gingerly, careful to do his chewing on the left side of his mouth. After that he pushed himself to his feet and paced around his cell as best he could with the fetters on his wrists and ankles. It was actually a good-sized chamber, about nine feet wide and fourteen long, made of carefully fitted stone, most likely rubble from the ring of ruins surrounding Hullberg. Most newer buildings in the town were built on stones taken from the wreckage of the older city. He wished he had a window, even one at the bottom of a window well, so that he could at least know whether it was dark or light outside. Unfortunately, the council watch hadn't seen the need to provide their cells with that sort of amenity. "'I suppose I've seen worse,' he muttered. 
Once, early in his travels with a company of the Dragon Shield, Garin had been imprisoned in the dungeons of the Lord of Impilter for a few days. That experience was one he didn't like to recall. This cell was hardly comfortable, but at least it was clean, and the food they'd set out for him was not crawling with vermin. He spent some time examining the possibilities for escape. If he could somehow get free of the mage shackles, his magic would be extremely useful in that regard. He still had the word of minor teleportation fixed in his mind, so it would be simple enough to exit the cell. However, he had to be able to see the place he attempted to reach with the spell. All he could see from inside his cell was the corridor immediately beyond the bars, and he was certain he could hear at least one or two more heavy doors between him and freedom. Of course, there was the problem of the guards, too. They were armed, and he wasn't. He might be able to surprise one and get his sword away from him, especially if they didn't realize that he was out of his cell. Or perhaps that was exactly what Sergan was hoping he would try, so that he could be conveniently killed while trying to escape. Damnation, Garin growled to himself. He sat down in the middle of his chains. That was just the sort of suspicious notion that would have crossed Hamel's mind in this situation. Of course, the halfling could have gotten out of the manacles any time he liked, squeezed through the cell bars, and likely walked out right under the guards' noses without them ever realizing he'd gone. Be patient, the sword mage told himself. Harmac Gregor must be trying to secure my release. Attempting to escape might make that more difficult for the Harmac. Garin used the water in his jug to wash the dried and crusted blood from his wounded forehead, wincing as he did so. There was a knot that felt like a goose's egg about three inches above his right eye, and it did not feel much better when he finished. Eventually he grew tired again and fell asleep. When he woke again, more black bread and porridge had been set out for him, along with a fresh jug of water. He ate and drank again, and decided to see what it would take to get out of the mage shackles. The easiest approach would have been to try to abrade or snap the chain securing the rune-carved bands to the ring in the cell floor, but that would still leave the shackles around his wrists and stop him from using his magic. No, he would have to get his hands out of the manacles. Garin didn't see how he could do that without breaking every bone in his hand first, and even then he might not be able to do it. That left cutting through the bands or pulling the rivets apart. Mostly to occupy himself, he spent several hours trying to pry open the manacles, to little effect other than making his fingers sore with the effort. He slept and ate again and resolved to try to abrade one of the chain links by the floor ring into a tool he could use to work on the mage shackles. But before he got very far, he heard the outer door creak open and the sounds of approaching footsteps. Brighter lantern light flickered in the corridor. Awkwardly, he climbed to his feet. Whatever was coming, he'd meet it standing and face forward. All right, here he is. One of the Council Watch soldiers came into view, holding a lantern. To Garin's surprise, Kara and Miria followed, with several more Watch soldiers behind them. "'Don't pass anything to the prisoner, or we'll have to search both of you.' Kara frowned in annoyance, but let the warning pass without protest. "'Hello, Garin,' she said. "'Are you well? How are they treating you?' "'Well enough,' Garin answered. The fellows who captured me were none too gentle, but the councilmen have left me alone. They're feeding me a couple of times a day. I've had worse. Is Hamel all right? Yes, he's waiting outside. Kara kept her voice neutral, but her brilliant eyes blazed with anger. He wasn't allowed in here, since the council watch fears that he would try to break you out. I'm surprised they allowed you to visit me. They'd no liking for the notion, Miria said. She wore a plain blue dress with a white shawl and had her hair gathered in a single long braid down her back. Garin noticed that the bruise on her face had almost completely faded. Two days now I've been trying to get in to see you. That might not have been very wise, Miria, Garin said quietly. 
Miria crossed her arms in front of her body like a battlement, her face set in a stern scowl. Oh, I'm not in any danger right now, Garen Hullmaster. Half of Hullberg's taken up for me, thanks to your way of teaching foreign brigands to think better of wrecking Erstenwolds. It seems the Varunas have no wish to stir up more trouble on my account, at least for now. She looked over at the nearest watch soldier and angrily asked, Why is he chained up? There's no call for treating him like that. Lord Sergan's orders, mistress, the watch guard said. He's known to study elf magic, so the keeper of duties instructed us to keep him in mage shackles. We can't risk him using magic to escape. Lord Sergans got a generous definition of his own authority, Kara muttered. She fixed her bright gaze on the guards. Give us some privacy. On my honor as a hullmaster, we'll do nothing but speak with him. The council watch soldiers shifted uncomfortably and looked at each other. We'll allow you some leeway, Lady Kara, the first one said. But keep away from the bars, or you'll have to leave. The guards moved out of Garin's sight down the hallway, but he could tell from Miria's glance that they were not very far off. "'This may sound awful, but what day is it?' Garin asked. "'It's the fourth of Tarsak,' Miria answered. "'Early in the morning, in case you couldn't tell.' Garin glanced down the hallway and couldn't see the guards. He lowered his voice a little. Did Dernan Austin get the Spearmeat companies to take to the streets? No, but apparently Hamill did. He went down to the troll and tankard and spoke on your behalf. Kara put on a studied frown of disapproval. Now I've got six or seven vigilante bands roaming all over town, shadowing every foreign armsman they see and picking fights. There was an ugly brawl late last night in the tailings. Two score Spearmeat under one of Osting's sons, rousted out a gang of crimson chains and beat them senseless. Several people were badly hurt. It's only a matter of time before this turns to killing Garin. You've got no idea what you've started. Perhaps, Garin admitted. But I certainly won't shed a tear if the chainsmen discover that Hullberg isn't to their liking any more. Are the spear meat really doing that much more than you would? "'if you had a couple of hundred more shields sworn?' "'Kara grimaced. "'Well, if I had that many shields sworn, "'of course I'd be able to keep the Harmax laws in the city "'without any call for the council watch. "'But the spearmeat musters aren't shield sworn.' "'They're not the spearmeat, Kara,' Mira said. "'Only the Harmac himself can call out the spearmeat, you know. "'It's the moon shields you're speaking of.' And they're just Hullbergans who choose to associate with other like-minded folk and make sure to step in if they see someone in need. She allowed herself a sly smile. If most moon shields happen to be Hullbergans who also belong to the spear meat, well, that's just a coincidence. Moon shields? Garin asked. Well, I think the official name is something like the League of Good and Loyal Defenders of Hullberg and Protectors of the Moon Sea Coast, but Hamill suggested that we ought to find something to serve as a nickname. Miria reached into a pocket, hidden in her skirt, and drew out a small emblem, a plain silver shield shape with a blue crescent moon painted on it. Some of the storekeepers are painting this device on their doors and signboards to let everyone know where their loyalties lie. You too, Miria? said Kara. After word of Garin's arrest got around town, Dernan Osting begged me to come to the troll and tankard and speak, Miria answered. These are my friends, my kin, and my neighbors, Kara. What else can we do? The council watch works for the foreigners. Who's to keep the law in Hullberg if we don't stand up now? Speaking of my arrest, Kara, said Garin, Sergen claims that he'll arrange a special council session to try me for murder under Mullmaster's laws. I never studied much of the Harmac's laws, but I seem to remember that the Harmac himself has to hear high crimes like murder. How is it that the merchant council can hold me? Kara fell silent for a long moment, and her mouth tightened. "'That's currently under dispute,' she said. "'Under dispute? 
What's there to dispute? If I'm accused of murder, and I shouldn't be, since Erdinger struck at me first, and it was a fair fight after that, then it's a matter for the Harmac. I'm not so arrogant as to think that hullmasters are above the law, but I don't understand why the Harmac's allowing the Merchant Council to usurp his authority. The Varunas have found several so-called witnesses, who say you rendered Erdinger helpless with an evil charm, then cut his throat, Miria said. I'm sorry to say it, Garin, but there's more than a few folk, most of whom ought to know better, who find themselves wondering whether you killed Erdinger in self-defense or murdered him. That's a damned lie, Garin growled. Does anyone believe them? Kara lowered her voice again. I doubt it, Garin, but the Merchant Council refuses to surrender you. They claim it's a charge of murder and that they're entitled to try you under Mullmaster's laws. Garin was speechless for a moment. You mean to say that the Council has decided to set aside the Harmac's law and use their own instead? His cousin simply met his eyes. As I said, we dispute that. Who rules in Hullberg, Kara? The Harmac or the Merchant Council? It can't be both. I know it, Garin. For what it's worth, the Council doesn't seem ready to proceed with their trial yet. Perhaps Sergen realizes that he'd give the Harmac no choice if he keeps on his course. We're doing what we can. Kara sighed. I'm afraid I must go. I haven't heard from several of my scouts in Thar yet, and I fear that the bloody skulls have something to do with it. Garin took a deep breath and shifted in his chains. The idea of arranging his own freedom was growing in its appeal. He didn't know much about Mullmaster's laws, but he doubted they would favor his account of events. I'm sorry, Kara. I shouldn't have spoken in anger. Kara gave him a small smile. I understand, Garin. Then she left, her mail coat jingling with her steps. Miria lingered a moment longer. It's on my account that you're in that cage, Garin, and that's wrong she said. If I'd found some other way to deal with the Varunas, it might not have mattered, Miria, because I likely would have killed Erdinger on Jared's account instead. He looked down at his chains and bared his teeth in a grim smile. I know it won't bring back your brother, but I can't say that I'm sorry that Anfell Erdinger is dead. She looked away from him, and her shoulders fell a little. Justice for Jared wouldn't be worth your life, if it turns out that you've come back to Hullberg after all these years only to... Well, I couldn't live with myself, not after what I did to you. Her face softened for a moment, and Garin glimpsed the girl he'd known more than ten years ago, shy, tender, and kind, haunted by a strange and distant sadness he'd never quite understood. Mirya. I don't know what you think you did to me, he finally said. He never would have guessed that she'd have the strength to keep Erstenwolds in business, to hold her own against competitors like House Faruna, and to raise her daughter at the same time. Her life hadn't been easy in the years that he'd been away, and she'd found true iron in herself to meet its challenges. I'm the one who left. It was my decision. I never meant to hurt you. It's not what you think, she said. She stepped closer and set her hand on the bars of the cell. I... Mistress Erstenwold, step away from the cell, the council armsman said sharply. The man hurried forward with a frown. And you need to be leaving anyway. I've given you a good long time to talk, and the last thing I need's trouble for it. Garin looked through the bars at Miria. Don't worry about me, he told her. Watch out for yourself, Mira. Keep Selsha safe and stay close to home. I've got a feeling that Kara might be right about the troubles heading our way. She held up her hand in parting and hurried away. The watch guards saw her out, and the heavy iron door leading to the dungeon clanged shut behind them. Garin let out a deep breath and sank to the floor amid his chains. Twenty-one. Seven Tarsak. 
the year of the ageless one. The mood of Hallberg was growing ugly, Sergen decided. As his coach rolled and bounced through the streets, he passed by corners and through squares where small knots of disheveled peasants and laborers stood around in their blue hoods, shivering in the cold early spring mists and rains that had settled over the town. Angry glares followed his coach, and sometimes a fist was shaken in his direction. Of course, most of the rabble had no idea who was in the fine carriage, since his driver and footman wore no house colors other than that of the council watch, and he kept his curtain drawn. But the mere fact that he was riding in a fine coach marked him as a man of wealth and power, and in Hallberg that signaled an affiliation with foreign merchants. That was sufficient to draw the ire and resentment of Hallberg's commoners these days. His driver flicked the reins, and the coach jerked ahead as the team picked up its pace to climb the causeway leading up to Griffin Watch. Several other coaches and carriages crowded the lower courtyard of the castle. The Harmac still had power enough to command immediate attendance when he called his council to attend him. Sergen scowled in annoyance. This summons had come only an hour after sunrise, such as it was on this gloomy day, and he had still been in his bed. A few more days, and I'll see to all such annoyances, he told himself. The carriage came to a stop, and he rose and let himself out even before his footman could open the door for him. An appearance of haste and concern would be seemly this morning. "'Good morning, Lord Sergen. one of the castle valets hurried down the steps to take Sergen's fine fur cape and matching cap. "'The Harmax Council is assembling now. They are waiting for you.' "'Very well,' Sergen answered. He swept through the doors of the great hall, ignoring the shield sworn there while his own armsmen hurried to catch up with him. The dusty old barn of a banquet hall was about as full as the last time he'd been summoned to a council by his uncle. Perhaps thirty or so guards, attendants, and advisers hovered around the eight members of the Harmac Circle. Sergen noted that his step-uncle was already seated on his high seat. He quickened his step to reinforce the impression of haste, and set his face in a tight frown of determination and concern. "'Forgive my tardiness,' he said as he took his seat. "'I hope I haven't kept you waiting for long.' "'Not at all, Sergen,' the Harmag said. "'You arrived on the heels of Lord Marstell and Master Goldhead. "'But now that we're all here, we should begin immediately. "'Kara, the floor is yours.' Kara stood up from her seat at the foot of the table and moved around to stand in the middle of the horseshoe-shaped space. She was fully armored, wearing her long mail coat with greaves and vambraces that were adorned with golden griffins. Her spell-scar was hidden under all that metal, of course, but the eerie azure of her eyes gave away her deformity. A shame, Sergen mused. She was otherwise a very handsome woman with a fine figure, and as she was not related to him by blood, she might have made an advantageous match for him to secure his claim. On the other hand, Kara fancied herself a warrior and a captain, and it might have been difficult or impossible to break her to his will. Of course, he wouldn't have needed to remain married to her for long to establish the façade of legitimacy, and that was all that was required. "'My friends,' Kara said gravely, "'war is upon us. "'My scouts have discovered the Bloody Skull Horde. "'They're marching southward even as we speak. "'As of last night, they were less than twenty miles "'from the northernmost of our watchtowers, "'which places them about thirty miles from Griffin Watch. "'The Bloody Skulls will reach our outposts tomorrow evening, "'descend into the northern end of Winterspear Vale, "'and arrive here near sunrise,' the day following. We may see bands of marauders and pillagers in the winter spear as early as tonight. We're not certain of the Bloody Skull's numbers, but we've seen at least two more tribes marching with them, the Red Claw Goblins and the Skull Smasher Ogres. There may be more we haven't encountered yet, 
My scouts believe the horde numbers at least two thousand warriors, and it may be twice that. How could so many orcs approach so closely without being seen? Master Assayer Goldhead demanded. The weathers favored the bloody skulls for several days, Master Goldhead. The rain has hidden them well and I fear that several shield-sworn scouts likely found the bloody skulls, but were caught before they could return and report. At least four are missing. Can you stop them, Lady Kara? the wizard Ebane Ravenscar asked. No, my lord, Kara said, not without help. The shield-sworn number two hundred. We can harry their advance with cavalry, but if we try to hold in the face of that horde, we'll be swept away. She looked at Sergen and then around the other faces at the table. However, the mercantile concessions hold hundreds more trained and well-armed mercenaries. With their aid, I think I might be able to prevent the buddy skulls from entering the Winter Spear Vale. What of this so-called moonshield militia we've all seen on the streets lately? Darcy Varuna asked. It seems to me that there are hundreds of brave men ready to fight standing around on the town's street corners. Sergen fought to keep a smile from his face. That was certainly one way to thin the ranks of the overly zealous Hulbergans. He hadn't imagined any such possibility might arise when he'd intervened, so to speak, in the negotiations with the Bloody Skull messengers. It was simply an unlooked-for reward of a daring plan, executed carefully and well. "'I'll ask them to give me what help they can, Lady Darcy,' Kara answered. "'But the spear meat is a militia. They're not anywhere near as well-trained, experienced, or well-equipped as the guards your house or the other houses retain. I hope to use the spear meat to deal with marauding bands that might slip around our main defenses and to form a last reserve if things go poorly at the tower line. Marath Marstel climbed to his feet. All of Hullberg is threatened by this vast horde, and so all of Hullberg must give answer, he thundered. My house employs eighty armsmen, Lady Kara. They're at your disposal for the duration of this crisis. And furthermore, I shall be glad to serve as a commander of the cavalry. I may not be as agile or strong as I once was, but I can still lead men into battle. Sergen wondered when exactly the old windbag had ever seen a battlefield, but he kept his thoughts to himself. Instead, he decided to rescue Kara from trying to figure out how to accept Marstall's troops, but decline his leadership by standing up himself. The Merchant Council recently reached an arrangement with the Icehammer Mercenary Company, he said smoothly. We intended to employ the Icehammers to combat piracy and brigandage along the coasts and roads near Hullberg. But clearly the bloody skulls present an imminent threat. I believe that the Icehammers number close to 250 highly experienced dwarf and human veterans. A chorus of whispers broke out among the spectators behind him. But Sergen paid them no mind. Kara stared at him suspiciously but said nothing. And Sergen could feel the harmac shift in his seat a few feet behind his right shoulder. Across the table, Lord Marstall bowed toward him. Bravo! he declared. Moreover, Sergen continued, I'll relay my dear sister's request for additional troops to the Double Moon Coster, House Sokol, and the Janarsk Coster. I cannot speak for them, of course, but I am confident that they can contribute two hundred more armsmen among them. He glanced at Darcy Varuna smiled slightly, and sat down again. Lady Varuna made a small face, and motioned with her hand. "'A hundred and twenty more from House Varuna,' she said calmly. "'I am afraid I must reserve some of our strength to protect our camps in the Galena foothills.' Kara nodded graciously to the mistress of House Varuna. "'My thanks, Lady Darcy,' she said. The Harmac spoke next. Kara, by my count, that puts you at close to nine hundred warriors, not counting the militia. Do you think you can meet the bloody skulls with those numbers? 
The castellan fell silent and considered her answer. I think so she finally said. If Hullberg had a city wall, I would be inclined to simply defend the city. But since we don't, I want to meet the bloody skulls as far from town as possible and still gain some advantage of terrain. The watchtowers at the north end of the Vale offer our best position. There aren't many good paths to bring an army down from the high fells to the Vale floor. But that means we must move at once to get as many warriors as possible to the towers by tonight or tomorrow morning. She paused, examining her own thoughts again, and added, The show of a strong defense may be enough to deter the bloody skulls or the tribes allied to them. Neither the Red Claws nor the Skull Smashers will be eager to die for Warlord Murren. I guess he promised them plunder, so it's possible that he'll give up and look for some easier target once he sees that we're ready for him. As far as I know, we've delivered no mortal insult or wronged him in some manner that he would feel compelled to avenge. That might prove important, Sergen realized. He glanced at Darcy Varuna and found her looking at him. He delivered exactly such an insult in the process of making sure that the bloody skulls supplied Hallberg with the threat he needed. Well, if matters took an unexpected turn, and he found that he needed to throw up a breakwater against the horde he'd baited to attack the Harmac, he still had one more piece he could move on the board. Isperus. Sergen thought he knew the price of the king in copper, and he doubted that the lich's minions would care much about being outnumbered by the bloody skulls and their allies. That raised the interesting question of whether he'd rather see the battle won or lost. A complete debacle would not be good. He was reasonably sure of Isperus's aid, but he'd rather approach the Lich with a request for a moderate amount of aid rather than beg the Lich to spare Hullberg from disaster. No, the best outcome would be a hard-fought victory in which the bloody skulls were turned back without the aid of the king in copper especially if the armsmen of the other merchant companies suffered heavily in the fighting. "'It seems that time is of the essence,' the Harmac said. He stood up slowly, and the other lords and officers got to their feet as well. Sergen rose smoothly and waited for his uncle to finish. "'Kara, prepare the shield sworn for departure as quickly as you can. Those of you who have promised your armsmen— you must have your troops ready to march within hours. Only by concerted effort will we be able to avert this new and deadly threat. Now go, and may the gods look kindly upon our defense. The assemblage broke up and dispersed, with a dozen conversations beginning at once as the various lords and officials began to make their way out of the hall. Sergen shifted the position of the rapier at his hip and turned to go as well. "'One moment, Sergen. the Harmac limped closer, leaning on his heavy walking-stick. "'I wish to have a word with you.' There was little that Sergen cared to discuss with his uncle at the moment, but he was standing in Griffin Watch, and there were still dozens of onlookers in the hall. He nodded and gave his step-uncle a conciliatory smile. "'I have much to do, if I am to persuade the other merchant companies to dispatch their soldiers with Kara,' he said. But if it's important to speak now, then I am at your disposal, Uncle Grigor. I will not detain you for long, Sergen. Before you leave, we must settle this question of Garin's imprisonment by the Merchant Council. I fear that's not a question we can quickly settle. It's a complicated issue. I fail to see why it is so complicated, Sergen. I've examined the law carefully— and I see no basis under which the Merchant Council can hold or try someone whose offence occurs outside the strict physical boundaries of the concessions. Is there some dispute over where exactly Garin and Captain Erdinger fought? If there isn't, then it's a matter for the Harmac's justice, not the Council. Sergen grimaced and lowered his voice, moving closer to his uncle. He'd been expecting this for a day or two, and knew how he wanted to respond. 
I have much the same understanding, uncle. But the Varunas are frankly beyond all reason at this point. They're threatening dire repercussions if their calls for justice are ignored. Harmak Grigor frowned. Dire repercussions? What do you mean? I'm not sure, but I believe Lady Darcy may go so far as to completely vacate Varuna's interests in Hullberg, and then use her influence in Mullmaster to have the high blade embargo all trade bound to Hullberg. I hardly need to describe what a disaster that would be. Mullmaster accounts for almost half our trade. We would be ruined within a month. Sergan spread his hands helplessly. As long as a threat such as that is hanging over our heads, I didn't dare to defy her. The old lord grimaced and shot a dark look at Darcy Varuna, who was leaving the hall with her attendants and guards around her. She glided out the door with her valets, hurrying to drape a stole around her neck, oblivious to the conversation at the foot of the harmac seat. "'Darcy Varuna doesn't have the right to tell us who to try and under what laws,' Grigor said firmly. "'This is a matter for Hulberg's justice, not her personal vendetta against Garin.' "'Well, that's the problem.' She believes that Garin will escape justice for his crimes because he is your nephew. Frankly, she doubts whether Garin would ever be brought to trial. I have never allowed any member of the family to ignore our laws. Until she sees Garin convicted and punished in some suitable manner, I am afraid she won't believe that, uncle. Grigor looked sharply at Sergan. I won't allow Garin to commit crimes and go unpunished, Sergan, but neither will I convict and punish him if he's innocent of wrongdoing, regardless of what Darcy Varuna may think. If Garin is fairly acquitted, he will go free. If not, he'll pay the same price any criminal would. And to make sure that there is no appearance of favoritism, I'll delegate the Harmax decision to High Magistrate Nimstar. "'But this is not a matter for the Merchant Council, Sergan. "'House Varuna won't be pleased by that.' "'Sergan tapped his finger on his chin, "'affecting a moment of serious thought. "'What about this? "'Imprison Garin here in Griffin Watch "'and charge him under the Harmax law, "'as is right and proper, "'but appoint the Council Watch to guard him. "'As long as Darcy Varuna is reassured "'that Garin is indeed confined,' and the charges will be read against him, she may relent on her insistence that the council must hold him. I believe I can persuade her to accept that. The Harmac stood in silence for a long moment, and then he nodded. Very well. I'll send someone to make arrangements with the council. But, Sergen, regardless of whether Darcy Varuna agrees or not, Garin will be removed from Council Hall. That might be... Grigor slashed his hand across his chest. If Varuna wants to invite me to confiscate their property and relet their leases to other merchant costers, then I'll gladly do so. The Harmac turned and stomped away as best he could, striking his stick forcefully to the floor with each stride. Sergan watched him retreat, mildly impressed. He wouldn't have suspected that the old man had a glint of fire in him. Why, the Harmac was positively reckless. It was not like Grigor to let anger get the better of him. He gathered his guards to him with an absent motion of his hand and left the Harmac's hall to climb back into his coach. In a few moments the coach rolled back down the castle's causeway and started through the streets as Sergan carefully thought through what needed to happen in the next few days. He decided he was committed to his decisions and spent the rest of the ride to Council Hall presenting himself with hypothetical misfortunes and determining his response to each. The coach rocked to a stop, and his footman opened the door. Sergan climbed out and said, "'Remain ready. I'll be leaving again in a quarter hour, and tell the watch captain to ask Captain Icehammer to join me in my chambers immediately.' "'Of course, Lord Keeper.' 
the man answered, but Sergan had already passed him by, bounding up the steps to Council Hall. He swept into the room that served as his office and found that his clerks had left him several letters and contracts to approve. None were particularly urgent, but he examined them simply to occupy himself while he waited for the mercenary captain. He didn't have to wait long. Before he'd finished looking over the third letter, Kendurkel Iron Thane knocked on the door and entered. The dwarf tromped in, took a seat in a chair by the hearth, and commenced to tap out the ashes from his pipe. "'You sent for me, Lord Sergan?' he asked. "'I did,' Sergan answered. "'I assume that you've heard rumors about the Orc Horde marching on Hullberg?' The dwarf laughed harshly. "'It's no far from the minds of many folk this morning. No one talks about anything else. I've told the Harmac that I've retained the services of the Ice Hammers. I want you to march with the shield sworn and help to defend Hallberg from the bloody skulls. I believe that contingency is already covered under our existing arrangements.' "'I expected so much,' Kendurkel said. However, I'll be reminding you that a share of the plunder from the field of battle belongs to me company. Of course. You should prepare to march immediately, Captain. The shield sworn hope to defend the watchtowers at the north end of the Vale, and my dear sister Kara intends to move her forces there by tomorrow morning. Am I answering to her orders? Sergan thought about that for a moment. Unless Kara's orders are clearly inept or otherwise unacceptable, yes, he said. Do your best to do as she asks, and give her the benefit of your experience and counsel. I'm sending you to make sure that the bloody skulls are stopped before they reach Hullberg, and I want you to do what you think is needful to accomplish that goal. The dwarf nodded. All right. If there's nothing else you're needing, then— I've got a lot to do in the next few hours. There's one more thing, Sergan said. I'll need about thirty of your men, most of them humans, for a special assignment here in Hullberg, a very sensitive assignment. I'll need them to be waiting at the Dareth storehouse on East Street by noon on the 10th. It would be best if they arrived in small groups, scattered over the morning, and didn't wear any identifying colors or insignia. The dwarf chewed on his pipe stem and eyed Sergan thoughtfully. Will me lads be living through your special assignment? Yes, in fact, it's important that they do. But I'm afraid they will have to leave town immediately afterward. I plan to have a ship ready to leave at first light for that purpose. All right. I'll give them orders to make their way back to Thencha or Milvaunt after you're done with them. Ken Durkle leaned forward and took his pipe from his mouth, pointing the stem at Sergan. No, just so we see eye to eye, my lord. Exceptional missions and arrangements of that sort demand an exceptional bonus. I need to know what you've got in mind for me, lads. Sergan bowed his head in acquiescence and spread his hands. "'Well, Master Kendurko, it seems that House Varuna is going to do something terrible three nights from now. Your men are going to make sure that everyone knows who was responsible. After all,' he added to himself, "'he wouldn't want to become Harmac while he was so deeply indebted to Darcy Varuna.'" Twenty two nine Tarsac, the year of the Ageless One. The council watch soldiers removed Garin from his cell during the dark hour before sunrise. At first he feared that he was to be driven out to some lonely spot in the high fells and killed, but to his surprise the councilmen took him to Griffin Watch. They drove the prison wagon up the causeway and through the gatehouse, stopping by the shield sworn barracks. A moment later the heavy chains securing the wagon's door rattled, and the two guards riding in the back with Garin rose and helped him to the door. When he clambered out of the wagon's dim interior, Garin found Hamel and Sergeant Colton of the Shieldsworn waiting for him with five more council guards. 
"'There you are, Garin,' Hamel said. "'Are you hurt at all?' "'Nothing important, though I've got a broken tooth I hope to have mended. "'What's going on here? Am I to be released?' "'Not yet,' the halfling answered. "'The Harmac struck a deal with the Merchant Council. "'I think that he's agreed that you'll face charges under Hulberg's law. "'In exchange, the Council's agreed to allow you to be held here in Griffin Watch "'until a trial can be arranged. "'But they'll have a detachment of their own watch to stand guard "'just to make sure that the Harmac doesn't release you.' "'Garin grimaced. "'It was undoubtedly better to be held in Griffin Watch, "'simply because he wouldn't have to fear being murdered in his cell "'or otherwise made to disappear. "'And he likely had little to fear from a trial under Hulberg's laws. "'But the Harmac must have staked his own honor on Garin's good behavior, "'so he'd have to endure his incarceration a little longer. "'When will my case be decided?' "'Sergeant Colton frowned. "'That's hard to say, Lord Garin. "'The bloody skulls have got everything in an uproar. "'The bloody skulls? Did their messengers return?' "'Colton shook his head. "'No, they all did. I suppose you ain't heard.' "'The sergeant shot the council watch soldiers a hard look. "'But there's a bloody great orc horde on its way. "'Lady Kara's taken almost all the shields sworn up to the northerly watchtowers.' "'and three-quarters of the merchant company armsmen, too. "'She left me in command of the garrison. "'Can you believe that? "'Anyway, Lady Kara expects to meet the bloody skulls within a day, maybe two. "'Garin felt the weight of the chains on his wrists. "'As far as he knew, he had no great talent for leading armies, "'but he'd fought as a captain leading a company of the Coronel's Guard in Myth Dranor, and he wasn't afraid to cross blades with any orc. If Colton was right, then Hulberg faced the most immediate peril it had seen during his entire life, and he'd watch it pass by through the bars of a cell. "'Tell the Harmac that I can help,' he said to Colton. "'If he paroles me to fight, I'll gladly go back to my cell for as long as I have to once the danger's passed. The prisoner won't be set free.' "'Without the express order of the council,' one of the watch-soldiers said firmly. "'The Harmax got to take it up with Lord Sergan.' "'I know it,' Colton snapped. He looked back to Garin and motioned toward the doorway leading into the castle. "'Well, I suppose I'd better show you to your accommodations, Lord Garin.' "'They've given you the best cell in the castle, for what it's worth,' added Hamel. The shield-sworn sergeant led Garin and his council watch jailers through the barracks building and into a passageway cut through the rock of the castle's hilltop. They climbed up a flight of stairs and passed by several storerooms and connecting passageways that led to the castle's deep cisterns, then climbed a few more steps to a row of iron-bound doors of thick wood. Colton opened the nearest with a set of heavy keys— it was not a very big room, but it had a small square window that looked out over the city to the distant grey line of the moon sea, a bed, a table, and two chairs, a small carpet laid out on the flagstone floor, and even a shelf lined with a dozen books. "'We took the liberty of furnishing your cell a little more comfortably than we normally would,' Colton said. "'But I'm afraid it's still a cell.' "'I'll send a healer to look after your injuries as soon as possible.' "'Thank you, Colton,' Garin said quietly. "'Lord Sergan won't like this,' the council sergeant said. "'He said nothing about providing the prisoner with such comforts.' "'In that case, he didn't say we couldn't,' Hamel pointed out. "'I heard about that fine room you gave him underneath your council hall. "'Maybe the shield-sworn should give you beds just as comfortable as the one you gave Garin. "'After all—' "'Nothing requires the Harmac to give your men any particular comforts either.' "'The council sergeant chose not to argue the point any further. "'A wise decision in Garin's view. "'Colton suppressed a smile and motioned to his council counterpart. "'Post a couple of men by the door, if you like, "'and I'll show the rest of you to your guard room and quarters.' "'Very well,' the sergeant said. "'He detailed off two of his men.' who took up positions on each side of Garin's doorway. 
Colton looked back to Garin and said, "'I'm sorry, Lord Garin, but I'll have to leave the mage shackles on you.' The sword mage grimaced. His wrists were more than a little sore and bruised, and he wanted the damned manacles off his hands. As long as Harmac Grigor had given his word that he'd make no attempt to escape, Garin wouldn't use his magic. But at least the cell looked like a substantial improvement on the old one. "'It's not your fault, Colton,' he said. "'These fellows'll be standing watch, but there will always be a couple of shields sworn within earshot. Just shout if you need anything.' Colton touched his hand to his brow in salute, and backed out of the cell with a council watch leader following him. "'As much as I'd like to stay here and entertain you, I'm afraid I have some things to look after in town,' Hamel said. "'Things to look after? I've taken it upon myself to prepare your defense, so I've been talking to every witness to your duel that I can find.' Hamel pointed an accusing finger at Garin. "'The next time you find yourself embroiled in a fight like the one that preceded your duel, I advise you to kill your enemies rather than wound and cripple them. You left House Faruna with four more witnesses than you needed to, and they naturally have agreed upon a version of events that depicts you in a very poor light. Though I suspect the one with the badly broken jaw and no teeth remaining— doesn't really remember anything that's happened since last month, and is making up his story outright. Then go to it, Hamel. I've got every confidence in you. Garin took his hand, and then Hamel nodded and followed the guards out. The council soldiers swung the door shut and locked it with a heavy iron clanking. Garin looked at the door for a long moment. He'd been in one cell or another for days now, and he was well and truly looking forward to his liberty. But it sounded as if it might be a few more days. He shuffled over to look out the small window. It was not much more than a foot square, and to watch the town slowly wake up to another dreary spring morning. An hour later he discovered that his comforts were not limited to simple furnishings. The castle kitchens provided him with a hearty breakfast of eggs, ham, cheese, and bread with good apple cider to wash it down, which he was able to eat while seated at his table. After days of sitting on the floor of the council's cell eating bland porridge, it was a significant improvement. "'The only thing I lack is my freedom,' he observed when the servants and guards withdrew." He selected a book at random from the shelf, and passed much of the day with a long lay written three centuries before the fall of Askelhorn, and the escape of one of its lords and his family. He spent an hour pacing and exercising as best he could in the small space allotted to him, and even tried to practice his forms by imagining the weight of a sword in his hand, and ignoring the shackles on his wrists. Eventually he grew tired and stretched himself out on top of the bed to sleep for a time. Long, cold nights on the stone floor of the council dungeon had not given him much opportunity to sleep well at night. He arranged his irons as best he could and drifted off while lying on his back with his hands at his waist and the chain over his belt. He found himself caught between a dream and a memory something perhaps a little like the reverie of elven kind. He stood in the thin frost of a forest clearing in Mythdranor, watching as Elier turned her back on him and fled into the shadows under the dying leaves. She wore a dress of rich blue with delicate silver embroidery and a light hood of pearl gray over her shoulders. She held her skirts as she darted away, her long dark hair streaming behind her. Allier, come back,' he called. "'I love you.' She paused once, a single glance over her shoulder, but when her eyes met his, she turned away. He took a step after her, and the dream ended then, as it always did. Garin came to wakefulness and found himself staring up at the ceiling of his small cell. The light from the window had changed. It was the middle of the afternoon. He'd been asleep for a couple of hours. He started to sit up, found that his shackles hampered him still, and carefully gathered them up so that he could put one hand to the side of the bed and push himself upright. A year and a half now, 
And still that memory torments me, he reflected. He deserved worse. All of his life he'd wandered with his eye on the road ahead, never content to be where he was, seeking something that seemed to retreat away from him every time he drew near to it. In Mithdranor he'd found what he was longing for, at least for a short time, and yet he'd managed to ruin it so completely with one self-destructive act he still couldn't explain to himself. It was as if some hidden part of him recognized that he'd found contentment and deliberately sought a way to restore his wayward heart to its true nature. All of his life, his passion, his heart, had been waiting for a love such as the one he'd found in Allier. But he'd driven her away, and he still didn't know why. He sighed and looked at the small cell. "'Maybe I belong in here after all,' he murmured. To keep his mind from memories of Mithdranor and Allier, he chose another book and tried to read some more. Eventually the afternoon passed, and he found that the shades of the past didn't trouble him so much. At sunset Hamel came down and joined him for supper, which cheered him. His friend had little news to report other than the growing anxiety in town about the bloody skulls. "'Where are they now?' Garin asked him. "'Raiding parties have ventured into the Vale at several points, but they haven't done much damage yet.' Hamel said. Kara got her soldiers up to the post towers at the north end of the Vale, or so I'm told. What are they, anyway? Watch towers, really. Each has a small barracks that can accommodate about ten soldiers, and a small stone tower. There are about half a dozen scattered around the borders of Hullberg's lands. That doesn't seem a very useful fortification. They aren't. I expect that Kara's simply mustering her forces near one of the watch-posts that overlooks the head of the Winterspear Vale. There aren't many trails a large army can use to descend into the Vale safely, so I guess she's trying to defend the most likely routes. If the bloody skull horde is as large as it's been reported to be, then she's got a chance to bottle them up on a narrow track and take away their advantage in numbers. On the other hand— if she lets them get into the Vale, they'll be able to spread out again, and there really isn't anything to stop them before they reach the city. Hamel grimaced. Murder, vengeance, tomb-robbing, and treachery are one thing, Garin. But I didn't come to Hullberg for a war. You don't have to stay, Hamel, Garin told him. In all seriousness, someone ought to be looking after red sail business, and I might be stuck here for days, whether you help or not. "'Maybe you should leave. "'I'll give it another day or two. "'Hamel rose from his seat and set his napkin on the table. "'I'll be back tomorrow to look in on you again. "'I don't entirely trust these council thugs, "'even if they're in the middle of your family's castle. "'There are ten of them now, just to keep watching you, Garin.' "'Garin saw his friend out. "'Not very hard to do, given the size of the room, "'and returned to the bookshelf, looking for something new.' Late in the evening, a knock at his door interrupted him. Keys turned in the lock, and the council watch soldiers admitted Sergen. The lord stepped in with a look of distaste on his face, frowning as he took in the bed, the books, and the desk. "'Well, it seems that there's some justice in this world after all,' he said. "'A cell is a cell, regardless of its comforts.' you finally found your proper station in life, Garin, and I'm here to ensure that you remain in it for the rest of your days. There's much to recommend the room, if you like it, Sergen, Garin said. He rose to face his step-cousin, clenching his fists beneath the shackles. He could loop the chain around Sergen's neck and strangle him easily enough, but the council soldiers standing behind their master would likely interfere. There was no point in allowing Sergen's barbs to anger him. "'You can't paint the truth for long, Sergen,' he answered. "'It has a way of showing through the lies you slather over it. "'I'll go through the trial your dear Darcy Varuna is demanding for me. "'Her mercenaries will be shown to be liars, and I'll be freed soon enough.' Sergen smirked. "'Spare me your sanctimonious metaphors, Garin.' Of course the charges against you have no merit, but still, 
Here you sit incarcerated in this small room until you can defend yourself against them. And who knows how long it might take before the eyewitnesses you referred to can be spared from the vital duty of defending Hallberg from the orcs. Why, it might be days. Oh, wait. Indeed you will. Sergan spied the remains of Garin's dinner and smiled sourly. I suppose that your friends here in Griffin Watch are looking after you. I must see what I can do about that. He picked up the jug of wine and an unused goblet from the table and poured himself some. He swirled the wine once, inhaled its aroma, and took a taste. A Symbian, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I must protest this lavish treatment you're receiving. How can there be justice in Hullberg if a hullmaster charged with murder lives like a king, while a common man languishes in a dank dungeon? It's unseemly, Garin. Sergan set down the goblet, and something under his collar caught Garin's eye, an old amulet of copper, green with verdigris. Its top was shaped like a crowned skull, with two small emeralds for its eyes. It struck him as unusual because Sergan was otherwise attired in resplendent fashion, with an elegant silver-trimmed black tabard cut with violet pleats, high suede boots, and his great gold pendant. I've seen a medallion like that recently, Garin realized. But where and when? Garin frowned and thought for a moment, and it came to him. It was the amulet that Isperus gave to Erdinger in payment for the Infernadex. He hadn't gotten a very good look at it that night. The lich had been standing ten yards away, and the lighting had been poor, torchlight at best. But the size and shape were right and even with the mage shackles clasped around his wrists, he could sense the dark whisper of magic in the old copper. What did the king in copper say when he gave the thing to Erdinger? Sergan noticed Garin's sudden distraction and glanced down. "'What are you looking at?' he demanded. "'The distance to your heart,' Garin answered, thinking quickly. I was wondering whether I should draw your blade and stab you now, or wait until after my acquittal to finally rid House Hallmaster of your particular stench. Brave words from a man with his hands in shackles. Sergan snorted in amusement and lowered his voice. Do not trouble yourself too much with plans for your acquittal, Garin. You're exactly where I want you to be. And here you will stay. Goodbye, my dear cousin. Forgive me if I say that I shall not miss you much. You and I have business to settle when I'm freed. Garin glowered fiercely at his step cousin, concealing his relief at deflecting Sergan's attention. Sergan doesn't know that I saw Isperus give the amulet to Erdinger, he realized. But why does he have it? I see no point in continuing this conversation. Sergan bowed mockingly and withdrew. See to it that he has no more visitors, he told the council guards. Requests for a visit with the prisoner must be submitted in writing to the merchant council. Do you understand? I, Lord Sergan, the men outside replied. They shut the door behind Sergan and turned the key in the lock with an ugly and final sound. Garin growled in frustration and kicked at the wall. He remembered what Isperus had told Erdinger all right. The lich had said that whoever wore the amulet could call on his minions. If Sergan was wearing the amulet, then he must have been planning on using its powers. The question was, for what purpose? To slay someone, of course, Garin muttered to himself. Better yet, it would be a murder that could not be laid at Sergan's feet. Everyone would believe that the king in copper had sent his specters for reasons of his own, not suspecting that Isperus was simply fulfilling a bargain he'd made with House Varuna. And who would Sergan want dead? Obviously, Garin himself was likely high on the list. But somehow the sword mage doubted that Sergan would invoke Isperus's minions for that. Sergan had already neutralized him with his exaggerated charges. Could he be planning to destroy a rival merchant company? Possibly, but Garin couldn't see why Sergan would want to. 
They all supported him through the merchant council. That left the nascent moon shields. Or the Harmac. That must be it, Garin thought bleakly. If the Harmac and House Hullmaster were destroyed by some outside force, then Sergan would appear blameless. He could succeed where his father had failed, and make himself the lord of Hullberg. As long as all the other Hullmasters died, no one would stand between Sergan and the Harmax seat. Not even Sergan could be that ruthless, Garin muttered. But he didn't believe it. The more he thought on it, the clearer it became. With the orc horde threatening Hullberg, the castle defenses were stripped to a minimum. Kara was away from Griffin Watch, so Sergan would need some way to deal with his stepsister. But all the other Hullmasters were conveniently gathered in one place, including Garin. And Sergan had been the author of the compromise that transferred him to Griffin Watch, hadn't he? He needed to warn someone. But Sergan had just given orders that no one was to see him, and it might take hours or days before Hamill or Colton or someone else managed to force the council watch to permit a visit. Garin stared at the cell holding him, then at the shackles around his wrists. Somehow he had to escape. 23. Ten Tarsak the year of the ageless one. Hours of anxious pacing and a furious examination of every furnishing in his cell did not provide Garin with any obvious way to slip free of the mage shackles. He considered feigning sickness or injury to bring one or two of his jailers into the cell, but dismissed the idea quickly. He couldn't imagine that anyone ever really fell for that ruse, and even if they did— there were simply too many men outside. He might be able to overcome one or two guards with surprise and a cudgel made from the leg of a table, but what then? And the shield-sworn garrisoning the castle would be duty-bound to try to stop him as well. Some of them, Colton, for example, might turn a blind eye to any escape attempt or even aid his efforts, but others would try to discharge their duty no matter what they thought of their orders. For that matter, there might be a few among the shield sworn who would act against Garin for less worthy reasons. Jared Erstenwold had chosen to keep his mission in the High Fells secret from his own soldiers. That suggested to Garin that Jared might have suspected that at least a few of his men might be in the pay of the Merchant Council or one of the foreign companies. He studied his window for a time and tested its bars. Given a month, he might be able to wear away the mortar and brick, anchoring the bars in place, and widen the window enough to wriggle through. But that would leave him clinging to a sheer cliff face, and he doubted that he had a month. No, what I need to do is to get word to Hamill that I must be freed, Garin decided, or at least get word to Hamill to warn the Harmac of my suspicions. He can handle things from there. The question was how to smuggle out a message. He could try to tear a page from one of the books in the cell, weight it somehow, and drop it out the window, but it would be a matter of chance if the right passer-by picked it up and delivered it. And the night was wet, so his note would be in poor condition by the time anyone happened across it. He searched through his cell contents again and his eye fell upon a small, dusty case in his bookshelf, a set of dragon's teeth tiles. Garin didn't know any solitaire games to play with them, so he hadn't given them much attention before. Now he opened the case and examined the tiles more carefully, laying them out on his table. Coins, bars, swords, dragons, and griffins, they all were said to have a meaning. "'If only I knew Dwarvish,' he murmured to himself. "'Of course, little Dwarvish remained to be seen in the iconography of the game, "'only a handful of death egg runes to accompany the images. "'He studied the clay tiles for a moment, "'running his fingers over the glazed surfaces. "'People played the game all over Faerun, "'different variations in every country. "'An idea began to take shape in his mind.' Garin chose two of the tiles and set them aside. Then he put the rest away and carefully stretched himself out on the bed to rest until morning. 
If it didn't work, he could always use the tiles to weight letters he tossed out the window. When his breakfast was delivered in the morning, Garin ate well. Then he set the two tiles he'd picked in plain sight atop the tray beside the dishes and used a quill and ink to write, For Kerr, on a slip of paper under the tiles. He knocked on the door. I'm done with my breakfast, he called. The council guards opened the door and one came in to pick up the tray. He frowned at the two tiles. What's this? he asked. For my young cousin Kerr. Garin said, affecting a calm nonchalance he certainly did not feel. He likes the ones with the dragons on them. The guard glanced at his sergeant, who stood by the door. The sergeant shrugged. All right, he said, but check the paper and make sure he didn't write anything more. The soldier inspected the note. No, sergeant, this is it. Fine, then. The council guard picked up the tray and backed out, keeping his eyes on Garin. A moment later, the keys turned again in the heavy lock. Garin sighed and composed himself to wait. The real question now was whether Kerr would do what he thought the boy might do with the two new tiles, and he might not find out for hours yet. To pass the time, he exercised again, and then chose another book from the shelf to while away an hour or two. The first sign of his planned success came about an hour later, he heard raised voices in the corridor outside his door. Garin set down his book and hurried over to put his ear to the door, but he could not make out anything with certainty. He returned to his book, but half an hour later he felt a familiar voice in his mind. Garin, Hamel said silently, If you're there, look to your window. The sword mage moved over and glanced out, but he did not see much. Then a small sound from over his head caught his attention. He ducked down and looked up as steeply as he could. Hamel clung to a rope a little above his cell's window. "'I'm here, Hamel,' he answered. "'Are you well? The guards wouldn't let me in to see you.' "'I'm well enough, but Sergen ordered his men not to allow anyone in to see me,' Garin told him. "'Did you get the tiles?' I did, though I confess I almost ignored your cousin. He sought me out to show me his new dragon's teeth, and I didn't think anything of it. Fortunately, he was very persistent, and I finally paid attention just to humor him. Only then did he mention that you'd sent them to him. The halfling shifted a little, and turned to set his feet on the top of the embrasure over Garin's window. Keeping his voice to a whisper, he said, Playing two dragon tiles together is considered bad luck in the South, you know. I hoped you'd take it as a sign of distress. Listen, Hamel, I need to get out of this cell. Garin kept his voice low. He did not think his guards could hear him through the thick door, but if one of them happened to slide open the viewport and check on him, he wanted to look as if he were simply staring out the window instead of holding a conversation with someone clinging to a line just outside. "'I've been waiting for you to ask, but aren't you worried about embarrassing your uncle by making an escape?' "'I think Sergen's planning something awful. I've got to stop him. He means to have my uncle killed, maybe the whole family. He's got the amulet that the king in copper gave to Erdinger. No good can come of that.' Hamel fell silent for a moment. The lich said that whoever wore the amulet could call on his minions. Garin nodded. And Sergen told me last night that I wouldn't have to worry about regaining my liberty again. I take that to mean he'll have me killed in my cell, or he intends to make himself the master of my fate by seizing the throne. I have to believe that Sergen's got the medallion now because he's going to call on its powers. We've got to get it away from him, or at the very least warn my uncle and Kara about his intentions. Agreed. Let's figure out how to get you out of there. Hamel studied the window and then descended a few more feet to examine the stonework below it. Hmm. I don't think the window will work unless you can use your teleporting magic. Garin shook his head. I need to see exactly where I'm going, and I'll need a safe place to appear. Besides, I'm still in mage shackles. I can't use magic. 
"'It'll have to be the front door, then,' Hamel said. "'I need to arrange for some help, Garin. "'Leave the shield-sworn out of it if you can, Hamel. "'Many of them are sympathetic to my situation, but their duty is clear. "'They're sworn to resist any effort to break me out. "'You can't count on their help, but I don't want to see them killed.' "'Garin paused, thinking his way through what Hamel would have to do. "'For that matter, it'd be better if you could avoid a massacre of the Council Guards. "'I'd rather have them incapacitated than dead. "'The charges Sergan laid against me are groundless, "'but they wouldn't be if we killed men assigned to keep me under arrest. "'As long as you're thinking of ways to make my job harder, "'why not ask for a purple horse with a golden saddle to ride away on?' "'If I were certain that Sergan intended to move against the Harmac within the next day,' I tell you to do anything in your power to get me out and damn the consequences, Garin said in a low voice. But I've only got suspicions, Hamel. I'm hesitant to kill over them. Fine, Hamel sighed. I'll see if I can free you sometime this evening. I'll be waiting for that purple horse, Hamel snorted in response. Garin heard a whisper of leather against stone and a small grunt of effort, and then the halfling was gone again, scrambling back up to whatever vantage he had descended from. The sword-mage turned away from the window and surveyed his small room. A few more hours, he thought. He'd have to make sure he knew what to do once Hamel freed him. He sat down on the bed, his chin in his hand, and thought long and hard about the hours ahead. Then he composed himself to wait through the afternoon— he found that he had little appetite for his dinner, simply because he was growing anxious for Hamel, but he made himself eat well anyway. If things didn't go well, it might be a long time before he had the opportunity to eat again. After his dinner, Garin watched a spectacular sunset from his window, which faced toward the southwest. The gloom and drizzle of the last few days was breaking up. A great mass of tattered gray clouds drifted slowly eastward, painted rose and gold by the setting sun. The skies above the western horizon seemed dark and clear. Another stretch of cold weather and strong winds, Garin decided. Already whitecaps were beginning to kick up on the purple gloom of the moon sea, splashing against the soaring shadows of the arches that dominated the harbor. Nothing happened until three hours after sundown, and when it did, it happened quickly. Garin heard a brief commotion in the corridor outside his door. A sharp cry of alarm, quickly cut off, followed by a shrill ring of steel on steel. Then he heard a deep, rasping voice hissing syllables of arcane power, words of might that made the door tremble in its frame. Streams of reddish smoke seeped from under the door, carrying an acrid reek that made Garin's eyes water and his throat burn. Then the key turned, and the door swung open. Hamel stood there with a handkerchief tied over his nose and mouth, and behind him stood the proud tiefling sorcerer Garin had encountered out on the high fells. The tiefling wore a heavy, hooded black cape over his finely embroidered scarlet robe, but he still carried his rune-covered staff. "'The shackles! Quickly!' he hissed to Hamel. The halfling hurried up to Garin with a set of keys in his hand. "'Garin, you remember Sarth Kul Reizer? We've met before, of course, but circumstances didn't permit a proper introduction.' "'Far be it from me to question anyone helping me to escape, Hamel. "'But what's he doing here?' Garin asked. "'I decided that I needed the best help available "'in case we had to fight our way out of Griffin Watch. Hamel answered. "'And given what you'd told me about Sergan and Isperus's amulet, "'I thought Sarth might know something about what your cousins got planned. "'So I asked after Sarth all over town this afternoon, "'found him staying in a very fine inn called the Captain's House, "'and explained what was happening.' Hamel found the correct key and unlocked Garin's shackles. The sword-mage shook them off and rubbed his sore wrists, while Hamel knelt to free his ankle irons. Garin looked into Sarth's face and frowned. "'I appreciate your interest, Master Sarth,' he said. "'But why did you agree to help? What do you have to gain?' "'To gain nothing but a clear conscience,' the tiefling answered. 
He glanced to the corridor outside and then looked back to Garin. You see, I bear some responsibility for Jared Erstenwald's death and your current troubles. I wish to make amends. Hamel found the key for the leg irons and quickly removed them. You're free, Garin, he said. We should go. Just a moment, Garin answered. Explain what you mean, Sarth. I came to Hullberg five months ago in search of a book called the Infunadex. I knew that it had once belonged to Isperus, but had been taken from the Lich King in the fall of Thentur centuries ago. I hoped to recover it for myself and to study the arcane secrets it contains. When I first arrived in town, I decided to seek out a sponsor, so I called on Darcy Varuna and tried to interest her in providing me assistance with my explorations. The tiefling grimaced. As it turned out, she wished to employ me as a wand for hire. I'd no particular desire to help her enrich herself any further, and we parted company. But I fear that I told her enough about my intended project for her to order her own people to begin searching for the book as well. As I understand it, their tomb-breaking soon attracted the attention of the captain of the Shield Sworn, who tried to put a stop to it and was killed for his interference. The Varuna armsmen would not have been there if I hadn't sought out the aid of House Varuna at first. For that, I am truly sorry. Garin shook his head. The tiefling seemed sincere, but he had a hard time taking Sarth at his word. Still, Sarth had evidently consented to help Hamel free him, and they had fought together against Varuna's mercenaries by the barrow of Terlanus. I'll need to hear more about this soon. I guess now isn't the time, he finally said. But I'm sorry if I've misjudged you. The tiefling smiled ruefully and gestured at the small black horns jutting from his forehead. I am accustomed to it. Can we continue with your escape now, Garin? Hamel asked. A sound suggestion. Garin stepped out of the cell. The red smoke was already dissipating. Five council armsmen lay sprawled on the ground, coughing weakly. He spied a trunk by the opposite wall and opened it, retrieving the personal possessions he'd been carrying when Kondurkel and his men had ambushed him. With a sigh of relief, Garin buckled his scabbard around his waist and rested his hand on the pommel of his sword. "'What now?' he asked. "'Miria's waiting with a wagon in the courtyard,' Hamel answered. "'I arranged a large order for provisions to be sent to Erstenwolds. We're going to drive out the front gate as if nothing were out of the ordinary.' I'll need a disguise. I can attend to that detail, Sarth said. The tiefling reached into a pouch by his belt to draw out a pinch of fine silver powder, and then cast the dust over the sword mage while murmuring a spell. Garin felt a strange prickling sensation over his skin, and held still only through an iron determination not to flinch. Hamel and Sarth seemed to fade strangely in his sight, becoming pale and ghostly. When he looked down at his own body, he noticed that he seemed more ghostly still. "'You're invisible, Garin. Take care, since you can still be heard or felt. The spell lasts only a short time, so let us hurry.' "'I understand.' Garin said. He followed his rescuers down the corridor, and then out through a guardroom where four more council armsmen lay where they'd fallen, snoring softly in an enchanted slumber. They descended a flight of steps, and then turned aside into a small storeroom with a door that opened on the courtyard behind the gatehouse. A large, open wagon stood just outside, its bed filled with several casks and crates. More of the same stood in the storeroom. Garin guessed that Hamel and Sarth had played the part of Erstenwold clerks unloading the wagon, only to slip away when the opportunity presented itself. Miria stood in the shadows beside the wagon, wearing a dark hood over her dress. She stroked the neck of the draft horse to keep the animal still and quiet. When Sarth and Hamel appeared, she frowned in consternation. "'What happened?' she whispered. "'Where's Garin?' "'I'm here, Miria. Garin answered. He couldn't resist a quick touch on her shoulder. She jumped and glowered in his general direction. "'You shouldn't have let Hamel talk you into helping out, though. You'll be in a good deal of trouble when the shield-sworn figure out what happened.' Hamel laughed softly. "'Trust me, Garin. It wasn't my idea. 
All I wanted was the wagon and some empty barrels, but she insisted on coming along to help. It would be wiser to have this conversation somewhere else, Sarth said quietly. We have not succeeded yet. Garin glanced up at the banners flying over the gatehouse. They fluttered and flapped energetically in the strengthening breeze, glimmers of grey in the moonlight. He was only a few steps from slipping out of the castle, but he hesitated, quickly reviewing the decisions he'd made earlier in the day. "'You'd better go without me,' he said slowly. "'I must speak with the Harmac and explain the danger to him. I can't think of a reason why Sergan would wear that amulet, unless he intends to use it to summon the king in copper, and I think that he means to do it here.' "'Harmac, Grigor, may feel that he's got to jail you again "'to keep his word to the merchant council,' Miria pointed out. "'You'll not get a better chance to slip away.' "'I agree with Miria," said Hamel. "'If they catch you now, it'll be impossible to get you out later. "'Besides, it'll raise some difficult questions for Miria and me. "'I'll tell the Harmac that it was my own doing. "'All I have to do is come up with a story to explain how I got out of the shackles. "'You should be fine.' "'That's all well and good, but you can spare the harm act that decision by leaving with us now,' Miria said sharply. "'We can arrange to warn him once you're out of danger, and if, after that, you still hold to the idea that Sergan's up to some devilish plot, you'll be free to take the fight to him.' "'Whatever you decide, decide quickly,' Sarth warned. "'It will be far easier to spirit you out of the castle while you're invisible, Garin.' The sword-mage thought for a moment longer, then nodded. Not that any of the others could see him. "'I'll go,' he said. "'We'll make sure to warn the Harmac, but the best way to avert the danger is to get the Lich's amulet away from Sergan.' He clambered onto the wagon, which rocked softly under his weight, and crouched down between a couple of empty barrels. The others climbed up onto the driver's bench, and Miria clicked her tongue at the draft-horse. The animal gave a nervous wicker, then pranced back in its traces. "'Easy, boy, easy,' Miria called softly. But the horse's eyes rolled, and the animal stamped sharply as it shuddered and tried to back out of its harness. "'Easy now!' Garin rolled up on one elbow and looked at the animal, wondering what it was shying from. And then he felt it a cold, sickening sensation that chilled his heart and made him shiver despite himself. The lantern light, burning by the castle gate, seemed to dim and fail, and the shadows around the courtyard suddenly darkened and lengthened. He looked up and saw that the banners above the gatehouse hung limply from their masts. "'Something approaches,' Sarth rasped. "'Something evil.' Then, silently, Terrible shapes began to rise from the moon shadows, ancient warriors in tattered hauberks, their skeletal faces blank with hopelessness and dread. An evil green light burned in the empty sockets of their eyes. The draft horse whinnied in terror and tried to rear in its traces. Garin rolled aside and abandoned the wagon, as did the others. The animal bolted away in panic, filling the courtyard with the horrendous sound of its screams and the clattering racket of the wagon bouncing over the cobblestones. Shouts of human terror echoed from the hallways and rooms of the gatehouse nearby as more and more of the specters appeared and glided into the castle. "'The king in copper!' Miria gasped. "'He's here!' Garin caught her arm and retreated a few steps toward the storeroom behind him, sweeping out his sword even as he wondered if it would help against ghostly steel and spectral claws. Dozens of the terrible wraiths were already in sight, and more were appearing by the moment. "'I hesitated too long,' he groaned. Sergans decided to strike.' A wraith flew overhead, wailing in a shrill, cold voice as it streaked past. It drew up and turned to gaze at them, the shadowy image of a long-dead warrior. "'Slay them all!' it whispered to itself. Then it leaped down at Miria, sweeping its phantom sword from its scabbard. Garin shoved her behind him as he parried with his backsword. Elven steel glimmered in the moonlight against dark shadow stuff, but the wraith's ghostly weapon passed through Garin's steel and sank into his arm. 
A bitter white chill pierced the sword mage's flesh, and he cried out in agony. Then the race blade passed through him, leaving behind a thin white line of cold, pallid flesh, like the scar of an old wound. Far Thelmern, Sarth shouted, and from his fingertips he hurled a bolt of bright fire at the center of the wraith's body. The blazing bolt burned a hole right through the spirit's substance, such as it was, and the wraith recoiled as though sorely wounded. Steel is of little use now, Garin. The wraith's features wavered and grew indistinct, but within moments its ghostly fabric began to knit together again, and the malice of its emerald eyes glittered brightly. It turned its attention to the tiefling and glided forward, raising its phantom blade high for another strike. "'Damn the luck!' Sarth muttered. "'Perhaps my magic is not of much use either.' Garin shook off the lingering numbness in his sword arm and found the spell he was seeking. Wrythe Arak, he called, and his sword suddenly blazed with a brilliant white radiance. He leaped up to meet the wraith and drove his point right between the spirit's eyes. This time the elven steel bit into the unearthly substance as if into living flesh. The wraith shrieked once, pinioned by the sword through its forehead, and then a flash of argent light destroyed it. But more wraiths swirled around them, and the castle courtyard began to take on an eerie, sepulchral appearance, as if the mere presence of the dead warriors had dragged Griffin Watch itself into the spectral horror of their shadowy existence. "'We can't stay here, Garin,' Hamel warned. He had his daggers in hand, enchanted weapons both, but who could say whether they were keen enough to pierce flesh that was not there? And he kept them poised as a defense of sorts, trying to hold off wraiths drawing close from that side. We're too exposed here! Garin looked around, and his gaze fell on the door leading to the banquet hall. A shield-sworn guard fought furiously on the steps, only to crumple under the slashing assault of several of the furious wraiths. There was only one thing to do. Garin had to reach the Harmac and the rest of the Hullmasters before the wraiths did, hoping the others would follow his lead. He dashed across the courtyard and bounded up the steps into Griffin Watch's horror-haunted halls. 24. Ten Tarsak, the Year of the Ageless One The Hallbergens had chosen a good defensive position. The track, descending from the moorland down into the river valley, ran between a high hillside on the east and a small rocky rise on the right. The white rushing winter spear wound across the vale just in front of the human defences, spanned by an old bridge of stone. One of their small watchtowers stood atop the rocky rise. Murren grinned in appreciation as he studied the small army arrayed against him. The sun had set more than an hour ago, but great fires burned across here and there in front of the human positions, set so the humans would have light enough to fight by. The human soldiers were careful to stand well back from the firelight. They might not be able to see past the line of fires, but then again Murren couldn't send his warriors at them without sending them through the firelight. Whoever the commander was, he was no fool. They think... "'That little stream will stop us!' Crashk snarled. The hobgoblin chieftain waved his hand at the humans. He was taller than Murren by half a head, and his rank brown hair was braided with tapers around his face. In battle, Crashk lit them to wreathe his face in flame and reeking smoke, believing it terrified his enemies. He pointed across the vale to its lower side, where the hillsides steepened and drew together again. They would be wiser to stand at the defile there. Murren shook his head. The river runs through the middle of it. Dividing their warriors between the banks would be folly. Each part is unable to guard the other there. No, their captain chose good ground. The whole army fights as one, and he can fall back if he is beaten here. You think like a human? Krashk said, and let his fangs show for an instant to demonstrate that he did not mean it as a compliment. 
The bloody skull chieftain ignored his vassal's barb. He studied the veil for a time, then nodded to himself. It was a good plan. He pointed to the high hillside on the human's right flank. Can your wolf riders manage that hillside, Krashk? The hobgoblin studied it for a moment. It won't be easy, but yes, they could do it. Then my plan is simple. Take your wolf riders around to the top of that hill. I will attack down the throat of the valley and bring the humans right to the edge of the stream. When I signal, you bring the red claws down the hill and take them in the flank. The humans will be busy with me, so they won't have time to shoot at you. Krashk grinned in appreciation, and this time he intended no insult. A good plan, the hobgoblin said. For all the fierceness he claimed, he was quite clever and quickly grasped what Murren intended. Give me an hour to get my wolf riders where you want them. Then begin your attack. Do not call for me too early. Them go, Murren said. The hobgoblin held up his spear in salute, then jogged off into the cold and windy night, already barking out orders at his tribesmen. Murren looked around. Avran, he called. The warlock knight was waiting nearby. Yes, King Murren? I will drive the Halbergens down the valley in an hour. Can you see the place where the valley narrows there? I want your manticores and wyverns to wait there on the heights. When the Halbergens flee, they are to feast. The helmed human nodded. What of my spellcasters? They are to shield my warriors. We will attack at the bridge there. Use your magic to keep the humans from shooting us to pieces. It shall be as you say, the Vossen agreed. He went off to speak with the other black-armored humans and their pet monsters. Murren idly wondered what Avran would do if he came up with a plan that the warlock knights objected to. Would they try to reason with him, threaten him, use some form of magical compulsion? or simply arrange his death and replace him with a war chief more amenable to their control. Tonight it did not matter, but the day would come when he decided that he would not do what they wished him to do. The trick was simple. He needed to make himself strong enough that the Skull Smashers, the Red Claws, and the other bands of rabble infesting Thar feared him more than they feared Vasa. Destroying Hullberg would be a good start toward that goal. Each victory Murren won would increase his standing among the other chieftains of Thar, and soon enough they would come to believe that he'd won those victories with his own strength and cunning, not Vasan magic or allegiances. And when they did, he might have a chance to turn against the warlock knights and rule in his own name. Murren called his own bloody skull chiefs and captains together and gave them their instructions. Then he settled down to wait, squatting atop a boulder that gave him a good view of the valley below. The moon was waning and close to new, but the night was clear. He could easily make out hilltops miles away over the moorland. A cold and cheerless wind moaned through the hollows and over the hills around him. A ghost wind as his warriors called it. Tonight the spirits of old warriors were close by, doubtless gathering to watch the fight about to take place and roar approval from the land of the dead. He brooded on his own thoughts for a time, and then the warlock knight Avran approached him. King Murren, the Red Claws are in position. Krashk awaits your command. I hear you, Murren said. I will tell you when to signal him. He set his helm on his head and picked up his iron-shod spear, then trotted down to the place where his troops were gathering, a long bow-shot above the Hullbergans. He found another boulder amid his milling warriors and scrambled to its top so that all could see him. Listen to me, bloody skulls, he shouted. Listen to me, skull smashers. The orcs and ogres around him fell quiet, and the silence rippled out so that most of the warriors in the horde turned to look on him and await his words. 
There below you stand the warriors of the human king who murdered Morag and threw back his head in contempt. The bloody skulls snarled in anger at that. The skull smashers had no idea who Morag was, but the dim-witted ogres knew a fight was near, and they snarled too. There below you stand the warriors whose people hunt your game, trap your furs, and steal your gold out of the earth. Look on them, my brothers. They are all that stands between you and Hulberg tonight. Deal with these, and all the gold and fur and food that they have stolen from you over the years is yours for the taking. A thousand slaves we heard out of Hullberg tomorrow, and all the plunder you can carry. If only you fight well tonight and slay these weaklings where they stand. Each warrior who takes from this field the skull of a human felled by his hand wins honor tonight. But you must strike swiftly, my brothers, because there are more of you than there are of them. He who is slow, who hesitates, who holds back when others charge forward, he takes no head tonight. Now go and slay. With that, Murren leaped down from his perch, pointing his spear at the humans across the field, and darted into the firelight. Thousands of orcs and ogres around him roared in battle fury and followed, each striving to cross the firelit veil and be the first to claim a head. Arrows, bolts, and battle spells leaped out of the human shield wall as Murren's orcs appeared out of the darkness. Many of the missiles and streaking fireballs vanished in sparks of crimson flame, intercepted by the Vassan mages who worked to shield the bloody skull horde. But others slipped through. Orcs howled and fell rolling to the slope as arrows and bolts bit into flesh, while only a few yards from Murren a sphere of crackling lightning suddenly exploded amid several ogres and speared them where they stood, with brilliant green bolts. The ogres shrieked and jerked horribly as smoke burst from their flesh, and they fell twitching an instant later. Murren ran past them, ignoring the dead and dying warriors. He slowed his steps a little, and looked around to get a good sense of how the attack was going. His skull guards clustered in a tight knot around him, guarding him with their shields. The skull smashers stormed the bridge, swarming up and over the small stone span. But a loud cracking sound ripped through the night, and the bridge suddenly collapsed into the stream, taking half a dozen ogres with it. Clever, Murren growled. The humans had sabotaged the span. He should have expected that, but elsewhere his warriors reached the bank of the winter spear. Here a cold, swift stream, not more than forty feet wide and several feet deep, and began to wade recklessly across into the teeth of the human defenses. Orcs died by the scores in the water, shot down as they floundered and struggled against the current. But other warriors on the stream bank hurled javelins and heavy spears over the water, taking a toll of the humans waiting on the far bank. Murren's nostrils flared at the smell of blood, and he ached to throw himself headlong into the fray and lead his warriors across. But he restrained himself. He was a warlord, not a berserker, and that meant that sometimes he had to fight with his wits as well as with his hands. Orcs and ogres reached the far bank, only to die under the blades of the Halbergen soldiers waiting for them. More warriors swarmed up behind them, pushing forward into the steel of humans and dwarves. It was not a fight that favored the bloody skulls, since their greater numbers were compressed into a comparatively small frontage. But even so, the sheer mass and ferocity of the horde made itself felt. Foot by foot, the Halbergen line wavered shoved back by the growing press. Murren waited thirty heartbeats more just to be sure of the moment, and then he wheeled and shouted at his guards, "'They banner now!' Two of the skull guards raised up a bright yellow banner with the image of a crimson skull crudely depicted on it and waved it from side to side. One staggered and fell with an arrow quivering between his shoulder-blades, but the sign was already given.' 
A hundred yards behind them, one of the Vassen spellcasters launched a blazing missile of green fire straight up into the air, where it burst over the battlefield. From the darkness above and to one side of the human lines, a chorus of fierce howls and war cries greeted the signal. "'You are not so clever as you think,' Murren growled at his unseen adversary. Somewhere behind the human lines, some lord or captain had just tasted his first true fear of the battle. Shouts of consternation and distress arose from the right flank of the Hulbergen lines, and then Murren saw his wolf-riders come pelting down the steep hillside behind the soldiers fighting at the stream. A number stumbled and fell, rolling down helplessly. But even those served to knock down the humans or dwarves they tumbled into. He grinned in triumph. While he'd hammered on his enemy's shield with his right hand to keep him busy, he'd just managed to gut him with a cleaver in his left. The fight would not last long. "'At them, skull guards!' Murren shouted. "'I mean to take a head tonight!' He sprinted forward to join the fray, slashing into the icy water not far from the ruined bridge. He clambered up onto the far bank unhindered. His warriors had already pushed the Hulbergans back from the water's edge. Spying an opening in the lines, he roared a battle cry and dashed forward to bury his spearhead in the heart of a human soldier who did not raise his shield swiftly enough. The man cried out and fell. Murren wrenched his steel out of the man's chest and turned to battle another soldier. This one, a sturdy dwarf, who nearly took off the warlord's foot with a low, quick axe cut. They traded several blows, spear darting to find a way around the shield, axe whistling through the air, and then an ogre came up behind the dwarf and smashed him broken to the wet ground with a huge overhand blow from his massive club. Murren growled in frustration and shifted away to find another foe. He felt the beginning of the rout before he saw it. Soldiers shrank away from his warriors, giving ground a step or two at a time, then more quickly. Off to his right, on the enemy's lightly engaged side, one of their companies, footmen in checkered surcoats of scarlet and white, likely one of the mercenary companies the Hulbergen merchants hired, stepped off the line and began an orderly withdrawal, which of course exposed the companies next to them. More of the Hulbergans began to withdraw, as orcs howled after them, axes and spears raised high. The enemy companies on the Hulbergen right were already shattered, caught between the hammer and anvil of red-claw wolf-riders and bloody-skull warriors fording the winter spear. Only the Harmac's own shield-sworn stood fast, holding the center, but they were in grave danger of being surrounded as the flanks crumbled on each side. Murren plunged back into the fray, attacking the shield-sworn in front of him. He speared a tall veteran with a beard of iron gray, then drew back his arm and hurled his spear at another human who stood with his back to the war chief. The weapon transfixed him. He spun to the ground, sword falling from his fingers. The half-orc swept a heavy, curved sword from his belt and bounded over to the dying soldier, taking his head with one smooth strike. "'This is my trophy!' he shouted to his skull-guards, and then he looked for another enemy. Trumpets sounded in the veil, and the human soldiers turned and jogged back, giving more ground. Behind them, a single line of horsemen formed up to serve as a rear guard, while the rest began to stream back out of the vale after the mercenaries who had already abandoned the field. The captain of the horsemen waved her sword over her head and cried out in a high, clear voice, "'Counter-charge! Counter-charge!' The riders spurred forward at the vast horde swarming down against them, lances lowered, and threw a shock into Murren's warriors that stopped them where they stood. At once the human riders wheeled and galloped back out of range, not before a couple were caught and dragged out of their saddles, and then turned to form another line behind their captain. Murren peered at her and scowled. She wore the griffin surcoat all the Harmac's men wore, but her griffin was gold in color instead of blue, 
and her eyes glittered with an eerie luminous light. Lamblon Serpent, he hissed. Few human warriors earned much respect from the bloody skulls, but he'd heard enough stories about Kara Hullmaster and her skill with bow and blade. Right before his eyes, she was throwing back his warrior's assaults in order to give her soldiers a chance to escape his trap. Again, she shouted, counter charge! And once again the line of fifty riders threw itself into the hundreds upon hundreds of orcs and ogres and wolf riders who pressed close behind and hammered them to a standstill. They broke free again and retreated, missing a few more of their comrades, but the Harmax champion still rode at their head. "'That one at least knows the meaning of courage,' he said. It was almost a pity to slay a warrior of such heart, but die she must. He sheathed his sword and held out his hand to the nearest skull guard. "'Quickly, your spear!' the warrior handed Murrin his spear." a good weapon, well-balanced and strong, and Murrin studied his quarry carefully. She rallied her riders for one more attack against the swarming horde surrounding them, and shouted again, "'Counter-charge! For Hullberg!' The war-chief took three quick steps and flung his spear with all his strength. It was a long throw, since he was a good forty yards behind the ragged lines of his warriors, but he gave himself a running start, and he aimed well. The spear arced down through the darkness as she galloped forward to meet it unknowingly. And then, at the last instant, somehow she glimpsed the spear hurling at her heart. She threw up her sword and parried the flashing spear point, batting it aside so that it flew over her shoulder. "'The luck of a witch,' said the warrior whose spear Murrin had borrowed. Murrin watched as she crashed once more into his warriors, laying about her with her blade, and then emerged again to gallop away. He snorted and shook his head. "'That was not luck, Rorth. That was skill.' Her death does not wait on this field. This time the remaining shield-sworn riders, less than half of those who had first stood against the bloody skulls, did not reform their lines. They'd bought enough time for the survivors of Hullberg's army to make their escape. The Harmax champion led them through the narrow defile at the lower side of the field, retreating into the broad Winterspear Vale beyond. Murren noted with wry amusement that dozens of torn bodies in coats of checkered white and scarlet were strewn along the narrow path. The mercenaries who'd fled the battle first had simply ensured that they were the first to discover the Vassan's waiting monsters. "'A fitting end for faithless cowards,' he muttered. "'A good fight, Murren!' The Red Claw Kroshk sat atop his huge warg, leaning on the saddle horn. Smoke streamed from the burning tapers in his beard and hair. Blood oozed from a broken off arrow embedded in the hobgoblin's left thigh, but he paid it no mind. They'll run all the way back to the Moon Sea, I think. Not if I can help it, the warlord answered. Harry them at every step, Kroshk. Make them turn and stand ten times an hour. If you slow them down, we can catch them out in the open fields and destroy them completely. That will cost me wolves and warriors, the hobgoblin warned. And in token of that, the Red Claws will earn a generous share of the city's plunder, Murren answered. But we can't take the city unless we destroy the Harmax army. And to do that, I need you to make them stand and fight somewhere far from help. Kroshk nodded. As you say then, warlord, but I will hold you to your promise when it comes time to pick our plunder. He dug his heels into his warg's flanks, and the monstrous wolf snarled and bounded away into the darkness after the retreating Halbergans. Murren watched him go and grinned. With any luck, Kroshk would find a way to get himself killed and spare him the trouble of finding a suitable bribe. But if not, well, he'd simply allow the Red Claws to take a little more from what the Vassans asked him to spare. There would be enough plunder 
that he didn't feel that he had to share his own. 25. Ten Tarsak, the Year of the Ageless One The wraiths of Isperus killed swiftly and indiscriminately. Wherever they came across a living person, they struck savagely. As Garin dashed up through the castle toward the Harmag's tower, it seemed that he found a murdered servant or guard each time he turned a corner. Each victim died with hardly a mark upon him, simply a pallid white scar wherever a wraith's weapon had touched living flesh. But their eyes were dark and blank, and their mouths were twisted in silent screams at the horror of their ghostly killers. Shouts of panic and mortal terror echoed through the castle's corridors, lost amid the shrill cries and sinister calls of the spectral warriors who roamed Griffin Watch. Rather than risk the castle's great hall and the dozen wraiths swarming around it, Garin darted into the maze of storerooms and servants' quarters that surrounded that part of Griffin Watch. Hamel, Mirya, and Sarth hurried to keep up with him, so he slowed his steps just a little. It was all too easy to get lost in Griffin Watch's deeper hallways, and they hadn't grown up in the castle as he had. This way, he called to them. He came to a servant's staircase that climbed up to the East Hall, a large building between the lower bailey and the upper court that housed offices of the Harmax officials and quarters for dignitaries. Garin swiftly mounted the steps and emerged into a broad hallway with a floor of gleaming hardwood only to find several wraiths hovering nearby. The undead spirits hissed in challenge and flew at him with their pale blades raised to strike. "'Wraiths!' the sword mage called over his shoulder. He quickly wove the words for the silver-steel veil. "'Quillan Mahariel!' he cried, then gave ground, luring the spectral warriors away from the doorway he'd just come through. His companions were only a few steps behind him, and he didn't want the ghosts to fall on them as soon as they appeared in the hall. "'Over here, you foul spirits!' The wraiths swirled around him, streaking in to stab and slash with their ghostly blades, but Garin's elf-wrought blade still glimmered with the radiance of his spirit bane spell. He parried their attacks as if they were striking with weapons of iron, passing one blade past his hip— knocking another's point down to the ground, and then whirling close to draw his edge across a wraith's neck as he leaped aside from the third. The shining steel of his blade bit deep into the wraith's shadowy substance, and a jet of dark mist boiled away from Garin's cut as he turned to face the remaining two. The wraiths were not stupid. When they came at him again, they did so much more cautiously, almost like living warriors who feared his strike. For a moment it was all Garin could do to keep himself alive, as the two wraiths sought to trap him between their swords, and assailed him from both sides at once. He devoted himself entirely to his own defense, parrying one blade after the other as he continued to circle away from them. Hamel reached the top of the stairs in a sudden rush of soft footsteps. The halfling took in the situation in a glance, and threw himself headlong into the fight, daggers in hand. "'We're coming, Garin!' he cried. He set in against one of the wraiths, his small blades moving in a silver blur as he slashed and punched at his ghostly foe. The wraith screeched and retreated from Hamel's assault. Even though the daggers weren't quite real to the phantom, they were enchanted, and their magic bit into its spectral flesh. As with Sarth's spells in the castle's lower courtyard, the wounds did not last long. In a matter of moments, the fraying ghost stuff knitted itself together again, almost as fast as the halfling could slice it apart. "'How do you kill these things?' Hamel snarled. Garin took advantage of the distraction Hamel was providing to change foes, abandoning his wraith for a moment to jam his gleaming sword point in the center of the other's back. The creature threw back its head and wailed horribly before discorporating. A black chill shocked Garin's hands as the thing died, so to speak, on the point of his blade. Mirya hurried into the room, holding her skirts with her hands to manage the stairs. The last wraith whirled and darted for her, and she cried out and threw herself out of the way. 
Behind her, Sarth leveled his rune-carved rod at the spirit and let loose with a gout of yellow flame. The wraith screeched once and veered away, plunging into a solid brick wall as it fled. "'Have all the shades of the Shadowland got loose in the castle?' Miriam muttered. "'Madness and mayhem! That's the name of this night!' "'Garen, we must leave this place,' the tiefling said. "'I do not have magic enough to defeat all of these grim specters, nor do you.' "'I've got to see my family to safety first, Garen answered. "'I can't leave without them. "'Harmac, Grigor, Natali, and Kerr, Erna, his aunt, Tarina. "'None of them would stand a chance against the ghostly warriors. "'He had to believe that his young cousins were still unharmed. "'The thought of the two Hullmaster children under the pale blades of Isperus's wraiths "'left him almost helpless with dread. "'They may already—' Sarth began to say, then winced and halted himself. The tiefling's face was not made for compassion, but his voice was softer when he spoke again. Of course, I should have thought of that. Lead on. Deciding that haste was more important than stealth, Garin turned to his right and ran for the doors leading out into the upper courtyard. He burst out into the cold, pale moonlight. Wraiths darted and flew through the shadows, eyes aglow with malice and hunger. The sword mage crossed the small courtyard quickly, passing two more dead, shield-sworn, and ducked into the Harmax Tower. His companions followed. The great room in the tower's lower floor was deserted. A fire guttered and popped in the hearth, but none of the hallmasters were there. Quickly, Garin dashed up the stairs to the family's bedchambers, throwing open each door as he passed. He found no one on the second floor, and in a growing panic, he ran up to the third floor and began to search the rooms there as well. "'They're not here,' he cried. "'They might have fled already,' Hamel said. "'Where would they go, Garin?' "'The postern gate,' he guessed. It was far below them now but passages below the trophy room led to deeper armories and Griffin Watch's small, well-protected side gate. He shook his head and checked the rooms again. Then he hurried back down the steps to the great room. It was possible that no one remained alive in the castle other than the four of them, but he could still make out the occasional distant scream echoing through the halls, so at least some of the guards or servants were still fighting for their lives. Let me check the library first. The Harmac's often there. He rushed back out into the courtyard. Ghostly forms flittered through the shadows. He reached out and grasped Miria's hand. Stay close, he warned. He started along the side of the court, heading for the castle's library. But Miria suddenly stopped and pulled back. Garin, look, she whispered. The chapel. Garin halted and looked around. Across the upper courtyard, the castle's disused chapel was surrounded by a dozen of Isperus's minions. The spirits were forming ranks before the door leading to the shrine. As each wraith took its place alongside its fellows, all of the spirits gathered there grew sharper, clearer, and more substantial. More of the spirits were streaming up to join their fellows. "'Of course,' he murmured. Holy ground often deterred evil spirits, and Grigor certainly would have known that. I think the wraiths are gathering for an assault, Hamel said in a low voice. Can they get in? Miria asked. I don't know, Garin replied. He looked over to Sarth. Can they? The tiefling's eyes glowed faintly red in the dark courtyard. He studied the scene and shook his head. Not yet. But the old spells and blessings on the chapel do not seem very strong to me. They will not last long, and even if they can keep out the wraiths, there may be more powerful undead nearby. Should Isperus himself come here, nothing will impede him. One of the wraiths reached out with its spectral hand and tested the door, which trembled a little at the ghost's touch. Inside, a child screamed in panic. Without another moment's thought, Garin ran across the courtyard, brandishing his glowing sword, and darted into the middle of the assembled wraiths, swinging wildly. The blade left swaths of sparkling white light in its path, like a wake of tiny stars. The wraiths shrieked in their cold, terrible voices, and recoiled from its touch. Sarth joined in then, hurling blasts of fire that singed the wraiths' shadow stuff, and drove them back. 
Hold on, Garin shouted. We're coming. He fought his way to the door amid a swirl of phantom blades and leering dead faces. One icy cold blade kissed the nape of his neck, and another seared his left hip. But he cleared the ghostly warriors away. Miria and Hamel darted into the doorway and fumbled at the door. Garin put his back to them and wove a web of brilliant elven steel in the icy night, keeping the wraiths at bay. Hamel, the door! I'm working on it, Hamel answered. He worked frantically with the point of one dagger, trying to get it beneath the bar on the far side. There! The bar clattered to the floor, and Hamel threw open the door. Inside the chapel, the hallmaster stood clustered close by the altar of Tyre. Harmac Grigor held a magic wand in one hand, and stood a little in front of his daughter-in-law, Erna, and his grandchildren, Natali and Kerr. The children sobbed quietly, both frightened terribly, but doing their best to be brave. Garin's aunt Tarina, sister of the Harmac, Kara's mother, and Sergan's stepmother, knelt on the flagstone floor, tending a shield-sworn armsman who had collapsed from white wounds. "'Thank Timora,' Garin breathed in relief. "'You're all alive.' "'Yes, though five shield-sworn died to see us into this refuge,' Harmac Grigor said with a bitter tone. "'I was of little help. I'm afraid that I'm not much of a wizard.' The old lord looked at Garin and frowned. "'I feared that you would be killed in your cell, Garin. How did you survive? And who is that with you?' "'I escaped to warn you of this attack. Too late, it seems,' Garin answered. "'This is Sarth Kool Reizer, who helped Hamel and Miria get me out of the cell. I hope you'll forgive them, uncle. But I had to try to warn you. Sergan means to kill us all. He summoned the wraiths to Griffin Watch. "'Sergan is behind this?' Grigor demanded. Garin's Aunt Tarina looked up from the man she tended. The wraith's attack had caught her in her bed, and she wore only her dressing gown and a cloak thrown over her shoulders. She strongly resembled her daughter Kara. She was a fit woman of sixty years, strongly built, with long grey-white hair. Tarina paled and put her hand to her throat. "'So he's finally chosen to follow in his father's footsteps,' she said. "'Ah, Grigor, I'm so sorry.' I never imagined he had so much hate in him. He wasn't always what he's become. Excuse me, but all that can wait for later, Hamel said sharply. He stood by the chapel's door, looking out into the courtyard. The wraiths are returning, Garin. We've got to leave now or fight here. Garin looked at his uncle. We should flee, he said. I don't know if we can hold off many more of the wraiths. The posterns are best chance to get the children out of the castle. Grigor nodded. Agreed. Lead the way, Garin. Shut the door, Hamel, Garin said. He hurried across the chapel to a small door that led outside to the tiny courtyard where he had practiced a few times. With luck, the wraiths would be gathering by the chapel's front door, massing their might to overcome the old, weak blessings that deterred them for the moment. It took him a moment to get the side door open— this one was rarely used, and he had to put his shoulder to it to push it open through the leaf mold that had accumulated on the other side. But no wraiths waited in the small cloister beyond. "'This way, quickly,' he said to the others. He hurried across to the door, leading back into the Harmax Tower on the far side of the small courtyard. Miria and Hamel helped the injured shield-sworn to his feet, and Erna grasped Natali and Kerr firmly by their hands and followed. Garin led them into the Harmax Tower and found the stairs that led down to the hallway by the trophy room. They encountered no more corpses here, nor any wraiths. It was normally a lightly travelled part of the castle, and he began to hope that he might actually get his uncle and the rest of the family out of Griffin Watch safely. He turned into one of the passageways cut through the hill's heart rock, and came to a barred iron door. Garin threw the bar aside and pushed it open, to reveal a staircase spiralling down into the gloom. "'This way,' he said. "'Be careful of the steps. It's a long stair.' "'Are the ghosts going to follow us down there?' Kerr asked. "'I hope not, Kerr. We're trying to stay a step ahead of them,' Garin answered. "'Down you go.' 
The stairs spiraled down forty feet or more, lit by dimly glowing light globes the shield sworn refreshed every few months with minor magic. The stairwell was cramped, cold, and dark, but Garin could still see enough to lead the way down. Below the staircase stood a large hall with a low, barrel-vaulted ceiling. This chamber was designed to house scores of warriors in full kit, since the postern gate, the castle's small back entrance, from which a force inside could sally in strength to attack besiegers from an unexpected direction, was close by. Garin halted at the foot of the stairs and guided the others into the room as they appeared. "'Over there,' he said. The Harmac limped badly when he reached the bottom step. He grimaced in pain. "'Stairs pain me. You shouldn't wait on me, Garin.' The sorcerer Sarth brought up the rear, watching carefully behind him with his rod at the ready. "'We must keep moving,' the tiefling said. "'They are not far behind us.' Garin did not pause. He hurried back across the hall and ducked into the short passage leading to the postern. Normally the door was securely locked and barred, since the shield sworn didn't keep any guards there, but when he turned the corner he found the postern standing open. It seemed that he wasn't the only person in Griffin Watch to think of the side gate. He started forward, but Hamel reached out and caught his sleeve. "'Something seems awry here,' the halfling said silently. "'Douse the nearest lights, and wait here a moment. I'll take a look.' "'Go ahead.' "'Garin said softly. "'He retreated a few steps and covered the light globes "'gleaming in the postern passage. "'Hamel glided into the shadows "'and slipped out the heavy iron door. "'Even though Garin knew the halfling was there, "'he couldn't see or hear him. "'He motioned for the rest of the small company "'to hold still and wait. Thirty heartbeats later, Hamel returned. "'It's an ambush,' he said quietly. Several of the castle folk lie dead just outside. There are a dozen Varuna armsmen outside, ready for someone to blunder out the door. Garin's fist tightened on the hilt of his blade. The extent of Sergan's perfidy was now clear. So Sergan sent the specters to slay everyone in the castle, then made sure to have his armsmen waiting by the gates to cut down anyone who managed to flee, he snarled. He's a traitor and a murderer, just like his father was. He looked at Natalie and Kerr, waiting with their mother. With Hamel and Sarth, he might have a chance to cut his way free of the trap, but he could hardly lead the children or his older relatives into a fight. We'll have to try some other way, the Harmac said wearily. The main gate, I suppose. If those villains are watching the postern, Lord Harmac, there's not a chance in the world they'll not watch the main gatehouse, too, Miria pointed out. Is there any other way out of the castle? There are a couple of places where a rope might be lowered from the walls, but I am not sure if the children could manage it, the Harmac said. Or if I could, in all honesty. We could wait here, Erna said. "'The specters might not come to this part of the castle.' "'Inadvisable,' Sars said. "'He stood by the foot of the stairs, head cocked to one side, "'to peer upward as far as he could. "'It's only a matter of time before the ghosts descend to this level. "'We'll have to break out, then,' Garin decided. "'Sarth, do you have any spells that could protect us outside?' "'The tiefling frowned. "'A spell of fog, but it would blind us as well.' "'It'll have to do,' Garin turned to his uncle. "'Hamel and I will try to deal with the men waiting outside. "'Wait inside the postern as long as you can.' "'Harmac Grigor nodded. "'Good luck, Garin,' he said quietly. "'The sword mage moved close to the doorway "'and muttered the incantation of the dragon scales "'to guard himself as best he could. "'A shimmering stream of purple-glowing diadems "'formed around him, rippling in the shadowy light. "'Hamel drew up close beside him, a dagger in each hand. "'The halfling looked up at Garin and said, "'I have some doubts about this plan. "'Best not to dwell on it, then.' "'Garin looked over at Sarth. "'The tiefling raised his clawed hands "'and softly chanted the words of his spell. "'Billows of blue mist began to rise from the ground,' rapidly filling the doorway and spilling into the night outside. 
The sword mage waited a moment for the fog to thicken more and steeled his nerve. Then he stepped into the fog and felt his way out the postern gate. The gate opened onto a small landing near the foot of Griffin Watcher's Hill, about halfway around the castle from the main gate. Worn stone steps covered by a low wall descended twenty feet to an old wrought-iron fence. Beyond that stood a tangle of alders, blue leaves, and blackberry thickets, a small woodland that ringed the eastern side of the castle's hill. Garin could barely see the steps under his feet, and he kept one hand on the wall to navigate through the mist. It was cold, and the steps were slick with frost. Then, abruptly, he descended out of the tattered blue mist and caught sight of the armsmen standing nearby in Varuna's green and white. "'There!' one of the mercenaries shouted. "'Shoot him down!' Several men raised crossbows at Garin, but the sword mage quickly ducked under the wall. Bolts snapped and hissed through the air, clattering against the rocky foot of the castle or striking the stone steps. He risked a quick peek over the wall to get a better look. The Varuna men were arranged in a loose half-ring under the eaves of the dark grove beyond the fence. Thrusting his fear and anger aside, the sword mage fixed in his mind the arcane symbols of the spell he needed and spoke its single word, Syrock. The strange, cold lurch of teleportation jarred him, and he felt as if he were falling. But then he stood in the middle of the Varuna armsmen, who were busily drawing back their crossbows and making ready another shot. Garin snarled and stabbed the nearest man through the throat, and then bounded past the crumpling mercenary to slash off the arm of the next one in the line. A crossbowman, behind him, fired at his back, but the amethyst scales of his protection spell deflected the quarrel away from him. He ignored the attack and kept going. The third man he reached had the time to drop his crossbow and draw a sword. Garin launched a furious attack, raining slashes left and right against the Varuna armsmen. The mercenary parried the first few and attempted a counterattack, but Garin threw up a lightning-quick block of his own and spun inside the man's guard to slash his belly badly. The Varuna man shrieked and reeled away. "'Watch it, Garin!' Hamel paused by the iron fence, took aim, and hurled a dagger at an armsman hurrying up behind Garin. The blade took the man just under his hauberk, biting deeply above the knee. The charging soldier stumbled and rolled in the underbrush with a savage oath. Hamel scrambled over the fence, only to be knocked spinning to the ground by a crossbow bolt that caught him just before he was going to drop down on the forest side. Hamel! Garin cried. He took a step toward the place where his friend had fallen, but Hamel's silent voice stopped him. I'm not badly hurt. Keep at them, Garin. Garin turned back to the Varuna armsmen around him. He counted at least a dozen more men facing him. Swords in hand, they circled closer, ready for him now. Behind the Malmasterite mercenaries stood a hooded man in elegant black finery. Sergen Hullmaster stepped out of the shadows, his dark eyes glittering. He carried a crossbow in one hand and a long, slender rapier in the other. "'I didn't like that arrogant little popinjay very much,' he remarked. "'I intended for you to die in your cell, Garin. "'I must tell you that I'm a little disappointed that you'll meet your end with steel in your hand. "'On the other hand,' Sergen paused to toss away his empty crossbow "'and drew a poniard with his left hand. "'I'm more than a little tired of hearing tales about your heroics.' "'Tonight I'll repay many old slights and insults. "'I've always known that you're not the paragon of virtue and skill "'everyone seems to think you are.' "'Garin smiled coldly. "'You'll meet me blade to blade, Sergen. "'Your mercenaries will stand aside.' "'The black-garbed lord laughed. "'My sense of fair play is not so well developed as that, Garin. "'They'll stand aside only as long as I'm winning.' He looked at the Varuna mercenary standing nearby and said, "'If he wounds me, cut him down.' Then he came to meet Garin with his rapier in hand. 26. Eleven Tarsak, the Year of the Ageless One 
Garin did not remember Sergan as a swordsman of much skill, but he hadn't seen him with a blade since Sergan was fifteen or sixteen. Still, the fact that Sergan offered to meet him suggested that the traitor had at least some reason to feel confident, and so Garin resolved to be cautious. Should I try for a swift victory, even though the armsmen might overwhelm me, he thought, or do I play for time and try to draw things out, knowing that every moment I'm delayed, the wraiths may find the others? Sergan seemed to read his uncertainty and grinned at Garin's indecision. "'You must be wondering just how skillfully you should fight,' he said. "'A difficult puzzle, I suspect. I am curious to see how you'll resolve it.' "'Difficult?' Garin stalked closer, watching Sergan's eyes. If it were only his own life at stake, that would be one thing. But Sergan was responsible for authoring a massacre— and should he fall, Sergan or his men would see to it that none of the Hallmasters survived the night. No, not especially. Whatever else happens tonight, you'll regret crossing blades with me. If it costs me my life to send you from this world, then you'll have little opportunity to profit from your treachery. He smiled coldly at Sergan and attacked. A simple thrust at the belt buckle. Surgeon parried and reposted sharply. Garin parried in turn and gave a half-step before replying with a quick slash at Sergan's face, which the council lord likewise parried. They traded thrusts and cuts furiously for several moments before the momentum of their strikes carried them past each other and they exchanged places. He's quick, Garin realized. Sergan was a good swordsman, though not as experienced as he was. However, his cousin was exceptionally fast, quicker than Garin, at least. Of all the natural gifts a swordsman desired, raw speed was certainly the most vital. Given equal skill, a fast man could beat a strong man if weight of armor was not a consideration. "'You're more of a swordsman than I remember,' Garin admitted. "'You're not the swordsman I feared,' Sergan replied." He began the next exchange, lunging in to thrust with his rapier. Garin deflected the point with a sharp ring of steel. Sergan recovered and attacked again, and Garin parried that one as well. And then, rather than recover, Sergan suddenly leaped in close and stabbed with his poniard. Garin knocked the dagger's point away with his forearm and received a shallow, bloody cut from its razor-sharp blade despite the spells protecting him. He put his shoulder down and shoved Sergan back out of range. The blades flew swiftly in the moonlight, ringing shrilly. Garin tested his cousin's defenses low, then high as they circled through the brush. As best he could, he kept an eye on the Varuna soldiers who ringed them. He managed to turn Sergan around again so that he could see the castle's postern gate over Sergan's shoulder. It was difficult to tell with the tatters of mist still clinging to the doorway, but he thought he saw a furtive motion there, shadowy figures slipping down the steps. Garin redoubled the pace of his attacks, keeping Sergan and the Varuna armsmen focused on him. He knew a sword spell or two he could have used, but if he worked a spell, the Varunas around him might react. Grimacing in frustration, he fell back on his own skill. "'I think you're holding back,' Sergan said between blows. "'Perhaps you're not as fearless as you believe you are, dear cousin.' "'You forget where I studied,' Garin retorted. "'I spent years in Mithdranor, tutored by elf blademasters. "'You think you're quick. "'I learned to fight against elves who'd make you look like a staggering drunk.' He parried several more blows, and essayed a riposte of his own that Sergan caught on his poniard. "'Speed's a fleeting advantage, Sergan. When a man tires, he slows down. If you were going to defeat me with your quickness, you would have done it already. Now it's my fight.' "'Your confidence is misplaced,' Sergan snarled. He launched a lightning thrust at Garin's heart, which Garin parried awkwardly. Instantly, Sergan recovered, circled his point under Garin's blade, and thrust again, falling into Garin's trap. 
the sword mage's awkward parry instantly became a short, brutal chop at Sergan's sword arm as Garin twisted away from the thrust. His blade bit into Sergan's arm just below the elbow and cracked bone. Sergan cried out and dropped his rapier, and then Garin nearly took his head off with the backhand stroke that followed. Sergan managed to duck under the blow, but not without suffering a great gash of his scalp and a jarring blow to the skull that sent him reeling to the ground. Garin leaped past his step-cousin and immediately engaged the first of the Varuna armsmen he could reach. Hamel, he shouted. Help if you can. He rushed past the man and found a brief clear space to speak another spell. Ilyaith Sanogan, he cried and his blade suddenly crackled with brilliant yellow sparks. Then several Varuna men beset him at the same time. Garin leaped and parried, thrust and slashed, and for ten heartbeats he was lost in the thick of a fight as dire as any he'd ever been caught in. A thrust at his heart was weakened just enough by his fading dragon scales to keep the point in the muscle of his chest and then a hamstringing slash at the back of his knee buckled his leg, but did not quite bring him down. He struck one man in a steel breastplate with his enchanted blade, and a sharp flash of lightning seared the darkness. When Garin blinked his eyes clear, the man was lying on the ground with smoke curling from his ears, but more mercenaries pressed in around him. Suddenly the forest rocked with powerful words of magic. Satharni ki roared Sarth. The tiefling appeared by the postern gate, amid the dissipating remains of his simple fog spell. From his hands streaked out a great glowing blast of purple fire that burst beneath the trees. Sorcerer's fire seared an awful swath through the mercenaries near Garin. Several men screamed terribly as their surcoats caught fire, and they staggered blindly through the night like living torches. Others fell and burned where they stood. The tiefling leaped into the air and soared over the fight, smiting more mercenaries with blasts of his fire or crackling bolts of lightning. A crossbow snapped in the darkness, and another Varuna blade attacking Garin threw his hands up in the air and collapsed with a coral in his back. "'My arm's broken, Garin,' Hamel said. "'I can't work the Kranikin for another shot.' "'Improvise!' Garin called back to him. He dispatched one of the men still pressing him with a deep cut to the great artery in the thigh. The man hopped back a half-step and toppled, trying vainly to clamp his hand over the terrible wound. Then Garin felt a roar of fire at his back, and turned to find one of the mercenaries staggering at him, raising his sword to strike. The sword-mage parried the clumsy blow, cut the legs out from under his foe, then buried his point in the man's heart as a stroke of mercy. He reeled from the awful smoke and stink of the burning corpse, and saw one of the other soldiers ten yards away taking aim at Sarth with a crossbow. Without a moment's thought, Garin summoned another spell as he threw his backsword. The blade flew straight and true, whirling through the firelight and shadows, and buried its point in the crossbowman. The mercenary crumpled and folded. Garin held out his hand and finished the spell by stretching out his hand and snarling, Kuladar! The sword wrenched itself free, and flashed back to him, hilt first. He caught it and wheeled around in search of another foe. To his surprise, he saw that the remaining Varuna men were retreating, fleeing through the thickets and shadows. He swayed where he stood, suddenly aware of the cuts and bruises he'd fought through, and slowly limped back toward the postern steps. Timora smiled on me tonight, he thought wearily. Hamel, he called. Uncle Grigor? Here, his uncle replied. He slowly straightened up from the wall by the steps, standing in front of Erna, Natali, and Kerr. We're unhurt. Thank the gods. Hamel, where are you? I'm by the fence, Garin, Hamel called. Garin made his way over and found Miria tending to the halfling already. A bloody quarrel lay on the ground next to Hamel, and she held a folded-up cloak against a dark stain high on his right leg. Hamel's left arm hung limp at his side. His face was pale, but he found a small smile for Garin anyway. "'Can you believe it? The quarrel in my leg's bad enough, but I fell from the top of the fence and broke my arm. 
Fortunately, Miria's gentle touch shall soon restore me to health. In a month, perhaps, Miria said with a frown, there's to be no more fighting for you tonight, Master Hamel. Garin knelt and rested a hand on his friend's good shoulder. You should have used the gate, he told him. Then he climbed back to his feet and returned to where Sergen had fallen. Sergen was gone. Garin swore and thrashed around in the bracken and briars, searching for some sign of his traitorous cousin. He found the place where Sergen had fallen, and set his hand on the ground where his cousin had been lying, only to find splashes of blood and a pair of small, empty vials. Potions, he muttered. Healing? Invisibility? Whatever they were, Sergen had made his escape. He could very well return with more mercenaries to finish things. In fact, he had to, since he was done in Hullberg as long as the Hullmasters remained alive. I'm an idiot, Garin told himself. I should have made sure of him. Then again, there were a dozen enemies nearby waiting to strike the instant he defeated his cousin, and he couldn't very well have paused to search Sergen at the moment he fell. But I could have spared him a sword point in the eye, he muttered darkly. Garin, the castle's foot is no safe place to linger, Miria called softly. I hear the ghosts calling one to the other, and I think they're coming near the postern. You're right, Miria, Garin answered. Sergen's gone. He may return with more mercenaries. We need to get the Harmac and the young ones to a place of safety. Where? Harmac Grigor asked. He nodded up at the castle battlements far overhead. Garin could hear the distant wails and cries of the wraiths that swarmed through its passageways and chambers. Griffin Watch is a morgue. Most of my shield sworn are away fighting the bloody skulls, and I suspect that all who remained to guard the castle are dead now. I have few soldiers remaining in Hullberg, Garin. Garin thought for a moment. They could simply search for a place to hide and wait for morning, but Sergen's allies might already be moving to seize control of the town. They needed soldiers, a body of armed men to protect the Harmac, but Kara and the Shield Sworn were defending the borders against the Bloody Skulls. "'That's not quite true, Uncle Grigor,' he said slowly. "'We'll find at least some of the Spearmead captains at the Troll and Tankard.' We can have a couple of hundred loyal Hullbergans around you in an hour. I have to believe that might stop the Varunas from trying to kill you. The Harmac sighed, nodded, and said, You're right, Garin. I can't see that Sergen and his allies have any other choice but to try to finish this. Miria helped Hamel to his feet, and Sarth and Garin shouldered the shield-sworn guard who'd fallen in the chapel. By the dim moonlight— Garin saw that it was the young guard Orndal, the one he'd met with Colton when he first returned to Griffin Watch. The soldier's skin was pale and frigidly cold, but his eyelids flickered when they hoisted him upright and put their shoulders under his arms. Garin nodded toward his right, and the small party set out along the footpath that circled the southern face of Griffin Watch's rocky prominence. In a hundred yards they broke out of the wooded area and emerged in the city streets. Garin detoured a block or two to give the square by the Harmac's foot a wide berth, since he could see soldiers in green and white gathered in a large company by the causeway that climbed to the main gate. Just as well we didn't try to leave by that door, he decided. Even from a distance of several blocks, he could make out the cold and distant cries of the wraiths in the castle, and glimpse ghostly figures swarming over the battlements. The few passers-by they encountered stood in the street and stared up at Griffin Watch, horrified. Once they were safely around the company of Varuna mercenaries watching the main gate, they returned to the Vale Road. Garin's wounds ached fiercely but he set the pain aside as best he could and limped on his way. The Harmac hobbled along on his walking stick, while Miria finally had to pause and gather up Hamel in her arms like a child. "'I protest,' the halfling said. "'No woman as fair and delicate as you should be expected to carry a wounded hero from the field of battle.' Miria snorted. 
Delicate or not, I'd guess that I'm twice your weight, Hamel. It's easier to just carry you. Garin looked over his shoulder constantly for some sign of pursuit, fearing that Sergan's council watch or their Varuna allies would overtake them in the street at any moment. But no more enemies appeared, and the troll and tankard came into view. A large crowd of people stood outside its doors, pointing at the battlements of the castle. From here they seemed to glow with an eldritch green light, and speaking together in low voices. "'Make way!' Garin called. "'We've got wounded with us. Make way!' "'Here, let us lend a hand,' one fellow said. In a moment several Hulbergans took the young guard Orndal from Garin and Sarth. Two more helped Miria with Hamel, and the crowd folded in around them and followed them inside the tavern. In the warm yellow lantern light inside, Garin saw that several dozen militiamen were gathered, helms and spears close to hand. They looked up in surprise as he and his party of survivors entered the brewer's taproom. "'Why, tis Garin Hullmaster,' said one man. "'And the Harmac!' The men and women who had gathered in the tavern quickly climbed to their feet and touched their hands to their brows, bowing to Harmac Grigor. And then the room erupted in a chaotic babble of excited questions. A table was cleared for Orndal, and the young shield-sworn guard was stretched out on it. Hamel was shown to a bench by the wall. "'One side, one side!' the tavern-keeper, Dernan Osting, pushed his way through the crowd gathered around, and bowed to the harmac. "'We saw that some fell magic had stricken Griven Watch, my lord,' he said. We fear that you were dead, or worse. Glad to see you and your kin got out of the castle. Can you tell us what's going on? The king in copper sent his minions to attack Griffin Watch, the old lord said wearily. We escaped through the postern gate, but we found House Varuna armsmen waiting there to cut down anyone trying to flee. Sergen Hullmaster's trying to seize control of Hullberg, Garin added. This is all his doing. He means to kill the Harmag tonight, and all the Hullmasters if he can. Master Osting, can you pass the word to call out the spear meat and muster the companies here? We must protect the Harmag. Osting gaped in amazement. The black-hearted bastard, he finally said. Beckon my lord's pardon for speaking ill of his kin, that is. Of course we'll call out the spear meat. We're all the Harmag's men— no sellswords from Mullmaster are going to kill our lord and call themselves masters of this town. Send word to Rosestone Abbey, too, Miria suggested. The clerics of a monitor might be able to do something about the spirits haunting Griffin Watch. A good idea, Garin agreed. Master Osting, can you see to it? Yes, my lord, the big tavern keeper answered. I'll send one of me lads at once. Garin, I don't know if this is wise, Grigor murmured. Sergan's men are trained warriors, well-armed and armored. Forgive me, Uncle Grigor, but we've got no choice. Sergan and his council have declared war. The spear meets the only army remaining to you. Garin lowered his voice and leaned closer to his uncle's ear. I hope it won't come to that. No mercenary really cares to fight a pitched battle if he can help it. There's little reward in it, and lots of risk. I think the Varuna men and the Council Watch might have a change of heart once they see there's an army to take the field against them, especially one that outnumbers them. I hope you're right, Garin, the Harmac said. A message for the Harmac, called one of the Hulbergans by the tavern's door. Several other voices in the throng took up the call, and Garin looked up from the table as the crowd swirled around a young woman in a tall silver helm. She wore the white surcoat and blue griffin of the shield-sworn, but her coat was splattered with blood and dirt. The commoners crowding around her held her motionless for a moment, and then several of the men nearby her pushed a path clear. "'Make way for the messenger!' they shouted. "'Harmac, Grigor,' the young woman called. "'My lord!' "'Over here,' Grigor answered. He pushed himself to his feet and held his walking-stick up in the air. 
The shield-sworn soldier finally caught sight of him and hurried to his side. "'My lord,' she said, "'I thought to find you in Griffin Watch, but when I passed by on the road, the militiamen outside told me you were here. I have dire news.' The Harmac visibly steeled himself. "'Go on, then,' he said gently. "'Lady Kara's been defeated at the Vatter Knoll Post Tower. The bloody skulls and their monsters overwhelmed the army of Hullberg. Many lives were lost. Lady Kara is retreating down the east bank of the Winterspear, fighting to slow the horde with all her strength. But she told me to tell you that she expects the orcs to reach Hullberg by sunrise.' The young soldier bit her lip, but continued— she recommends that you direct the people of the town to take refuge in Griffin Watch, Dagger Guard, and the best fortified of the merchant compounds, and make the strongest defense you can. She doesn't expect her army to survive the night. The tap room fell silent. Disaster compounds upon disaster tonight, Grigor said quietly. He sank back to the bench with his head in his hands. It seems that Sergan chose the worst possible moment for his treachery. Or the best, Garin said darkly. But perhaps Sergan had not anticipated the ferocity of the approaching horde. It would be more than a little ironic if his cousin managed to dethrone the Harmac just in time to preside over the destruction of the city. More likely, Sergan had simply recognized the Bloody Skull ultimatum as the opportunity to put his plans in motion never imagining that the threat from the north would actually materialize. He looked at the men and women who filled the troll and tankard. Their fierce defiance had vanished in an instant at the news of the defeat. They might succeed in preserving their lives by taking shelter behind strong walls, excluding Griffin Watch for the moment, he reminded himself, but their homes, their workshops, their storehouses, and their livelihoods all lay exposed to destruction. Assuming that the orcs chose not to reduce strongholds like Dagger Guard or the fortified compounds, they'd still be ruined. It would have been wise to wall the city, Harmac Grigor said with a sigh. We always knew this day might come, but now that it's at hand, I wish Doom had chosen some other hour to fall upon us. Wall the city, Garin frowned, thinking furiously. Hullberg had been walled once. In ancient times, when it had been a much larger city, its wall had passed right over the spot where the troll and tankard stood. When the town had been resettled a hundred years ago, his ancestors Angar and Lendon had faced constant orc raids against the fields and farms of the Winterspear Vale. They had raised a simple dike across the vale to protect the closer farms. "'What about Lendon's dike?' he asked aloud. "'If we brought the entire spearmeat there and combined our strength with whatever's left of Kara's army, we might be able to stop the bloody skulls before they sack the town.' "'That's a deadly gamble, my lord,' Dernan Osting said slowly. He whistled between his teeth. "'The dike's not much a defense. "'We'll have a few hours to improve it if we begin right away,' Garin pointed out. "'Yes, it might be safer to find whatever refuge we can now and give up the town, "'but maybe it's not too late to save Hullberg. "'What of the Varuna brigands waiting outside Griffin Watch?' Miria asked. "'What's to be done about them?' Garin frowned. As much as he wanted to use the spear meat to storm the Varuna merchant yards and put an abrupt stop to Sergan's designs, the threat of the bloody skulls simply dwarfed his cousin's treachery. Sergan will have to wait until tomorrow, he finally said. We'll ignore them. They can't do much harm that can't be undone in a few days. The Harmac looked dubious. Yours is a council of desperation, Garin. You know what it is to stake your life on chance, but most of the rest of us do not. It's harder for us than you might think. Garin lowered his voice and leaned close to his uncle. I understand, Uncle Grigor, but consider this. Either we tell our folk to hide in cellars and scatter to the high fells, or we try to fight off the orcs. If we fight and lose, well, how much worse can that be? 
than if we hadn't fought at all. Hullberg sacked and our people enslaved in either case. Will the bloody skulls show us any more mercy if we spare them another battle? We might as well die fighting. Harmac Grigor weighed Garin's words for a long moment. Then, slowly, he stood and turned to face the assembled Hullbergans, crowding the tavern floor. The townsfolk awaited his words in a hushed silence. "'You've all heard what I've heard,' he said. "'We failed to stop the bloody skulls at the head of the Winter Spear. My nephew believes we may have one more chance to break the horde before it drowns Hullberg in fire and steel. I need every last man of the spear meat to march at once for Linden's dyke. If we can hold off the orcs until dawn, then perhaps daylight will show us better reason to hope than we can find tonight. Grigor seemed to stand a little taller, and his voice grew stronger. He struck his cane to the floorboards. I want words sent through all the town, for women, children, the infirm, the elderly, all those who cannot bend a bow or hold a spear, to seek refuge immediately. But tell any man or woman who can carry an axe or a hunting bow to come to Linden's dyke. I don't care whose colors they wear. Garin drew his sword and thrust the point into the air. For Hullberg, he shouted. For the Harmac. Hullberg, the Harmac, a dozen voices shouted in reply. Then a hundred more joined in, until the tavern trembled with the thunder of their shouts. Hullberg, the Harmac. Captains, gather your musters, the Harmac called, his voice carrying through the din. "'Sons and daughters of Hullberg, take up your spears and stand together. We march!' 27. Eleven Tarsak, the Year of the Ageless One The hour after moonset was the worst of the night. Somehow, in the darkness, the small mercenary contingents of House Marstall and the Double Moon Coster— became separated from the rapidly diminishing army of Hullberg and simply vanished into the night. Kara sent her best scouts to find the missing detachments and lead them back to the Vale Road, but she dared not wait for their return. The Red Claw wolf riders snarled and darted at her army's heels at every step, and behind them came the great mass of the Bloody Skull horde. Now that the Bloody Skulls were in the Vale, she had no real hope of stopping them short of Hallberg. All she could do was try to beat the horde to the town and pray that her battered and bloodied soldiers could hold the castles and the fortified merchant compounds. The orcs would tire of their sport and withdraw after a few days, leaving those lucky enough to find shelter behind strong walls and locked gates alive to rebuild but if she allowed the wolf-riders to surround her and bring her to bay, she would not even be able to manage that much. Without her soldiers, Griffin Watch and Dagger Guard would fall, and then nothing at all would be left of Hullberg. "'Stay together, stay in good order,' she called to the weary companies around her. "'If you fall out of ranks, the wolf-riders will have you. They can't drag us down if we stay in ranks and keep to our places as we march.' So many have fallen already, she thought dully. Kara was exhausted herself, bruised and nicked in a dozen places from the furious cavalry skirmishes of the last few hours, but she couldn't allow her soldiers to see her flagging or giving in to despair. She wheeled Dancer around and patted the big mare's neck, studying the dark veil behind her retreating army. Half a dozen fires blazed in the blackness where outlying farms and homesteads had already been overrun by bloodthirsty savages. There will be many more of those before sunrise, she told herself. Her broken companies filed into a narrow cut where the road passed through a belt of beech woods. She peered into the gloom, searching for danger. Her spell-scar changed eyes, so brilliant by daylight, shimmered with the greenish-blue radiance of glacier ice in darkness. She could see as well as a cat by night, 
a small consolation for the havoc the spell plague had wreaked in her. The woods offered little as a place to make a stand, but she had to do something to keep the wolf riders away from her troops. Kara tapped her heels to Dancer's flanks and cantered over to the Ice Hammer Company, her standard bearer and her adjutants following her. The mercenaries trudged along in grim silence in the middle of her force. Kara reined in to walk alongside the rearmost ranks. "'Where's your captain?' she asked the dwarves there. "'I'm here, Lady Hullmaster.' The black-bearded dwarf Kendurkel pushed his way through the marching files of his company. He carried a heavy crossbow over his shoulder and a battle-axe with its haft thrust through his belt, but still he gripped his pipe between his teeth. "'What do you want?' "'We need to teach the goblins not to follow us too closely,' Kara said. "'You've got crossbowmen among your company, "'and most of them are dwarves who can see in the dark better than the rest of us. "'I want you to set up a skirmish line here in these trees "'and greet the goblins with a volley or two when they follow us in here.' "'You're wanting me, lads, to take a turn at rear guard, you mean?' "'Kendurkel frowned. If those wolf riders go round the woods, they'll catch us here neat as you please, and me poor mother won't ever lay eyes on her foolish son again. I'll be waiting with all the riders we have left just on the other side of the woods, Kara answered. If the goblins go around you, we'll hold them off and give you a chance to get clear. Kendurkel looked up at her, taking her measure. "'I don't doubt you'll do as you say, but this sort of extra work ain't in me contract, Lady Hellmaster.' Kara restrained a sudden impulse to simply ride the ice-hammer captain down under her hooves and leaned over her pommel to fix her eyes on the dwarf's face. She lowered her voice even further. "'You may not have noticed, Captain, but this is now a question of survival.' not contracts. If our hodgepodge army breaks apart in the next mile because the wolf riders cut us apart from behind, there's an excellent chance that none of us will reach Hallberg alive. It's in your own best interest to give the goblins a bloody nose or at least make them ride around the woods. The dwarf chewed on the stem of his pipe, staring coldly up at her. Then he sighed and said, "'All right, Lady Hullmaster. We'll do as you ask. This whole business is sour and fast, anyway, so I suppose we ain't got much to lose.' The dwarf turned away and shouted to his mercenaries, "'Ice Hammers, off the road. We're to lay a little ambush right here for any goblins or wargs stupid enough to stick their heads in a noose.' Three good volleys are all we need,' Kara told him. She watched the ice hammers scramble into the woods on each side of the road and left Kendurkel pointing with the stem of his pipe and barking orders to his men. She cantered a couple of hundred yards farther on to the place where the road broke out into open fields again and collected all the cavalry she had left. Two score shield sworn and about twice that number of men and women called out from the various merchant contingents. She sent pickets out to each side to watch for wolf riders coming around the small belt of woods, then settled down to wait. She would have preferred to stay close to the ice hammers, but it was simply too important to make sure that the hundred riders she had at this spot went in the right direction when the enemy appeared. She was afraid that the merchant armsmen would simply ride off for home if she didn't remain to hold them in place. One of the young shields sworn, waiting next to her, Cerise, her standard-bearer, leaned close and asked softly, "'Milady, what's going to become of us? What'll be left of Hullberg when this is all over?' Kara felt the stillness of other riders nearby. They were listening for her answer, too. She considered her words before answering. "'Cerise, I don't know.' she said. But I know that our castles can shelter hundreds of people for a long time. Many others will escape by ship or by the coastal trails. I don't think the orcs can take Griffin Watch without a long siege, and I doubt that they'll have the patience for it. In time, they'll leave, and the town will be ours again. But for now, the longer we hold off the bloody skulls, the more of our people will live. It's not what I would have hoped for, but it's the best we can do. Cerise frowned, but she nodded. 
Thank you, Lady Kara, she said softly. Kara started to say more, but the snarls and howls of wolves came to her ears from the dark woods behind her. Dancers snorted and shifted nervously, as did the other horses. They knew that sound, and they didn't like it. The ranger turned her mount and peered into the gloomy shadows beneath the trees. The woods weren't thick, and she could glimpse a handful of the dwarves as they crouched and waited. "'They're coming through the woods,' she breathed. It was up to the ice hammers now. She heard the snap and thrum of crossbows, then scores of them firing almost as one, followed an instant later by a great chorus of goblin shrieks and wolves yipping in pain. Steady, she told the riders around her. We've got to cover the ice hammers when they break off their fight. Steady, everyone. More crossbows sang in the night, and the chorus of pained cries changed into the ugly, incoherent roar of battle. Hundreds of voices shouting and screaming, some in pain, some in fear, some in anger, some in victory. The deep voices of dwarves, the high, harsh cries of goblins, and the fury of wargs all blended in a long, rolling battle thunder that seemed to echo from the steep hillsides cupping the winter spear veil. It went on and on, much longer than Kara would have imagined, until she found herself leaning forward in her saddle and peering into the woods to see if she could see anything of the fighting a short distance off. But after a time the shouts and ring of steel on steel faded again, and ice hammers began to trot out of the woods, human mercenaries groping through the darkness, dwarves jogging along with slower strides, but a much better sense of where they were headed. Lady Kara, the pickets to the right say that there are goblin scouts on the eastern edge of the woods, one of her adjutants reported. Very well, she answered. She hardly felt as calm as she tried to sound, but that was her duty, to act as if she had expected everything that had happened tonight. She looked at a shield-sworn sergeant nearby. "'Cars, take your troop and the Janarsk men there, and go drive off the scouts. Keep them from coming around the woods for half an hour, and then rejoin the column. If there are too many wolf-riders to handle, use your discretion, but make sure you send word to me.' The sergeant touched his knuckle to his brow. "'Yes, my lady,' he said. He gathered eight of the remaining shield-sworn and a dozen of the Janarsk coster armsmen, and the small band rode off into the night. Kara wondered whether she would see them again. Dancer snorted and stamped suddenly, and Kara saw motion beneath the trees off to her right. The brush thrashed, and an ugly chorus of snarls came to her ears, and then goblin wolf-riders suddenly broke through the tree-line, chasing after the ice-hammers as the mercenaries fell back. "'Take them!' she shouted, standing in her stirrups with her bow in her hand. She drew and fired, drew and fired again, and a goblin and warg went down together, each with an arrow in the throat." Her remaining riders charged at the enormous wolves, lances lowered and sabers high. The overeager goblins wheeled in panic and bounded back for the safety of the woods, but not before more fell under the steel of the shield-sworn and the house mercenaries. Kara shot one more warg through its spine as it leaped away. The monster howled and thrashed into a blackberry thicket, throwing its rider. The goblin dismounted was not much of a threat, but wargs could drag down men or horses. She searched for another target, but decided to save her arrows. She might need them more before the night was out. Several other quick skirmishes broke out along the wood line as wolf riders blundered too close to the soldiers they were hoping to chase down. After a dozen slashing duels of wolf rider and cavalryman, the woods fell silent again. Kara judged that the Red Claws had fallen back to mass for a more deliberate attack. This would be the moment to pull back again. The Ice Hammers were already marching south off the field, falling into ranks as they hurried away. It'll have to be enough, she told herself, praying that she'd bought her ragged army half an hour's lead on the pitiless marauders who followed them. Fall back, she called to the riders nearby. Stay with me. 
Kara cantered a few hundred yards farther down the road, her small company of riders following her standard as best they could. Then she wheeled around again, searching the open space they'd just crossed for any sign of pursuit. If the red claws pressed too close, she'd have to lead her weary riders against them to give the ice hammers time to put another mile under their boots, but for the moment it seemed the wolf riders had learned a little caution. Lady Kara, Cerise called, a rider. Kara looked back over her shoulder and saw a strapping young man with the beginnings of a thick beard approaching. One of the Austings, she thought. His horse was badly blown, trembling with exhaustion, and the young man slid out of the saddle as soon as he saw her. Lady Kara, there you are. I'm Brun Austing, and I've got a message from the Harmac himself. He told me to tell you to gather whatever forces you still got and march at once for Lendon's Dyke. He's bringing the spear meat up from Hullberg, and he plans to make the stand for the city there. Lendon's Dyke? Kara asked sharply. That didn't seem wise to her. It was almost a mile and a half long. Between what was left of her battered army and the spear meat, they simply didn't have the numbers to defend a line of that length. And she doubted that the spear meat could stand up to the bloody skulls for long, wall or no wall. I don't think we can hold it, even with the spear meat. We'd be better off to fall back to the strong points in town. The Harmac said you might say that. He said to tell you that he's had to abandon Griffin Watch. Some sort of terrible ghostly warriors overran the castle earlier tonight, and they're still there. The tavern keeper's son looked around to see who was in earshot and lowered his voice. And House Varuna men were waiting outside to barricade the gates, Lady Kara. Many of the Harmac's folk were killed, but all your kin got out safe. Kara shook her head in denial. This makes no sense. Ghosts in Griffin Watch and the Varuna soldiers barricading them in? Are you sure you've got this message straight from the Harmac? I saw him myself up on the battlements, Lady Kara. Brun Austing shuddered. Spirits are ancient warriors, carrying pale swords and wearing tall helms. The Harmac said he knew it had all sound like madness, but he wanted me to repeat this to you. You've got to bring your army to Lendon's Dyke as quick as you can. He's going to stand and fight there, and he wanted you to watch your back round the Varunas. That's better than a fifth of my army, Kara answered. How was she supposed to pay attention to the battle, no, the retreat, if she was supposed to be on guard against assassination or treachery, too? She looked around to get her bearings in the darkened veil. They'd been fighting and falling back for hours, and with surprise she saw that they were about halfway to Hullberg already. The old earthworks were not more than a couple of miles ahead. They'd be able to reach the dike easily enough, but what then? I've got to speak with him myself, she said aloud. Cerise, go find Captain Ironthane and tell him he's got command of the rear guard until I return. Have Master Austing relay his report to the captain. I'm riding ahead. It isn't safe to ride alone, my lady, one of her adjutants pointed out. Then you, and you, and you, come with me, if you can keep up. Kara pointed at several of the shield-sworn riders nearby and rode off over the darkened fields, cutting cross-country. The Vale Road was full of her soldiers, and she didn't want them to think she was abandoning the field. She hoped that Ken Durkle wouldn't think so either. But so far the dwarf captain had quickly grasped her commands and intentions. He'd understand that she was not leaving them. Kara led her small band through muddy fields, thick with the stubble of last year's planting, until they found an old lane between homesteads that more or less paralleled the Vale Road. She set her spurs to dance her, and let the big mare stretch out her legs on the road, while her guards hurried to keep up with her. The rush of cold night air drove away her weariness. After a good run, she saw a long, straight row of trees rising up across her path, the old burn, long since overgrown with thickets and young trees. Scores of torches and lanterns burned along its length. It seems the spear meets already here, she said to herself. She veered back toward the Vale Road, and in a few more minutes of riding climbed back onto the road a short distance from the place where it cut through the embankment. 
Dozens of men worked furiously to build thorn breaks across the road. Along the earthworks, more Hulbergans worked with axe and hatchet to make the top of the dike defensible. Now that she was closer to the old berm, she saw that the trees and tangled briar patches covering its slopes made it a more formidable obstacle than she remembered. The men and women of the spear meet were felling trees and potting up brush on the north face of the dike to improve it even more. If only she had more archers, she might have a chance to hold it, at least for a little while. There, my lady, one of her riders said to her. He pointed to an improvised banner fluttering in the torchlight, a simple white field with a blue blazon on it. The Harmac. I see it, Kara replied. She rode up to the simple banner, and there she found half a dozen spearmeat captains gathered around Harmac Grigor, along with Master Assayer Dunstromad Goldhead, the Master Mage Ebane Ravenscar, her cousin Garin, and, surprisingly, the tiefling sorcerer Sarth she'd seen by the barrow on the high fells. The world seems to have gone mad tonight, she thought. She leaped down from Dancer's saddle and strode over to the Harmac. She couldn't remember the last time he'd left the city. He stood leaning on his cane, a thin cloak whipping around him in the bitter night. "'My lord Harmac,' she said formally, "'I am here.' Grigor Hullmaster looked around and found a crooked smile of relief. "'Kara, I'm glad to see that you're well,' he said. "'I was afraid for you, my dear.' "'Run Austing said I'm to bring my army here. "'We're on our way. "'You should see my leading companies any time now, "'and my rear guards less than an hour off. "'But, Uncle Grigor, the bloody skulls won't be far behind us. "'Are you sure this is where you want to stand?' "'It's here or nowhere, Kara. the Harmac said. "'Griffin Watch is taken. "'We have no castle to fall back to.' Kara glanced at the other Hullbergans nearby and lowered her voice. "'I heard that ghosts invaded Griffinwatch. Is that true?' Harmac Grigor nodded. "'I'm afraid that it is, and I'm sorry to say that it seems to be your stepbrother's doing. He and his Varuna allies tried to kill us all tonight. If not for the fact that Garin and his friends took it upon themselves to arrange his escape from my prison and rescue me—' I think Sergan would have succeeded. That was the price the king and copper paid for the Infernadex after House Varuna got it for him, Garin explained. He agreed to send his specters to serve when called. It seems Sergan decided to call him tonight. Given the circumstances, I've pardoned Garin of any wrongdoing in his duel with the Varuna captain and in his escape, the Harmac added. And should we run across Sergan again, we must treat him and his Varuna allies as enemies of Hullberg. Kara lowered her voice. The Varunas with my army have done their part so far tonight. They've fought as well as any of us. This makes no sense. Are you saying that they'll turn on us at some point? It'd be wise to expect them to, Garin said. They might be waiting for the right opportunity to show their true colors. The ranger laughed bitterly. Garin, they've had many opportunities for treachery tonight. All they had to do was abandon the field, and we probably would have been destroyed three times over. Sarth cleared his throat. Forgive me for saying so, but the explanation may be quite simple. Perhaps things have not gone as House Varuna planned tonight. After your initial defeat, they may have decided that it would be folly to carry through with their plan in the face of an orc invasion. Kara frowned. She didn't know how the horned man had come to be standing at Garin's side, but she simply did not have time to satisfy her curiosity. With effort, she set aside the questions still dancing in her mind, and focused on the immediate crisis. "'I'll ask for a complete explanation later,' she said. "'Uncle Grigor, I expect the bloody skulls to reach this spot in an hour, perhaps two. I would guess that I'm down to six hundred tired men. Less, if you tell me that the Varunas can't be counted on. How many spear meat do you have with you?' "'Around eight hundred, I think.' Garin answered. 
About half are here already, and the rest are marching up from Hullberg as quickly as they can. She frowned dubiously. Garin saw her skepticism and added, They're not as good as your shield sworn or your mercenaries, but they're fighting with their homes and families at their backs. They'll do better than you might think, Kara. I don't think it will be enough, Kara said. The bloody skulls outnumber us by a margin of at least two to one, maybe closer to three to one. We didn't choose this fight, but it's ours nonetheless, Harmag Grigor told her. Somehow we have to find a way to win it. We simply have no alternative. Now, Kara, given what you've seen so far, what can we do to give ourselves the best chance for success? Kara looked at the old dyke extending off into the darkness to either side. She noticed that a pale gray streak had appeared above the jagged shadows of the hills and peaks of the high fells to the east. Dawn was not far off, if they lasted that long. She thought furiously, considering the problem from every angle while the others waited for her to organize her thoughts. "'We'll need to intersperse the spearmeat and the professional soldiers,' she finally said. "'Alternate a company of militia and a company of shield-sworn or mercenaries to man the top of the dike, and then we'll need to keep most of our cavalry together in reserve behind the dike, so that we can try to seal breaches in our line as they happen.' "'Good,' said Harmac Grigor. "'What else, Kara? She studied the men and women swarming over the dike and sighed. "'I suppose it wouldn't hurt to pray,' she said." 28. Eleven Tarsak, the Year of the Ageless One If Garin was any judge of the weather, the approaching day promised to be bright and cold. The skies were cloudless, but a cold wind gusted and moaned over the vale, making the meager handful of banners and pennants over Hullberg's defenders ruffle and snap. He wished the wind would have chosen a different quarter for the battle to come. It was blowing in the faces of the hundreds of men and women waiting along the top of the dike, and it would hinder what little archery they'd scraped together for the fight. On the other hand, orcs don't care for bright sunlight, Garin reminded himself. The disadvantages of weather seemed equal to both sides. "'When do you think they'll come at us, Garin?' Dernan Osting said quietly. The brewer and his company of spearmeat volunteers lined the top of the dike to each side of Garin. Kara and Harmac Grigor had entrusted Garin with command of the right wing of their small army. Two spearmeat companies, a battered band of shield-sworn, and a motley collection of mercenaries from Marstall, Sokol, and the Double Moon. He needed about three times as many men to properly defend the length of wall he had, but there simply weren't any more to spare. Soon, Dernan, Garin answered. Before the sun comes up, I think, and that's not far off now. The valley floor was a patchwork of gray shadows, growing brighter by the minute. On Garin's end of the line, Lendon's dyke climbed to meet the steep wall on the east side of the Winterspear Vale. From Garin's elevated vantage, he could see the torch-dotted line of the earthworks stretching across the valley floor to the inky shadow of Lake Hull, a mile and a half away under the western margin of the vale. The old dwarf Dunstormed Goldhead and Burkle Tresterfin's Spearmeat Company held the spot where the dike met the lake, strengthened by the Varuna mercenaries. In the center of the line, where the Vale Road pierced the old dike, the Harmax banner fluttered. Kara and most of the shield sworn were there, along with the Ice Hammer mercenaries and the weaker Spearmeat companies. The heaviest blow would fall right in the middle of the line. Garin could see the dark, seething mass of the orc horde gathering only a few hundred yards from the dike. The valley shook with orc shouts and chants. Dozens of massive drums thumped and battled with each other, and the clamor of spears striking shields was overwhelming. Garin looked at the militiamen around him. He saw faces gray with anxiety, knuckles white as they clenched their weapons close. "'Come on, lads,' he shouted to the men nearby. 
Let's make a little noise of our own. Show them that we're still here. He raised a piercing war cry, and the men nearby joined in. Within a few moments the cry spread up and down along the dike, until hundreds of men were shouting together against the orc horde. The orcs were far louder, but Garin kept at it, and he heard the small echo of his warriors' voices rolling back from the hills amid the orc clamor. A vain gesture, Sarth muttered from close by, but a moment later the tiefling joined his voice to Garin's and shouted defiance as well. Vain or not, Garin thought that the men around him looked a little less frightened. Perhaps they felt that way, too. He wished Hamel were at his back, but the halfling hadn't been able to march. Garin had left him at the troll and tankard. The orc chant reached a crescendo, then broke apart into countless individual roars and cries. The front line of the Bloody Skull army surged forward and swept over the unplanted fields toward the dike. Thousands of orc warriors running headlong into battle with axes and spears high. Here they come, Dernan Austin shouted. Get ready for em, lads. They'll no find a weak spot here. Garin drew his sword, weaving spells of ruin on his blade. The elven steel gleamed a deadly silver blue in the gloaming, and he flicked the point from side to side to set the grip in his hand. He hadn't expected the orcs to simply rush the entire line at once. It would have been more effective to concentrate a blow at a single point. Then again, the mass charge would keep him from sending help to any other point of the defenses as long as he was fighting to hold his own position. "'Archers!' he shouted. "'Fire at will!' He had only a few dozen bowmen under his banner, so few that there was little point in trying to volley their fire. Most of the archers had no experience with the tactic. Anyway, they weren't even militiamen, just Hulbergans or foreign laborers who joined the effort to defend the town. Their arrows hissed out over the earthen rampart. Many missed, but as the orcs continued to close, Garin saw a few of the charging warriors stumble and fall. "'Sarth, save your spells for the moment,' Garin told the sorcerer. I want your magic at the point of decision. I understand, Sarth answered. Garin watched the dark tide rushing closer and seized the shoulder of a young spearmeat lad next to him. Get over to the far right and tell whoever's in charge of the Marstals and Sokols to bring all their men here right now. We're going to need them. Go swiftly. The teenager nodded once and bolted off to the east, heading for the handful of mercenary fighters Garin had on that end of his line. Few of the orcs were heading toward the uphill side of the dike. Then he faced the oncoming horde and breathed a few words of warding, preparing for the fight to come. The first of the bloody skulls reached the bottom of the dike. The old earthworks were not more than fifteen feet tall— but heavy brush and small trees grew thickly on the sloping mound. Despite the ferocity of their charge, the orc warriors had a difficult time struggling through the thickets. "'Stay in ranks!' Garin shouted. "'Let them come to you!' A band of orc berserkers bulled their way up the embankment near Garin, and he hurried through the thickets to meet them when they crested the wall. He caught a thick-muscled orc axeman as he scrambled up the slope with a hand on the ground and lunged down to bury his sword-point in the orc's neck. The ape-like warrior bellowed, clapping his hand to the wound, and staggered up to swing at Garin. The sword-mage danced back a few steps, avoiding the orc's wild axe swings until the dying warrior's feet slid out from underneath him, and he fell heavily to the ground. Garin found more orcs swarming up the slope all around him, and for a hundred furious heartbeats he slashed and stabbed, charged and retreated, wielding his blade of elf-wrought steel in a blinding blur of searing blue-white radiance. For Hulberg! For the Harmac! Garin shouted. All around him Hulbergans set their spears in a deadly fence atop the dike, and took a heavy toll on the orcs who recklessly attacked into the teeth of their defenses. They died, too, overwhelmed by the sheer strength and fury of the orc assault. 
near Garen's Banner, Dernan Austin killed three orcs with a two-handed warhammer before several more swarmed over him and hacked him to pieces with their war axes. More spearmeat men fell there, cut down as the bloody skulls scrambled up the suddenly undefended slope. But then the sorcerer Sarth stepped forward and sealed the breach with a devastating blast of fire from his fearsome rod, burning down most of the berserkers. "'To the banner!' the tiefling cried. He held off the orc assault until the mercenaries Garin had summoned from the unengaged end of his line showed up and filled in to take the place of Dernan Osting and the other fallen spearmeat there. A shriek from overhead wrenched Garin's attention from the roaring line of orcs trying to overwhelm the dike. He looked up and saw a huge bat-winged shape swoop low over the line of defenders. It seized a man in its talons and started to beat its way back into the air. Its tail whipped around to sink a long, wicked stinger into the back of another man fighting nearby as the monster flapped away from the dike. The stung man arched in agony and sank to the ground, and the monster dropped its first victim among the seething ranks of orcs pressing close to climb the dike. "'A wyvern, too?' Garin muttered aloud. They hardly needed any more trouble. He hurried after the flying monster, trying to guess where it would swoop next. Sarth conjured a bolt of lightning and blasted half a dozen orcs from the top of the embankment. The brilliant flash of light and deafening thunderclap caught the wyvern's attention. It wheeled in mid-air and fixed its eyes on the sorcerer. The reptilian monster plummeted down at Sarth from directly overhead, deadly sting whipping from side to side behind it. Sarth! Garin shouted, but the sorcerer did not hear him. He was already snarling another spell at more bloody skulls surging up the dike. Garin realized in an instant that even if he caught the sorcerer's attention, the wyvern would still be upon him too quickly to dodge or avoid. There was no time to reach him. Garin seized the flowering symbols of a spell held in his mind and hurled his will behind the arcane words. Syra Lanny, dear Melar, he cried, and in a dizzying eye blink he stood where Sarth had been standing, while the sorcerer stood where he'd been. Sarth reeled and floundered on the slope, but Garin paid him no mind. He was already looking up at the wyvern and hurling down at him. He shouted out a word of shielding, and then the monster was upon him. He slashed it once across its snout leaped aside and blocked the deadly stinger with his shielding spell, and spun around to rake his blade across its wing as it hurtled past him. The wyvern screeched once in rage and tried to beat for altitude again, but it was too fast and too low. Its damaged wing buckled, and the monster cartwheeled across the embankment. For a moment it lay still tangled up in the brush, but then it shook itself and clambered to its clawed feet, glaring at Garin with pure hate. "'I think I just made it angry,' Garin muttered. He put his point between the wyvern and himself and dropped into a fighting crouch, holding his shielding spell firmly in his left hand. The monster charged at him with the speed of a striking snake, far faster than Garin would have imagined. He managed to parry the sting once, then twice, but then the wyvern got its jaws clamped around his right leg and worried him like a dog. It whipped him from side to side and then flung him away. Garin's sword flew from his hand and he hit the ground hard enough that his vision went black for an instant. When he could see again, the wyvern was darting toward him, yellow fangs gleaming. He started to climb to his feet only to find that the world swayed drunkenly when he tried to sit up. The wyvern hissed and sprang at him, but a coruscating green ray struck it in mid-leap and knocked it aside. An instant later, Sarth appeared by Garin's side and shouted another of his spells. A barrage of shrieking purple darts shot from his scepter and pinioned the wyvern to the ground. The monster snapped and snarled at the phantasmal javelins transfixing it, then shuddered and fell still. "'Are you all right?' the tiefling said. "'I think so.' Garin answered him. Sarth reached down and helped him to his feet. The sword mage staggered over to his sword and picked it up. "'I hope there aren't any more of those around.' The tiefling scanned the skies anxiously. 
Thank you, Garen Hallmaster. I did not see the monsters dive, but next time I'll ask you to give me a moment's warning before you teleport me. Garen looked around, trying to get a sense of the battle. He could see several places where the orcs had overwhelmed the dike, and scores of the ferocious warriors fought to widen the breaches and push on past the weakened defenses. Human riders did their best to counter the breaches, as did haphazard bands of the volunteers who had shown up to fight. With lance and bow they held back the black tide, but they were failing fast. Gods, what chaos! It seems... The issue is still in doubt, Sarth replied, an understatement if Garin had ever heard one. Garin spied a large breach less than a hundred yards away. Orcs were fighting their way east and west along the top of the dike, rolling up the defenders still trying to hold back the rest of the attack. There, he said, pointing, try to do something about that, and I'll see what I can do here. The tiefling nodded grimly and leaped into the sky. In a moment he hovered over the orc breakthrough, hurling blasts of fire down on the bloody skull warriors. Garin started to rejoin the fray, but a rider came galloping up from behind Lyndon's dyke. "'Lord Garin! Lord Garin!' the messenger called. "'Lady Kara says to bring any troops you can spare and come to the center at once. She needs help there.' "'Spare? I can't spare any,' Garin replied." The rider was a young shield-sworn, bloodied and disheveled, and he simply stared at Garin in confusion. The sword-mage grimaced and glanced around at his part of the field. Kara wouldn't have asked for help unless she needed it, he told himself. She knew how many soldiers he had on his part of the line. He held up his hand and said to the messenger, "'No, wait. I'll bring as many as I can.' The sword-mage climbed back up to the top of the dike and found the young soldier carrying his banner. "'Shield-sworn, to me,' he shouted. "'Marstall, double-moon, to me. Assemble on the south side of the dike. Spearmeet, House Sokol, stand your ground.' All along the earthen wall, soldiers of Hullberg began to disengage, backing down the dike, while the militiamen on either side spread out to try to cover their absence. It left Garin's line woefully thin. Another concerted attack would certainly punch through, but Garin realized that his hodgepodge force had largely repulsed the first rush of the bloody skulls. The dawn was a thin orange silver clinging to the hilltops of eastern high fells. Sunrise could not be far off now. By the growing light he could see that the embankment was littered with dead or wounded orcs, and that many of the ironclad warriors of the Bloody Skull Horde were shifting across his front, flowing toward the middle of the fight. Garin looked around and found Brun Austing, the son of Durnan, standing by the tattered flag of his spear-meat company. He hurried over to the young brewer and clapped a hand on his shoulder. "'I've got to go help in the center,' he told him. "'I'm leaving you in charge here. You, Spearmeat, have to hold this end of the line on your own. I'll leave you the Sokols to help, and the sorcerer Sarth there. Can you do it?' The young man nodded soberly. "'We don't have much choice, do we? We'll hold the line, or die where we stand, Lord Garin.' "'Good fortune,' Garin said." He squeezed the young man's shoulder, and then hurried down the back of the dike to the spot where his small company was assembling. It was a little less than a hundred strong, and he wondered if it would be enough to make a difference in the heavy fighting in the middle. He took a moment to speak with the Sokol captain, a fierce-looking Termitian woman whose detachment was down to a dozen riders, and point out Brunn to her. Whether she'd follow the brewer's orders, he had no idea, but at least she hadn't ridden away from the battle yet. "'Where to, Lord Garin?' one of the shield-sworn footmen called from the ranks. "'The Vale Road,' Garin called back. "'They need us in the center, lads. Let's go lend them a hand. Follow me.' He set out in an easy jog, holding back his pace so that the soldiers in their heavier armor could keep up. It helped that they were moving downhill and had only five or six hundred yards to travel. Sporadic fighting continued atop the dike a short distance to Garin's right, but he passed no more major breaches. In a few moments they came in sight of the furious melee swirling around the spot where the Vale Road pierced the embankment. 
hundreds of orcs thronged the gap, pushing inward against the thinning line of ice hammers and shield sworn. Garin looked around for Kara's banner, or the Harmac, and saw nothing but pitched battle. He would have liked to know where she wanted his small strike to fall, but one glance was enough to show him that he couldn't wait. Strange, he thought. For all the years I've lived with a sword in my hand, I've never fought in a real battle. Only duels and skirmishes, nothing more than twenty or thirty warriors on a side. After traveling for ten years all over Faerun, I find the biggest battle of my life not three miles from the castle where I was born. The men behind him said nothing, staring at the scene in nervous silence. Garin shook himself free of his weary musings and tried to think quickly and well about what he could see in front of him. He had little gift for strategy, so he tried to see the battle as a duel of sorts. The orc spearhead had pushed deep into the center like a reckless and powerful lunge at the center of an opponent's torso. If someone came at him with an attack like that, what would he do? I wouldn't try to stop it, he murmured to himself. I'd deflect the point, let it go past me, and then strike at my foe's hand. That suggested a strike not at the tip of the spear, but back a little farther. Garin looked back toward the gap in the embankment and saw that a few Hulbergen soldiers still fought along the dike to each side of the breach. If he moved along the inside of the dike and hit the orcs on their flank, perhaps he'd succeed in knocking their thrust aside. He drew his sword and signaled to the men following him. "'After me, lads!' he cried. "'We're going to cut them off and trap them inside our lines.' Then Garin shouted a battle cry and ran ahead of his hodgepodge company, leading them under the cover of the old dike. He heard a ragged chorus of roars and cries behind him. Both orcs and human soldiers looked around in his direction. But Garin didn't slow his steps. Instead, he cried out the words of a spell to set his sword aflame with a brilliant white light, and he hurled himself into the torrent of orc warriors pushing their way through the low defile. He cut his way through three or four bloody skulls before they even realized their danger, and then the mass of the shield-sworn and mercenaries behind him drove into the orcs with an audible shock that seemed to shiver the icy morning air. Garin cut and stabbed with every ounce of skill and lethal purpose he could dredge up, from his boyhood exercises to the long years of study with Mithdranner's fabled blade-singers. He threw spells where he could, searing his foes with bursts of golden fire, dazzling and disorienting them with deadly enchantments that stupefied thick-thewed berserkers until elven steel drove through flesh and bone and his small, battered company fought like lions in the narrow gap of the Vale Road. They carried the open breach with the force of their charge. Garin looked up to see Kara dashing through the melee on her fine white charger, plying her deadly bow at a full gallop. She shot down an orc that he was about to engage, and felled another one who was trying to beat his way through a shield-sworn's guard not ten feet away. "'For Harmac and Hulberg!' she shouted." The sword-mage whirled where he stood, searching for more foes to engage. To his amazement, he realized that the bloody skulls who'd forced their way through the gap in the dike had melted away. Dozens of duels and skirmishes continued around him, but the first great thrust was spent. The warriors of Hullberg had held the Vale Road, at least for the moment. "'They're falling back,' Garin called to his cousin. "'Not for long,' Kara answered. She pointed toward the north, out to the fields beyond the dike. Garin followed the point of her sword, and his heart sank. A few hundred yards away, around the great black banners at the center of the Bloody Skull Horde, hundreds of orc warriors stamped and shouted and struck their spears to their shields. An armored wedge of lumbering ogres stood at their head, bellowing their crude challenges. Kara's eyes glowed with their uncanny blue fire, smoldering in the shadows of her helm. That was only the first attack. The next one's gathering already. Garin shook the blood off his blade and turned to face the ogres and orcs streaming back into the fight. He readied himself to sell his life as dearly as he could, and then a thin, cold breath of wind suddenly stirred the ground around him. 
turning the wet grass white with hoar-frost. Sinister voices whispered dark things on the wind, and a sense of icy dread clutched at his heart like a murderer's hand. He shivered and faltered back several steps. The rosy glow of sunrise faded to dull gray, and streamers of pale fog seemed to coalesce from the very air, darkening the dawn. Stout-hearted dwarves groaned in fear and hid their faces, while men who had fought valiantly for hours let their futile blades slip from nerveless fingers. Even the bloodthirsty orcs pouring across the fields slowed and stopped, halting well short of the sinister fog. A dull scraping caught his attention, and Garin looked down at the black earth under his feet. Dirt buckled upward, stirred from beneath. Then a skeletal hand thrust up into the chill, deadly mists of the morning. He backed away from it, only to find another bony hand clutching at his heels. He kicked his foot free with a sudden burst of panic. Scores of the things, dirt-encrusted skeletons still draped in the rusted remnants of ancient armor, were dragging themselves up out of the ground. "'What foul necromancy is this?' Kara snarled into the freezing fog. Her horse Dancer shied away in panic, her eyes rolling. The ranger threw a panicked look in Garin's direction. "'We can't fight the undead and the orcs at the same time.' "'This is Sergan's doing,' Garin snarled. The rogue Hullmaster's undead allies had failed to kill the Harmac at Griffin Watch, so now he was trying again. And that meant that his cousin had to be somewhere near, since Isperus had said that the wielder of the amulet could not send the Lich's minions far. Garin wondered if Sergan's House Varuna allies were making their move as well. Doubtless Sergan would order the undead to spare the Varunas, but the rest of the Hulbergen army was in dire peril. "'Stand your ground as long as you can, and protect the Harmac,' he called to Kara. "'I have to find Sergan before the dead overwhelm us all.' Turning his back on the skeletal ranks, assembling themselves before the defenders of Hulberg, Garin sheathed his blade and ran into the frigid mists." Twenty nine. Eleven Tarsak, the year of the Ageless One. Garin loped through the unnatural murk as night seemed to descend over the vale a second time. The eerie fog thickened by the heartbeat, closing in around him like a tomb of cold gray stone. It felt as if he were blundering through a damp gray vault, a spectral dungeon that was slowly becoming more substantial more threatening with every passing moment. Soldiers appeared like ghosts in the mist, dark forms that drifted past or simply stood where they were, shivering in terror. He almost ran onto the spear point of a shambling skeleton draped in the remains of a lord's robes, and he retreated quickly from a pair of ancient berserkers whose jawbones hung open in silent howls of battle madness and rage. All around him in the mist. He heard the battle resume in a dozen places at once, but instead of the bellowing of ogres and the war cries of bloodthirsty orcs, he heard only the whispering of dry, dead voices and the shrieks of human pain and terror. In the frost heavy mists, sounds seemed distant and uncertain. Garin couldn't really tell if he was moving away from the fight or circling around to stumble into it again. Why didn't I make sure of Sergan when I had the chance? he berated himself. Perhaps Sergan's mercenaries would have cut him down if he'd paused for the moment necessary to administer a killing blow. But it might have been worth his life to make sure that the traitor didn't survive to summon more undead. Garin came to a low rise and scrambled to the top of a frost-slick knoll, hoping to get above the dense fog. From the top of the little hill, he thought that the fog directly overhead looked noticeably brighter, but he could see little else. He turned in a circle, searching for any sign of his cousin. Think, Garin, think, he admonished himself. Sergan was wounded, and likely not interested in getting any closer to the fighting against the bloody skulls than he had to. 
he'd be somewhere on the south side of the old dike, and well back from the battle, probably somewhere near the Varunas. House Varuna was over on the left flank of the line by Lake Hull, anchoring the western end of Lendon's dike. He caught sight of a war horse standing over its fallen rider, a young cavalryman of House Sokol. Garin hurried to the animal and caught its reins. The horse wickered and shied away, but Garin patted its muzzle to calm it, whispered a few words in Elvish, and then swung himself up into the saddle. His new mount snorted and pranced nervously, but he set his heels to its flanks and kicked it into a run. Fortunately, the horse was well-trained and eager for a rider to guide it. Its hooves kicked up wet clods of turf as it cantered across the muddy fields. A skeleton carrying a round bronze shield suddenly lurched into his path, its rusted sword ready to strike. Garin swept out his own blade and parried the ancient iron. A jolt of frozen fire ran up his sword arm from the impact, but he circled his point underneath the skeleton's blade and rammed it home in the creature's empty eye socket. Shards of bone burst from the back of the skull, and the thing staggered back. Garin wrenched his sword free and rode past. When he glanced over his shoulder— the skeleton was moving away to find another foe to fight, seemingly untroubled by the horrible wound he'd just dealt it. Necromantic magic knitted its dead sinews and yellowed bones together. What was a sword wound to such a creature? Garin dodged away from several more encounters with the skeletal warriors. On one occasion he spurred his mount right over a skeleton in front of him— the war-horse knocked the horrid thing to the ground, crushing bones beneath its heavy iron-shod hooves, and that one did not rise again. Then he seemed to break out of the heaviest mist and found himself a few hundred yards west of the Vale Road, a short distance behind the old dike. The supernatural chill of the fog diminished a little, and he could see more of the sky graying overhead. The day would have been clear and cold though he doubted it would have much power over the fell mists. On that end of the line, battered spear-meat companies still held the dike, with a number of Varuna footmen stiffening their lines. More than a few men were gazing nervously toward the middle of the battlefield. Garin glanced back the way he had come, and saw that the fog darkened over the center of the field like a stationary storm. Weirdly still— despite the strong, cold wind that swept the rest of the battlefield. A short distance behind the line on the dike, thirty Varuna horsemen and a handful of shield-sworn riders formed the left wing's cavalry reserve. They sat waiting on their mounts. The orc assault seemed to have retreated for now, likely because the bloody skulls were waiting to see if the army of Hallberg would still be standing against them once the evil mists lifted. Garin couldn't fault the orc's instincts. If some supernatural horror was cutting its way through your enemy's ranks, then there was little reason to rush back to close quarters. He wheeled his mount around, looking for Sergen, and then he found him his step-cousin and a quartet of council-watch guards, sat on riding horses under a stand of hemlocks, perhaps a hundred yards away, partially hidden by the ragged tatters of mist that streamed by. It was difficult for Garin to tell what the traitor was doing, given the distance and the poor visibility, but he could see several Varuna officers in their tabards of green and white speaking with him. As the sword-mage watched, the Varuna men turned their mounts and cantered away, heading back toward their troops. "'What did you tell them, Sergen? Garin muttered aloud. "'Abandon the field? Turn against the shield-sworn? Or wait and do nothing until the battle is lost?' With no firm intentions in mind, other than to make sure that Sergen didn't get away with whatever he hoped to get away with— Garin tapped his heels to his horse's flanks and broke into a canter, heading for Sergen and his guards. The wet ground and blowing mist muffled the hoofbeats of his mount, and the air grew steadily colder and more still as he drew closer. Sergen wasn't looking at Garin. 
He was leaning forward in his saddle, looking out over the battle as scattered bands of desperate soldiers struggled to drive off the deathless warriors of the king in copper. The fighting was fiercest around the banner of the Harmac, where better than a hundred soldiers stood together against a ragged wave of skeletons who rose up out of the ground and attacked just as quickly as they were killed or disabled by the soldiers fighting to protect the ruler of Holberg. Garin couldn't see his uncle, not through the chaos and the murk, but he caught a glimpse of Kara on her fine white charger in the thick of the melee. Sergen was still unaware of Garin's approach, and now the sword mage was only thirty yards away. Distantly, the sword mage noted that the Varuna officers, riding back to their troops, had caught sight of him. They wheeled and galloped to intercept him, but a desperate plan finally coalesced in Garin's mind, and he spurred his mount into a headlong charge. He had little magic left after the furious skirmish at the Vale Road's cut, but he still had a few words he could call upon. It would have to be enough. He stood up in his stirrups, sword bared in his hand. "'Lord Sergan!' the Varuna officer shouted. "'Behind you!' The council guard, closest to Garin, turned at the warning. The guard snapped down his visor and drew his sword, shouting something to the men around him. Even as Sergan looked around and the other guards began to turn their mounts to meet Garin's attack— the sword mage raced up alongside the first guard's mount and lashed out with his back sword. Bright steel glittered in the cold mist, shrilly clanging twice as Garin beat his way through the man's guard. He disabled the fellow with a backhand flick of the point that creased its way through the guard's visor. The man cried out and crumpled forward in the saddle, holding his hand to his face. Garin's horse shouldered the guard's mount out of the way, and he drove at his treacherous cousin. Sergen, he snarled. "'To me! To me!' Sergen shouted at his mercenaries. Garin ignored them. Sergen reached awkwardly for the sword at his hip with his unwounded arm, but Garin didn't give him a chance to draw it. With a wordless roar of anger, he hurled himself out of the saddle and tackled Sergen, carrying his step-cousin to the muddy ground underfoot. The impact knocked Garin's breath away, but Sergen cried out sharply as his damaged arm hit the ground. Their momentum rolled them over and over, Garin holding his step-cousin with a grip of iron. "'You fool!' Sergen hissed between his teeth. "'You've interfered with my business for the last time, Garin. I swear that I'll see you dead before this is done.' "'Then you should have killed me when you had me helpless in a cell,' Garin answered. Sergen reached for a dagger with his good hand, but Garin got on top of him and delivered two sharp punches to the jaw before he had to duck under a sword swing from one of the council guards.' He rolled again to put Sergen on top, using the Lord as a shield against his own bodyguards, and then their struggle tumbled them both into the shallow ditch beside the Vale Road. Sergen managed to wrench his jacket free and threw himself away from Garin, gaining an arm's length of clear space. He rolled to his knees and floundered up out of the ditch. "'I won't make that mistake again!' he snarled at Garin. He motioned for his guards, who rushed to his aid. Garin scrambled to his feet and retreated a few steps from the grim mercenaries closing in around him. Then he raised his hand and showed Sergen the amulet of Isperus, which he'd wrenched away from his cousin during their brief struggle. The old copper amulet glinted in the dim light. "'I think you've caused enough trouble with this for now, Sergen,' he said. Sergen's hand flew to his chest, and he looked down in horror. When he looked up again, his dark eyes blazed in fury. "'Kill him!' he shouted to his guards. "'Kill him now!' Garin glanced around and summoned up what little magic he had left unspent. Syrok, he shouted. Sergen's guards thrust their blades through empty air where he'd been standing an instant before, and the teleport spell whisked him a hundred yards away in the blink of an eye. He found himself standing close to the Harmax banner, surrounded by shield-sworn who fought desperately against the tide of skeletal warriors. Garin thrust his hand into the air, holding the amulet aloft, and shouted, "'Warriors of Isperus, halt! I command you!' All around him, 
Skeletons abruptly stopped moving. More than a few Hulbergans smashed their axes and swords into skeletal warriors who now stood still. Some of those fell while others suffered the injuries without response, standing motionless. The humans and dwarves out on the field raised a ragged cheer of astonishment and exultation, amazed to find their attackers immobilized. "'I'll be damned,' Garin said softly. "'It worked!' He felt the empty eyes of the dead warriors settling on him, and the cold whispers in the air seemed to grow stronger, more sinister. He shuddered. If he was going to command these fell creatures, better to do it now before he lost his nerve. Warriors of Isperus, listen to me. You are to attack and destroy the Bloody Skull orcs and their allies. Ignore all who are defending Hulberg. Do you understand me? The ranks of skeletal warriors seemed to shiver, and the dead ones backed away from their former adversaries and turned to face north. I... We understand thee, they answered in their cold, rasping voices. We go to do thy bidding. Then they began to march away from the battered bands of humans and dwarves they'd been fighting just a moment ago. Old bones clicking like insects, rusted mail squealing and clinking. The defenders of Hullberg raised a ragged volley of shouts, cries of relief, and calls for help, hundreds of voices babbling once. Several of the men standing near Garin grinned at him and stepped close to slap his back and seize his hand. Then a signal horn blew twice above the din. Garin turned and saw Kara lowering the horn. "'Back to the dike top!' she shouted. "'Reform ranks across the road. We aren't done yet!' Garin looked back at the stand of trees where he'd met Sergan, just visible through the mists. His cousin climbed up into the saddle of his black destrier and glared at Gurgen's direction, though the sword-mage doubted that Sergan could actually pick him out in the middle of the warriors around the Harmac's banner. Then Sergan spurred his horse and galloped away to the south, fleeing back toward Hullberg with his guards following. A moment later... The House Varuna soldiers on the left side of the line stepped back from the dike, turned toward the south, and began to march away as well, leaving the battle behind. Garin was sorely tempted to call back some of Iceberus's skeletons in order to send them after Sergan and the Varunas, but he had no idea how strong a hold he really had over the undead warriors or how much they could hurt the bloody skulls. "'Let them go for now, Garin.' Harmac Grigor limped up and set a hand on Garin's shoulder, following Garin's gaze with his own. The old lord looked pale and haggard, but a spark of defiance animated his features. At the moment, I'd just as soon let a potential adversary leave the field if he has a mind to. We must concentrate on repelling the bloody skulls before we pick another fight. Grigor watched the Varunas leave and sighed. Whatever else happens today, Sergan and House Varuna are finished in Hullberg. I know it, Uncle, Garin answered. But I'm afraid of the mischief Sergan might do before he knows it, too. Grigor nodded. I am as well. But as Kara said, we aren't done yet here. How did you gain control of the Lich King's warriors? Garin showed him the amulet. I took this from Sergan. It's the amulet Isperus gave to the Varunas in payment for the book he sought. The mist around him was noticeably lightening now, though he could still hear, echoing through the fog, the roars of orc warriors, the shrill ring of steel on steel, and the fearful bellows of dim-witted ogres. I don't know how many warriors it summons or how long they'll remain. I suppose we'll find out, the old lord smiled. "'Well done, Garin!' The sword-mage gripped his uncle's shoulder, then stepped clear. He held out his empty hand and half-closed his eyes, groping through his mind for the arcane symbols he needed for the spell of returning. "'Quilla, dear!' he whispered, and a moment later his Mithranan blade came hurtling through the unnatural mist to meet his hand. He dropped it when he threw Sergan off his horse, and it was far too valuable a weapon to leave on the battlefield. 
With his sword in one hand and the amulet in the other, Garin hurried to the old dike and scrambled to the top to see what was going on in the orc ranks. The cacophony of battle was tremendous, an awful mix of hundreds of savage voices, fell magic, roaring monsters, and more. The eerie fog was too dense for him to see well, but he caught glimpses of fighting, a bow-shot north of the overgrown dike. The orcs were fierce and brave fighters, but even their most bloodthirsty berserkers had little stomach for a battle against an enemy who shrugged off all but the most powerful of blows, and simply climbed back to his feet when he was struck to the ground. All around him the surviving shield-sworn and iron-hammers peered into the mists, trying to judge for themselves how the fighting went, with a curious mix of relief that they were out of it for the moment and dread of the allies that had turned to their side. Garin watched for what seemed a long time in the bitter cold. Then he noticed that the amulet in his hand was growing warm. He looked down in surprise and saw that a bright orange gleam had appeared on the ancient copper. "'What in the world?' he murmured. The gray mists cloaking the battlefield took on an orange hue and began to thin— the clash of arms from the orc lines faded sharply, and suddenly the morning was full of the orcish shouts of triumph. As the sun finally climbed above the ragged hills, fencing the winter spear veil, the ancient amulet quietly crumbled into dust, and the skeletal warriors sank back into the ground. Garin! The skeletons! Kara called. He looked over at her helplessly. It's sunrise, he told her. Isperus must have promised them for only one night. She nodded once, and her azure eyes flashed in the morning light. Stand to your arms, she ordered the shield sworn. Then she lowered her helm's visor, slid down from Dancer's back, and sent the horse toward the rear with a slap to its rump, taking up her position at the head of the footman guarding the open spot where the veil road pierced the dike. Stand to! The unnatural mists cleared just as quickly as they had come, dissipating like dark dreams forgotten in the morning light. The day brightened swiftly, as if the supernatural fog had never been. Now Garin finally got a good look at the orc horde that faced Hullberg. He could see hundreds of orcs lying dead in the disordered battle lines left behind by the skeleton's attack. The ancient warriors had dealt a heavy blow to the bloody skulls, but— hadn't defeated them. The orcs looked around as well, and saw that their supernatural foes were gone, but that the dike was still held against them. And they began to surge forward in wrath, perhaps mistakenly believing that it was some ploy of the Harmax that had sent the skeletons of the fallen at them. "'Stand your ground!' Kara shouted, and dozens of captains and sergeants took up the cry and relayed it down the lines." Grim-faced and determined, the defenders of Hullberg set spears in the ground and held blades and bows at the ready. Then, with a wild chorus of roars, battle cries, curses, and shrill war screams, the warriors of Thar hurled themselves upon Hullberg's defenders once again. "'Mages and archers, fire at will!' Kara shouted. In answer— Shrieking missiles of wizard's fire, dark flights of arrows, and brilliant bolts of lightning burned awful swaths of devastation through the onrushing warriors. Garin saw that Kara had gathered most of the merchant company, wands for hire at her command, around the gap of the Vale Road, and the mercenary mages took a heavy toll of the attacking orcs and ogres but other spells flew as well, dripping spheres of acid that arced from the back ranks of the orc lines to splatter against the old earthen dike, and black clouds full of whirling red cinders that seared and scoured anything they touched. Garin shielded himself from a fierce cinder storm with a word of warding, throwing his arm over his eyes and slashing his sword back and forth to drive away the burning sparks. Searing pinpricks announced places where the burning embers had found their way through his defenses. He hissed and brushed one from his shoulder, nostrils burning with the hot, acrid stink. Where in the nine hells did the orcs find wizards to aid them? he demanded. 
No one nearby heard him, for they were swearing or praying or shouting in anger or pain at the same time. The bloody skull horde smashed into the failing line of Hulberg's defenders like a mighty black-armored fist. Garin fought in a bright frenzy, determined to stand his ground, but the rush was irresistible. He was swept back twenty yards in twenty heartbeats, simply carried along in the orc charge, even as he slashed at the warriors streaming toward him. Then the whole roaring wave of savages seemed to shudder and slam to a stop. Across the breach, the iron hammer dwarves and Kara's shield sworn linked their shields together in a fortress of steel and determination, refusing to give any more ground. The bloody skull charge became a furious melee that roiled and surged within the breach, a storm tide hammering into a battered coast. Rage though they might, for the moment the orcs and ogres were contained, funneled into the narrow space of the road and its gap. In the crowded field, human mages and orc shamans did terrible work. Furnace blasts of yellow glowing sparks and seething clouds of green poisonous vapor washed back and forth among the combatants. A brilliant sphere of crimson light hurtled at Garin and exploded nearby sending stabbing bolts of red lightning through a band of iron hammers and shield sworn struggling to hold the gap. The sword mage deflected the vicious spell with his enchanted blade, but dwarves and humans all around him fell writhing to the ground. He whirled from side to side, wildly searching for some glimpse of the enemy spellcasters amid the chaos and confusion of the fight— and then he spotted a tall human in black armor wearing a horned black helm. A warlock knight, Garin said softly. That explained much. Orcs had little talent for sorcery. But the masters of Vasa were formidable magic users. Did they incite the bloody skulls against us? The sword mage wondered. Or did they come in answer to the bloody skulls' promises of loot? Either way. The Vassan mage was a dangerous enemy, shielding the bloody skulls from the spells of Hulberg's defenders and burning down soldier after soldier with cold, inhuman efficiency. Several black-armored Vassan soldiers stood near their master, guarding him against the fray. Garin frowned. The soldiers would be skillful swordsmen, hand-picked as bodyguards. He'd have a hard time getting to the warlock knight, as long as the swordsmen were on their guard, and he simply didn't have any more spells or arcane words left to him that could overwhelm them quickly. A bolt of crimson lightning struck the knot of Vassens from the side, tearing through the swordsmen. The warlock knight parried the spell with an arcane defense of his own, but several of his guards were down, smoke rising from their burned armor. Garin glanced to his right, and saw the tiefling Sarth leading a counterattack from that side of the line. The sorcerer threw bolts of fire and blasts of thunder with reckless abandon, burning down the bloody skulls. "'Back to Thar with you, vile ones!' he shouted between spells. "'There is no victory here for you today!' It was just the opportunity he was looking for. While the Fossens turned their attention to Sarth and his barrage of spells, Garin scrambled across the blackened overgrowth and embers of the dyke's face, dodging past battling orcs and hulbergans. He reached the Vossens and cut down one of the mage's bodyguards with a single thrust between the shoulder blades. His old mentor, Dariad, would not have approved, but this was no contest of skill and honor. This was a fight for survival. The Vossen mage blasted Sarth off his feet with a spell that made the ground under the tiefling's feet slam upward, as if struck from below by the hammer of some subterranean titan. Then he glanced over his shoulder and saw Garin lunging at him. The warlock knight snarled an arcane word and threw up a shield of dazzling blue light that stopped Garin's point as firmly as if he'd tried to drive his sword into a granite wall. Then he leveled his staff at Garin and hurled an unseen thunderclap back at the sword mage, but Garin deflected the blast with a word in elvish and a flick of his sword point. "'You follow the elven ways,' the mage snarled in frustration. 
Garin did not reply, but instead attacked again, trying to find his way around the Vossen's magical defense. His enchanted blade rang and shivered as he struck at the edges of the glowing blue haze, protecting the warlock knight. He managed to slip the point around the edge and give the Vossen a nasty cut to the meat of his left arm. The mage cursed in pain and jumped back a step, but he missed his footing and tumbled down the earthwork, rolling to the foot of the hill. Garin started after him, but several rampaging ogres suddenly swarmed up the embankment in front of him, momentarily hiding the Vassen mage from him. Garin evaded them, but when he looked again, the Vassen was gone. He'd fled the scene, or simply been swept away in the tide of battle. The orcs around him raised a ferocious cheer, and Garin looked up. A large banner waved in the air nearby, a square of mustard yellow marked with the image of a crimson, dripping skull. Below the banner he saw a knot of big orc warriors, dressed in fine black mail, each with a painted skull over the heart. And in the center, an orc who wore armor of black plate. That must be Murren, Garin realized. The chief of the Bloody Skulls must have tired of watching his assault stall on the tangled embankment of Lendon's dyke. He meant to lead his warriors to victory. The sword mage ran over to the human soldiers nearest him, a number of battered and exhausted shield sworn. The soldiers of Hullberg had nothing left to give, but he had to ask it of them anyway. The banner, he shouted to them. We're going to take the banner. Follow me, lads. The shield-sworn soldiers raised a strong cry and surged toward the orc banner, sliding down the embankment after Garin. A huge, grossly fat ogre strode up to meet him and smashed a hammer with a head the size of an ale-barrel down at him. But Garin leaped aside. The monster raised its mighty weapon for another swing, but the sword-mage darted in close to its crooked legs and sliced out its hamstring with one long cut. The creature bellowed and fell, its arms flailing, but Garin pressed forward. "'To me!' he shouted. A few yards away he heard another rallying cry. Kara darted into the fray from the other side, cutting her way closer to the banner at the head of another small band of Hulbergans. She had her bow in hand, and its deadly song floated over the roars and shouts of the fighting. She shot down two of the warlord's skull guards, each with an arrow in the heart, and then retreated before a sudden rush from the others, allowing her soldiers to meet them blade to blade. A moment later she threaded her way back into the fight and shot again, killing the orc who carried the standard. The banner wavered and began to fall before another of the skull guards seized it from its dying bearer and raised it aloft again. "'Halberg is mine, you spell-scarred slut!' Murren roared. "'You defy me for the last time!' He leaped for Kara with a heavy fighting spear in hand. She calmly knocked her arrow and drew, taking aim at the eye-slit of his visor only to be roughly jostled aside at the last moment by one of the skull guards, who smashed his shield-sworn foe out of the way and nearly took her arm off at the shoulder with his whistling axe. Kara jumped back and stumbled to the ground. Murren roared in triumph and raised his spear for the killing thrust, but then Garin shouldered his way past the skull guard in his way and leaped at the warlord. Murren whirled with cat-like speed to meet Garin's attack, catching the sword-stroke on his shield and responding with a furious fusillade of overhand spear-thrusts, stabbing again and again for Garin's heart. The sword-mage parried the first, twisted away from the second, parried the third, but then Murren stepped close and slammed his shield into Garin's right side. The warlord had a small spike on the boss of the shield, and it punched a deep wound in Garin's shoulder. Garin staggered back, losing his blade from fingers that suddenly went weak as water, and he gasped desperately for breath. "'So much for Halberg's champions!' the warlord gloated. He lunged for Garin's belly, and the sword-mage twisted aside once more and caught the spear-shaft just behind the head with his left hand. Murren bared his fangs and tried to wrench his weapon back, but Garin kept on his feet and followed Murren around, staying away from the shield-spike and the spear-head both. 
The orc warlord was as strong as an ox, and he was much fresher than Garin. He was going to get his weapon back, and soon. In desperation, Garin released the spearhead and used the heel of his left hand to strike a sudden blow up at the bottom of the half-orc's helm. The visor jammed up a couple of inches and momentarily covered Murren's eyes, blinding him so that Garin could leap free, but not before a wild slash with the heavy war spear laid open his right thigh. "'Damn you!' Murren snarled in rage. He reached up to pull his visor back into place, and Kara's bow sang again. The visor Garin had knocked two inches out of place had given her the mark she needed. Her arrow took Murren just under the line of his jaw, plunging through his throat to pierce the back of his neck. The warlord gaped silently, dark blood foaming over his chin. He fumbled at the arrow, and then he sank to the ground and fell still. "'The warlord has fallen!' one of the skull guards cried out in Orcish. Murren is dead. The orcs nearby turned to look, disengaging from scores of personal duels, and an eerie hush descended over the battlefield around the fallen war chief, a hush that slowly spread as news of Murren's death spread through the horde. All along the dike, the orcs and their allies slowed their surge, looking uncertainly toward the center where their king's banner no longer flew. Two of the remaining skull guards stooped by Murren's body and hoisted the fallen chief up on their shoulders. More orcs came to help carry him, and the small knot of warriors retreated from the breach. Garin, Kara, and the shield sworn standing close backed off slowly and let the orcs carry away their chief. More of the bloody skulls to each side began to disengage, glaring at the defenders of Hullberg and shaking their spears in anger. Hundreds of bloody skull warriors lay at the foot of the dike or strewn through the gap of the Vale Road, far more than Garin had thought. Between the first attempt to storm the dike, the assault of the undead warriors, and the second attack against the dike, the bloody skulls had paid a terrible cost in blood. In the distance, behind the orc lines, he saw a dozen black-clad horsemen clambering into their saddles, more of the Vassans. They surveyed the field for a short time, and then turned and rode off to the north. He realized that he was still standing unarmed, and retrieved his sword, picking it up with his left hand. He could still fight if he had to, but not very well. He took a deep breath and glanced over at Kara. "'Should we attack the orcs while they're leaderless?' "'With what?' she replied. "'If we have a third of our strength left, I'd be surprised. "'No, I think it best to hold our ground for a while "'and see what the bloody skulls do. "'If Murren doesn't have a clear successor, "'they'll be fighting each other soon enough.' "'Garin shook his head, suddenly amazed "'to find himself alive and still on his feet.' Blood streamed down his right arm from his wounded shoulder, and he realized that the slash across his thigh was bleeding as well. "'Then I guess the battle is over,' he said. 30. To Myrtle, the Year of the Ageless One the rumble of distant thunder rolled over the misty green peaks of the high fells as a springtime storm drifted eastward past the harbor of Hullberg. It was raining, but it was a soft, cool drizzle, not the icy downpours of Tarsak or Chess. The magnificent arches that graced the southeast side of the harbor glimmered white in a dazzling sunbreak only a mile away. It seemed a good omen to Garin. He looked up at the skies and said, "'You'll have fair weather for your crossing, Hamel,' the halfling grimaced. "'I think I'm owed it,' he answered. He no longer wore his arm in a sling, and he walked with only the trace of a limp from the wound he'd taken in the fight by the postern gate. "'To be perfectly honest, I'd rather ride around the moon sea than cross it. "'It's at least six or seven hundred miles out of your way.' Kara said with a smile. She'd come down to the harbor to see Hamel off, despite her many duties as commander of what was left of the shield-sworn. 
She wasn't the only one. Miria and her daughter, Salsha, were there to say their goodbyes, too. And, of course, Natali and Kerr had insisted on escorting Hamel to his ship. The ranger rested a hand on Natali's shoulder and smiled at Hamel. Most of that's impassable mountains and trackless wilderness, filled with hungry monsters. Are you certain you'd like to go that way? Hamel made a show of thinking over his answer for a long time. No, I suppose not, he finally sighed. Better the sea I know than the mountains I don't. Besides, if I take too long getting back to Tantras, the double moons or Sokols or Marstols will gobble up all of Varuna's leavings before the red sails can stake a claim. Don't be worried about that, Garuna replied. My uncle's already promised the red sails the best of the Varuna docks and storehouses. House Varuna, of course, was no longer welcome in Hullberg. After their role in the attack against Griffin Watch, an accusation that Darcy Varuna had vehemently denied, though she had no answer to the charges that her mercenaries had dealt with the king in copper, or abandoned the field during the Battle of Lendon's Dyke. The Varunas had holed up in their fortified compounds for three days, before it became obvious to Darcy that she and her clerks, servants, and sellswords would be burned out by a Hulbergan mob if they remained. In the dark hour before dawn, the Varunas had boarded their ships and slipped away to Mullmaster, abandoning their holdings throughout the Harmac's domain. Harmac Grigor had already revoked their concessions and leases anyway, and the Merchant Council had chosen not to lodge any protests on Varuna's account. A wise decision in Garin's estimation. His only regret was that they had also carried away his cousin Sergan, who had made his escape aboard one of the Varuna ships. "'I think the captain's anxious to cast off, Hamel,' said Kara. "'You should go aboard.' The halfling sighed. "'Some dutiful persons often say that there's no point in putting off unpleasantness,' he observed. "'For my own part, I've never understood that reasoning. "'Should I be struck dead by a bolt of lightning a minute from now, "'I'd rather not have spent my last moments beginning to get seasick.' "'But he picked up his satchel and slung it over his shoulder, setting foot on the gangway. "'Farewell, Hamel,' Natalie said. She darted over and gave him an enthusiastic hug, followed a moment later by her younger brother. "'Don't go, Hamel,' Kerr said. "'You can stay in Griffin Watch with us.' "'Now that's enough of that,' Hamel managed to say, and Garin smiled to see a bright gleam in the corner of his friend's eye. It seemed that Hamel wasn't quite as unattached as he would like to believe.' Both children were only half a head shorter than he was, and it took the halfling a long moment to extricate himself from their embrace. He grinned fondly at the two of them, and reached over to Musk Kerr's hair. "'I always liked human children. It's the only time your kind are sensibly sized. Anyway, I'll be back by the end of the summer, Sprouts. I promise.' Garin stepped back and touched his hand to his brow. "'A swift and safe journey, Hamel.' I'll see you in Tantra soon. Sweet water and light laughter until we meet again. Some day someone must explain that bit of elvish nonsense to me, the halfling muttered, but he waved to Garin and the others and boarded the ship, a sturdy two-masted catch named Thenchen Star. The master of the ship shouted orders to his sailors. They hauled up the gangway and took in their mooring lines, raising a half-sail on the foremast to carry them away from the wharf. Kerr and Natali ran along the dock, waving to Hamel, as the ship slid clear of the pier and began to beat away from Hullberg. Hamel stood by the stern rail, waving back at the children until the ship began to rock in the sea swells. "'I'm going to miss him.' Kara said as she watched the Thenchen star beginning to pick up speed. A good friend, and a better man than he lets on. He'd never admit it, Garin said. It pleased him that Kara and Hamel had hit it off so well. Few people impressed the halfling, and Kara had never been one to let many people get close to her. The spell scar had something to do with that, of course. So many people regarded it as some sort of character flaw instead of an accident of birth. 
The rain began to fall more heavily, and he finally shivered and looked away from the retreating ship. We ought to be going. Hamel's going to outrun this rain, but we won't be so lucky. Come along, children, Miria said firmly. She corralled the young hullmasters and her own daughter and shooed them on. The three children skipped ahead of the adults, leading the way as they climbed from the wharves up into the center of the town. There were still plenty of foreigners thronging the streets, but Garin thought the mercenaries and house bravos they passed seemed to swagger just a little bit less. Of course, most of the storefronts displayed small silver shields with blue crescent moons on them, and on two occasions they passed by small bands of Hulbergen men who wore blue bands around their left arms. More than a hundred spearmeet had been killed at Lendon's Dyke and hundreds more wounded, but those who'd stood shoulder to shoulder against the bloody skulls were no longer shy about proclaiming their allegiance to the Harmac and their willingness to stand up to anyone, anyone, who had a mind to push around Hullberg's folk. "'When do you think you'll be leaving, Garin?' Miria asked as they walked. "'A couple of days, I suppose. I want to finish looking through Sergen's papers before I go.' His traitorous step-cousin had been forced to abandon his private villa and his chambers at Council Hall, and take shelter in the Varuna compound with little warning, so Garin had appointed himself the task of sifting through the correspondence and accounts Sergen had been unable to take with him or destroy. He'd also helped Kara organize bands of riders in the last two ten days to chase off orcs and ogres lingering in Hullberg's hinterlands. After their defeat at Lendon's Dyke, the horde had fallen apart swiftly, with the subject tribes quickly abandoning the orcs and retiring to Thar. The last Garin had heard, several minor Bloody Skull chiefs were feuding over control of the tribe. And I heard that a wyvern was sighted up near Lake Sterret. I really should borrow a few shield-sworn. Garin, said Kara, interrupting him, we're glad to have your help. "'But if your heart's telling you to go back to your life in the South, then you should go. "'No one in Hullberg will hold it against you.' "'Miria glanced at Garin, but said nothing. "'He walked on in silence for a short time, watching Natali, Kerr, and Selsha, exploring the street ahead. "'He hadn't been much older than Natali when he'd started to discover the familiar streets and squares for the first time, "'though Hullberg had been a smaller and safer place then.' He looked into his own heart, trying to read what was written there, and discovered that he simply couldn't tell any longer. Certainly he'd come to Hullberg with the intention of returning to Tantras after satisfying himself that Jared Erstenwold's charge had been kept, that justice was dealt out to his murderers, and that Jared's family and his home were well. He'd seen to that as well as he could, and if Darcy Varuna or his traitorous cousin ever crossed his path again— well, he'd attend to them as well. He had a house in Tantras, and friends, and a stake in the Red Sail Coster. But he couldn't honestly say that his heart was calling him back to the city on the Dragon Reach. If there was a place that called to his heart, it was Myth Dranor, and that was a place he could never return to. Perhaps there was some far shore, some hidden treasure, that might cure him of that, and he thought for a long moment about how it would feel to go in search of it. It hadn't been so different when he'd left Hullberg for the first time as a twenty-year-old with the whole world ahead of him. I'm afraid my heart hasn't seen fit to tell me much of anything in quite some time, Kara, he finally said. I've got some affairs to look after in Tantras, but after that I have no idea. I have a hard time remembering what seemed so important to me only a couple of months ago. They arrived at Erstenwold's, and the three children pelted up the steps of the porch and into the shop. Miria had reopened it a ten-day ago, and she was doing quite well. Miners and woodcutters who had been abandoned by Varuna's withdrawal had turned to Erstenwold's for their provisions, especially since many of the outlying camps had been burned or sacked by marauding bands from the Bloody Skull Horde. Natali, Kerr! Kara called after the children. She winced as something crashed inside the store. 
I'd better collect them before they wreck your place, Miria, she said. Excuse me. She hurried inside in pursuit of the two young hallmasters. Garin and Miria climbed up the steps to get out of the rain, and Garin paused on the wide, covered porch to shake the raindrops from his cloak. Did it always rain this much? he wondered aloud. In springtime, I... "'Miria answered. "'She hung her own cloak from a peg by the door "'and then tilted her head to undo her long midnight braid, "'finding it too frayed to rescue. "'When she absently shook out her hair "'and began to gather it again, "'Garin found himself standing still to watch. "'Miria's hair was still as long and dark as he remembered, "'and the strong lines of her face softened without the stern braid. "'She'd be thirty this year,' but for a moment she looked just like the girl he'd fallen in love with a dozen summers past, with a small spray of freckles across her nose and a strange, wistful dreaminess to her gaze when she thought no one was looking at her. Then Miria glanced up and caught him watching her. She frowned. "'What are you looking at, Garin Hallmaster? "'Nothing,' he said. "'I suppose I was wondering why you braid your hair. "'Because that's for a married woman?' "'Well, yes. Is it for Selsha's father?' Miria paused and looked away. "'No, it's not. He's dead, Garin, seven years now, and I'm no widow in mourning. We never married. Once Selsha came along, I didn't much think I was worth courting any longer. I suppose I began to braid my hair because it was the easiest way for me.' "'I shouldn't have asked. It isn't my business.' "'You've a better right to expect an answer than you know,' Miria said softly. "'I did something terrible not long after you left, Garin. "'I was angry with you, and bitter, "'and perhaps I thought that if I hurt someone the way I thought you'd hurt me, "'I'd feel better. "'I fell in with a sisterhood of sorts, "'a circle of women who met in secret and never showed their faces. "'They said they understood what grieved me, and I believed them. After a few months, they arranged for me to meet Selsha's father. She folded her arms and paced away across the old wooden porch. Water dripped from the eaves. A nobleman of Melvaunt he was, and a married man. Now I know that they meant for me to have his child so that they could blackmail him, but I didn't know it at the time. She flinched from her own words, but made herself to finish. Later I learned that he took his own life to spare his family the shame. Garin did not say anything for a long time. He heard the shouts of the children playing in the store, the small thunder of their feet on the old floorboards as they raced about inside, but it seemed a thousand miles off. Who were they, Miria? Who arranged it all? Better if I didn't say, Garin. Besides, they didn't make me do anything. They only asked, and I was willing. She looked back to him. I turned my back on the sisterhood after I learned what had happened. I was of no more use to them, anyway. But I've spent every day since wondering how I can ever make amends for what I did. He winced, thinking of a cold fall morning in Mithdranner's glens not so long ago. No one had made him maim Rovan. That impulse had been waiting somewhere in his darkest depths, waiting for its chance to do him harm. Strange how the human heart could be moved to injure itself so deliberately. "'No one can change the past, Miriam,' Garin said softly. "'The gods know there are things I'd take back if I could. All we can do is face each new day and try to do better.' He nodded at the door leading inside. The laughter of children spilled out from somewhere behind the long wooden counter, just out of his sight. "'Your daughter's beautiful. She's the best part of you, isn't she? Sometimes good things come to us even when we don't believe we're worthy of them. It's a reason to treasure them even more.' "'I know it.' Miria looked down at the floor and brushed her eyes. Then she took a deep breath and lifted her eyes to his. "'You'll be leaving soon, then?' she asked. "'I suppose, but I think you'll see me again before long. "'It won't be ten years. That I promise you.' 
Karen, I'm glad you came back to Hullberg. I know it's been a hard time for you, for all of us, I guess, but Jared would be pleased to see what you've done in the last few ten days. You've honored his memory well. If things turned out better, Miria, it wasn't my doing. I led the Varunas to Isperus's book. I put you and Selsha in grave danger. I was in a cell when the Spearmeat took a stand against the foreign companies. And I was only one blade at Lendon's dyke. Garin laughed softly at himself. Whatever I managed to do right, I did by accident. I doubt I deserve your gratitude. Miria's mouth quirked upward in the ghost of a smile. Nevertheless, you have it. She leaned close, took his hands in hers, and kissed him softly on the cheek. Then she drew away and turned back to her store. Selsha, if you made a mess, you're going to clean it up, she called. Natali, Kerr, come on now, Garin heard Kara say. You have your lessons waiting at home. The children protested, as expected. Garin smiled and drifted back out into the street, waiting for Kara and Miria to usher the young hallmasters out of the store. The rain was diminishing. He stood in the street, uncertain which way to go. High Street ran down toward the waterfront, where several more ships were making ready to sail on the morning tide. In an hour he could be on his way to Thentia, Melvaunt, or Hillsfar, and from those cities he could find passage to any of the ports on the inner sea. The world was wide and open. Old dragon-shield comrades were scattered in half a dozen cities around the Sea of Fallen Stars, and he could find good reason to visit almost any of them. But it was the white towers of Mithdranor he longed to see again. "'What did I just tell Miria?' he murmured aloud. "'Meet each day as it comes, and make the most of it. Besides, Hullberg wasn't as small of a town as he remembered.' Garin realized that for the first time he was standing in the streets of his home, and did not feel that he didn't have room enough for all his ambitions. He snorted, amused at himself. Either the town had grown in the last two months, or his ambitions had narrowed. Kara, Natali, and Kerr emerged from Erstenwolds and clattered down the wooden steps. His cousin caught sight of his face and frowned. "'What is it, Garin?' Kara asked. He looked again to the cold gray waters of the moon sea beyond the rooftops and masts and shook his head. Nothing, he said. He scooped up Kerr, who squealed with delight, and set his young cousin on his shoulder. In the other direction, the old turrets of Griffin Watch shone in another fleeting sunbreak, worn and familiar above the crowded city streets. You know, "'There's nothing in Tantras that Hamel can't see to for me,' he decided. "'Come on, let's go home.'" Epilogue 29 Myrtle, The Year of the Ageless One A steady rain pelted the windows of Sergan's study. It was a modestly furnished room, but so far it was his favorite in the house— it commanded a fine view of the harbor of Melvaunt. His villa was situated somewhat to the west of the city, so the prevailing winds generally carried the smoke and stench of Melvaunt's smelters away from the small estate. Watching the flames crackle in the marble fireplace, sipping a fine dwarven brandy, Sergan congratulated himself on his foresight in arranging the purchase of the place years ago, in case he ever had need of such a refuge. Melvaunt wasn't his first choice for a life in exile. He would have much preferred Mullmaster, but that, unfortunately, was where Darcy Varuna and her wealthy family resided. His special friendship with Lady Darcy had suffered a serious blow when it had become clear that House Varuna would have to abandon its extensive investments and properties in Hullberg, due in large part to his failure to seize the Harmac's seat. Darcy had allowed him to flee Hullberg with her, but as the extent of the disaster became clear, her attitude towards Sergan had begun to cool. And Sergan knew 
that it was likely to cool even further once the Varunas realized that the mysterious involvement of their own armsmen in the plot to kill the Harmac was actually an attempt to implicate them. In fact, Sergan deemed it likely that Darcy Varuna might regard that as a mortal offense, and in Mullmaster that was quite likely to lead to a knife in the dark some fine evening. No, all in all, it was better to begin his exile in a more congenial environment. A knock came at the door of the study, and his valet quietly entered. "'Excuse me, my lord,' the man said. "'There is a visitor at the front door, an elf, my lord. He told me to tell you that he has an interesting proposition to place before you.' "'An elf?' Sergan said, and frowned. He didn't know many of the so-called fair folk, and he could not imagine what sort of business such a person might have with him. Since the disagreeable turn of events in Hullberg, Sergen had been considering a wide variety of prospects. He might not have any chance of making himself lord of a city, but he was still vastly wealthy, and he saw no reason why he couldn't establish a merchant company of his own to amass more wealth and more power still. In fact, Sergen had already begun to make inquiries in that direction. Perhaps the elf's business pertained to those. Show him in, then, with the usual precautions, of course. The valet bowed and retreated. Sergen stood and walked over to the fine desk by the window. He took a hand crossbow and loaded a poisoned bolt in it, hiding the weapon in a special holster underneath the desk, and then he set another such weapon in a niche behind a painting on the wall. He also had two very useful potions in his pocket, and no fewer than three ways to flee the room if such became necessary. Satisfied with the arrangements, he took a seat behind his desk. His valet knocked again, and Sergen called, "'Come in!' The door opened, and his servant showed in a tall, dark-haired moon-elf with striking violet eyes and a subtle, crooked twist to the right side of his mouth. He was dressed in fine gray and lavender, with a gold-embroidered doublet and a heavy hooded cloak. When he stepped into the room, he raised his hands to push back his hood— and Sergen saw that the elf's right hand was not flesh at all, but instead a perfect replica made of gleaming silver, scribed with tiny runes. The metal hand flexed and moved, just as a living one would have, a most unnerving sort of magic, really. "'Good evening,' the elf with the silver hand said. "'Are you Sergen Hullmaster, nephew to the Harmac of Hullberg?' Sergen frowned wondering what the elf-wizard might possibly want with him, but nodded. "'I am,' he said. "'Might I ask your name and business with me, sir?' "'I am Rovan Disarnal, of House Disarnal,' the elf replied. "'And as far as my business with you, well, that is a simple matter. You and I have something in common, Lord Sergen. We have both been grievously wronged by your cousin Garen Hullmaster. I am here to determine how best the insults and injustices we have suffered at his hands might be set aright. Sergen raised an eyebrow. He couldn't say what he might have expected his strange visitor to begin with, but that was certainly not it. With a small gesture he invited the elf to sit, and said, "'You have already piqued my interest, sir. Please continue.' 